So good morning, everyone. Well, Yuxik Pug, bon matin. And welcome to this third and final day of the 45th Annual General Assembly of the Assembly of First Nations. We've got a few little announcements before we get to our agenda. First one, I hope that you guys who join the AFNQL banquet, First Nations women, builders of our nations, uh, had a good time. Reminder that the circle of trade closes at 1 p.m., so get your final shopping in, go create those links. And another short little message, the lost wallet that we mentioned yesterday still has not been recuperated. So last name Clark, uh, it'll be available in 516C. I'm pretty sure you'll need it to get back home. We still have a lot of resolutions to go through today and a few guests uh, that were invited. Yesterday we passed 11 resolutions and one was opposed, which means that we have 47 left for the day. As always, if ever you do have amendments to the different resolutions, please bring the language to our resolutions committee to help get things rolling for the day. I think it's important, there's a few situations yesterday to remind you that there is a code of conduct that you all signed to. Let's try to keep this day respectful, let's keep the language clean, and we'll have a better assembly if we do. And before we get started, I'd like to look towards our accessibility champion, Marsha Ireland, to come share a bit of the sign language with us this morning. Oneida Nation Turtle Clan. Hello, I am Marsha Ireland. I'm from Oneida Nation Turtle Clan. This morning we're going to uh, review some signs. If you remember how to sign Sigoli, could you please, or hello, stand up and show me that sign. Sigoli, hello, hello. Do you recall that from yesterday and the day before? Sigoli, using your left hand, always on the left. Sigoli. Nagitwa. 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 In ASL, we would say bye or see you later. So Nagitwa. 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 Bianco. Bianco, Bianco, Bianco. In ASL, we would say thank you. Thank you. Also, Miigwech. We would sign this way, Miigwech. You're okay. <laughs> And in the West Coast, we would sign it this way. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the signs that I've taught you over the, and reviewed over the last few days. Um, if you would like to know more, please feel free to um, come and have a conversation with me. Um, the, I appreciate the opportunities to be able to share with you our Indigenous Sign Languages, in, in particular the Oneida Sign Language. And I just want to highlight that we quite, quite often speak about our languages and we speak about 
Sorry, the mic was buzzing. I apologize, everyone. Um, uh, sorry, just making sure that the interpreter uh, has the appropriate mic. So quite often when we think about languages, we think about spoken languages, and I just really want to emphasize the importance of our sign languages, and that you know each of us that has a spoken language, each of our spoken languages has an equivalent sign language. So when we're when we just to be mindful of that, and I know that there's a motion um, coming today in regards to language, and so. Uh, just really wanting AFN and all of us to acknowledge the sign languages and acknowledging all of those people in our in our communities and their and their language and how they communicate with everyone. So, not to forget that. So, it, it has been recognized. Uh, in the legislation of our spoken languages as well as indigenous sign languages. So it's important that we also do that, right? We wanna be able to make our own choices and decisions when it comes to language. So we also, we need to lead the way. So I hope that um, I appreciate your support and your time this morning, Yanko. Thank you, Marsha Ireland, for that, and Debbie Parliament and your team. Just a shout out to our accessibility team. It is now 9.05, and the meeting is officially called to order. And I will now change over to my co-chair, Wina. Good morning, bonjour, quoi, 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 everyone. Um, so, the day three of the of this uh, AGA, 45th AGA, AFN AGA, and uh, we already, as you can see, we already have uh, our uh, first guest of the day. So, Monsieur Pierre Poilievre, leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Monsieur Pierre Poilievre, le chef du Parti conservateur du Canada, qui est avec nous. Et, and on that, uh, just to explain you quickly, he, he's with us for a period of 30 minutes. So 30 minutes, as you all know, has been set aside on the agenda for that, and I'll be managing the time. We'll have time for some questions and answers as you all know by now, it's not because you're up in line at the microphones that we'll have time to get to you, but we'll do everything possible to hear the most of you, and we'll take three chiefs first at once, and then we'll go back to Mr. Pierre Poiliev. So on that, on that, I am going to invite him to come to the podium to address the assembly. Thank you, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Je suis honoré d'avoir l'occasion de me joindre à vous ici à l'occasion du 4, 45e Assemblée générale annuelle de l'APN sur la terre traditionnelle de la nation Ganya Kahaira. It's an honor to be here for the 45th annual General Assembly of the AFN uh, on the traditional territory of the Ganya Kahaga. And I'd like to thank your national chief, Woodhouse, and members of the AFN, chief, chief in assembly, youth, veterans, and those elders who have guided and prayed for a good assembly. Thank you in particular, national chief, for, for inviting me here today, uh, but also for taking the time to pray with myself and, my, more importantly, my wife Anna, and to remind both of us that there is a creator, creator of all things who imparts wisdom and guidance that we should seek every single day. 
Wisdom also comes from those who came, from, came before us. And that, of course, includes our first peoples who have been here since time immemorial. I want to thank uh, and honor you for bringing thousands and thousands of years of ancestral, his ancestral history to this assembly. From this history flows the treaties and Section 35 constitutional rights which recognize and affirm your rights and relationship with the Crown of Canada. As I was flying into Montreal, I looked down at the, at the ground beneath and I thought, it's easy to understand why you've chosen to gather in this particular spot. For thousands of years, when the rivers were the highways of this land, this was a place for people to meet and exchange goods and ideas. Just south of us, on the shores near Verdun, archaeologists have found artifacts going back 5,000 years, including copper that likely originated at Lake Superior, evidence of highly sophisticated trade networks that existed here and right across North America, supported by agreements between nations that facilitated a free enterprise that is as impressive as what we see today. This is my first meeting with you in person, but I hope it will be the first of many. I want the next generation of Canada and, and the next government that I hope to have the privilege to lead to build a genuine partnership with First Nations, a nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on the recognition of rights and mutual respect. It may surprise some of you to learn that the values and institutions of your pre-colonial history that I described moments ago are shared by Conservatives. Values of faith and spirituality, values of acknowledging a higher creator, values of family as the greatest social safety net we have, values of tradition, the traditions, stories, and knowledge that are the foundation of any people that form a long chain that connects one generation to the next, those that were, those that are, and those that will be, and makes each person understand that he is a part of something bigger than himself. Values of entrepreneurship, the kind of inventiveness and determination that allowed First Peoples to survive in this unforgiving land for millennia without today's comforts. Values of the land, an attachment to a place, and a duty to harvest its bounty while passing it on pristine to those that follow. These Indigenous values, faith, family, work, tradition, entrepreneurship, and land will guide everything I do as Prime Minister. But let me be clear, I'm not here to run your life. I don't want to run anybody's life. I want to run a small government with big citizens free to make their own decisions and live their own lives. This is especially true for First Nations peoples. Every one of you in this room is a leader. Every one of you knows your communities better than Ottawa does and certainly better than I do. You draw on thousands of years of experience while Canada has only been here for a century and a half. That's why we will get the government gatekeepers, the federal government gatekeepers, out of your way so you can do what's best for your members. My promise to all Canadians uh, is that a common-sense Conservative government will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. This is my general commitment, but it is of particular importance to First Peoples. Axe the tax means cancelling a carbon tax that is making food and groceries more unaffordable for everyone, but especially for First Nations people because of the remote and colder weather that uh, you must confront, this tax is particularly cruel and unjust. And that is why I support the Chiefs of Ontario and their judicial review to counter this unjust tax burden. But I have good news. When I am Prime Minister, the Chiefs of Ontario will not have to spend any more money on lawyers because I will ax the tax. And when I say it, I mean it. Build the homes. We need to make it easier for you to provide your housing for your people. I know that the demand for housing among your members has grown faster than supply because the federal government has consistently failed your communities by raising the cost of construction with layers of bureaucracy 
and pricing you out of housing market on your own land. Common sense conservatives will work to cut red tape in Ottawa and create new financing and mortgage options that make buying, building and renovating homes more affordable. Stop the crime. We need to stop the crime everywhere, but we also need to acknowledge that there has been a particular problem with crime in rural and remote communities since 2015. And part of this is that the federal government has not provided adequate or competent policing. We need to, 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 to fix that by cooperating with First Nations leaders and looking at new models that allow you to chart your own course on policing if you so choose. And I've been happy to discuss these matters with your national chief. We need to cut off the flow of illicit drugs and gang activities that threaten communities. We also need to stop Justin Trudeau's wacko policies of legalizing drugs and leaving addicts at the mercy of predatory drug dealers. It means turning hurt into hope by building recovery, recovery centers using traditional indigenous knowledge and healing traditions to give addicts the help they need to break the cycle of drug use and heal their bodies and minds. I've also discussed with the National Chief ways that we can improve policing by removing bureaucracy and giving more autonomy to local communities who want it. And fix the budget it means cutting waste in Ottawa and putting power back in the hands of local leaders and, common, and the common people of Canada. There's so much untapped potential in this country. So much of that potential resides in your nations and communities. For too long, you've been held back by a broken system that takes power away from you and places it in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats in Ottawa. That's why I'm committed to ending the Ottawa Knows Best paternalistic system. As you know, the Indian Act puts reserve land and money in the hands of the federal government, which means you often have to go to Ottawa to ask for tax revenues collected from resource development on your very own lands. No other government has to do that. The result is that money is wasted on paperwork and there's less left over for the good projects that you seek to advance in your own communities. My goal is to reduce the bureaucracy and simplify the funding for your nations. One way to do that could be by converting more of the project-by-project project grants into predictive, predictable funding streams that you can count on and borrow against for major capital projects without endlessly filling out forms or waiting for answers from Ottawa. That is also why common sense conservatives support the First Nations resource charge that will allow you to take back control of your resource money that is rightfully yours. This is a, this is a first, thank you. Although I don't deserve the applause, this was a First Nations developed idea. I simply came along and accepted it, put it in my platform. You, you all did the hard work of developing this idea. I'm simply here to follow your marching orders and make it happen. It's a completely optional model that will simplify negotiations between resource companies and First Nations. So that you don't have to waste years on endless negotiations reinventing the wheel every time there's a new project. It will be a very simple to administer program. Here's how it works. First Nations can collect taxes from resource companies and those companies will get a 50% refundable tax credit from the federal government that will vacate the space and make it economically viable for them to do so. This new approach will mean the money goes directly to you rather than from the community to the federal government and then all the way back. It would not actually stop you from also signing impact benefit agreements or making other arrangements that are already available to you. The choice would be yours and the option would be on the table. It would put you back in charge of your money. It will mean less waste in Ottawa and more money for your communities. And that money will mean powerful paychecks, services, training, clean drinking water and economic opportunity. I've made no secret about my desire to see more economic growth and development. I talk about it everywhere. It will give people better jobs, more opportunities and powerful paychecks. And all that depends on economic growth. That means listening to you when you have concerns about projects, yes. But it also means listening to you when you support development and especially when your members and your leaders and par our partners in those projects. If reconciliation means anything, 
It means saying yes to economic opportunities that First Nations are asking for. Yet this federal government has repeatedly shut down projects that support, have the support of strong majorities of local First Nations, almost never with proper consultation beforehand. That is unacceptable. When your future is at stake, your right to say yes is as important as your right to say no. And when you think about it, I, I believe in the Section 35 consultation rights. I believe those rights require our government consult with people who want projects to go ahead as well as those who do not want them to go ahead. When this government killed the Tech Frontier Mine, a $20 billion project, it didn't consult with all the f surrounding First Nations that supported the project nor has it properly consulted with the many First Nations in Northern Ontario that want the ring of fire, but can't get it because we have an, a wacko environment minister who doesn't want to grant a permit to build a road to get there. You know, we need to get the federal government to consult with you on your opinion, even when that opinion is yes. And this is important because we've seen the successes that can happen when we say yes. The LNG Canada project, a $40 billion project initiated by former Heisla Chief Councillor Ellis Ross. This is the single biggest construction project in Canadian history, and I'm very proud that Ellis Ross will be a candidate for the Common Sense Conservatives and a Member of Parliament after the next election. The Heisla Nation is also pushing ahead with a $3.28 billion Cedar LNG project. The Inuk Cree is building under the leadership of then Chief Billy Morin, who's also a common sense conservative candidate running in the next election, is building the first surgical center on reserve in Canada, which will provide resource, revenue for his people and care for all Albertans. The Mi'kmaq First Nations have shown that First Nations traditional knowledge can be used in food and uh, the production of nutritious, um, nutritious foods uh, by purchasing clear water seafoods in Nova Scotia. And my personal favorite, the Squamish in BC are building 6,000 housing units on 10 acres of land. Now this is right inside Vancouver. It never would have happened, by the way, if the decision was left to Vancouver City Hall, because their gatekeepers would have dragged it out forever and blocked it from happening. We're seeing more and more First Nations communities are more open for business, more progressive in getting things done than their neighboring municipalities. I spoke to an investor here in Montreal who said he planned to invest in the city of Calgary. But all the bureaucracy and the cobweb of confusion at City Hall there blocked him. So he went next door to Susina. He said it was the best place to do business he's ever been. And so he's invested, investing his millions there. This is a real opportunity. The incompetence and, uh, and obstructiveness of municipal governments will provide a competitive advantage to those First Nations communities who open the door to business and create opportunity for their people. And I can't wait to facilitate that with you. Those are just a few examples of First Nations entrepreneurship and initiative, but there are countless others uh, that we need to pursue. The reality is, we don't have billions. We have trillions of dollars of resource wealth right beneath our feet. That wealth belongs, in many cases, to you and your communities, your children. Your children can be the richest in the world if we unleash these opportunities. And that's why we will be laser-focused on economic growth and opportunity for First Nations. But I also know that there's more to reconciliation than that. For many decades, your cultures, your languages, and your way of life have been silenced and sidelined by the federal government. Just a couple of years ago, the federal government tried to pass a law banning hunting rifles. This would have effectively criminalized the traditional way of life of your communities. Common sense conservatives thank the AFN for standing up and defending the rights of your people and all people to own hunting rifles and harvest the land responsibly. And we will continue to do that. Protecting and preserving history, culture, and tradition are the bedrock of conservative values. Common sense conservatives will, per, will support you and your knowledge keepers to keep customs, traditions, and history alive, to pass your stories on to your children and grandchildren, and to better educate all Canadians. The story of Indigenous people in this land from time immemorial is one of strength and resilience. 
and it includes your great contributions to building and defending the country that we share today. Indigenous soldiers have served with distinction in every war in which Canadians have fought from 1812 to First World War, Second World War, Korea, and most recently Afghanistan. At Queenston Heights, th 300 Mohawk warriors under the leadership of Chiefs John Norton and John Brandt led an early assault that broke the spirits of the American invaders. At Mit Vimy Ridge, indigenous marksmen and infantrymen helped Canada win the victory that defined us as a country in the eyes of the world. This history is rightly a source of pride for your members and it should be known by all Canadians. I don't believe in cancelling or denying history, but I do believe in telling the whole story. For me, that means adding more names and more stories and more voices to our national narrative. Canadian school children should know about the pain, but also the pride of the First Nations people. P figures like Thanel Delther, Chief Poundmaker, Chief Crowfoot, Catherine Sutton, Joseph Brandt, Tommy Prince, Mary two acts early should be as familiar as the European names that used to exclusively fill our textbook. The heroism of First Nations should be known by all. Turning from the past to the future, common sense conservatives will partner with you as you write new stories for your people, new stories of growth and prosperity, of dignity and self-determination, of healing and revival. This means that education resources and facilities have to match the high ambition of ch your children, especially in northern and remote communities that have been deprived of resources and opportunities for too long. The federal government can help with this, but it can't do it alone. So I issue a challenge to the CEOs in the towers around this building to train Indigenous youth and give them the opportunities. Before these CEOs think to fly in foreign workers to fill job opportunities, they should first and foremost be offer offering those jobs to Indigenous youth. Thank you. I know that the relationship between First Nations and the federal government has been painful and destructive uh, because of the federal government's terrible decisions. For decades, the residential school system removed children from the love and care of their families. It was a monstrous abuse of excessive governmental power that cut your children off from their cultures, languages, and traditions. In many cases, students were neglected and abused. Tragically, too many young children never came home. Those were terrible crimes by a big and imposing government against each victim and against your communities. In 2008, the federal government, under then Prime Minister Harper, issued an apology and launched uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, uh, but there is more work to be done. I, I know that Canada has no future without a strong future for the First Nations people. As Justice Lamar of the Supreme Court said in the Dalgamuk case, we are all here to stay. All of our futures are intertwined, like the small rivers that flow into the St. Lawrence to make a great highway of prosperity. What each of us brings to the table will combine to bring the success of all of us. I am here, uh, Prime Minister, in its proper meaning, it means first servant. That is my job, to be a servant of all the people and to be a partner to the First Nations. I know that uh, it won't be easy. We won't always agree. And you've heard enough promises and enough performative reconciliation. Well, we need our honest and direct conversations and a partnership based on a nation-to-nation -nation relationship and mutual respect. I come here to offer that respect in total humility and thank you for your immense contributions as we move forward together with your values and to unleash the potential of all Canadians. Thank you very much. Would you like me to sit down? Merci, Monsieur le chef du Parti conservateur du Canada, Monsieur Pierre Poilievre, pour vos mots adressés à l'Assemblée. On that, it, we have we have 30 we have 10 minutes in front of us for this uh, Q&A session, 
And um, as agreed with uh, Monsieur Poiliev, Mr. Poiliev, we will take one chief at a time, so one person at the microphone, and we, we'll go back to Mr. Poiliev. So I get, uh, once again, it's not a guarantee that we will get to you with the time allowed and the time we have. And I will suggest to be concise and brief. That way, we will be in a position to hear the most of you. So. On that, microphone number one, please state, if you can please state your name and nation, over to you. Honey, good morning. Rachel Mendo Bindishnikas, Hui Kwem Kong Binjaba, Gimakwe Odindao, Makwa Dodem, Andan Matkwe Ndigo. Miigwech in the Gabajain. Ni Kwikwejmen. Mande ni Kekagam Gong. O de wikwem kong ni dani ni minjandama tsabbondash ni mandani council ish ni kazat gigdoni ni nok mino gigdokwelk gichinakita da manda ni da shmabak chigema miguetugo ka ekadat mino shni bedadze Bedadze mandani king, we do not mad going. Needish do quejman nunga. Anish kegi en endaman, we wape kamagat manda. We bani mandani ge kagam gong. Jim minjandang, minjandmang, minoshni, we be jibitemagak. So, hello, good morning. My name is Rachel Manitwabi. I'm from Wikwemkong Unceded Territory. I'm of the Bear Clan, and my spirit name is Woman Who Brings Change. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Polyev. I had a great meeting yesterday with MP Jamie Schmale, and my question and my issue is this. Over the past three years, my council and I have been working fiercely to try to build an elder's home in our community. We've been working tirelessly with uh, ISC, Indigenous Services Canada, and it's a much needed elders building. To date, the only holdout has been the federal government. And since we first initiated the pro project, the, the costs for this project have skyrocketed. And this is the case with many of our projects. How would you, as a government, speed up the approval process for these types of much needed infrastructure projects on reserve. Thank you very much uh, for that question and thank you for acknowledging a shadow minister of indigenous relations, Jamie Schmale, who's doing an excellent job. Um, one, we need the bureaucracy in Ottawa to be much more responsive uh, and to give faster decisions. But I think that I think the systematic change we need is to move towards more predictable funding flows so that you don't have to apply for every single project. Um, you have a project, you've set a budget, your band council or leadership should be able to have a predictable flow of funding from the federal government that can be monetized, that you can borrow against and that you can use to finance projects like this without having to, to apply on a, for every single project along the way. When, when I, I travel the country and meet with indigenous leaders, they tell me they've got an application in for this and an application in for that, and they're waiting, waiting, waiting. Why can't we bundle these things up in a transfer that predictably goes to your community and that you can budget decisions like this without having to ask Ottawa in the first place. Um, that to me seems to be the best way to do it. Then we would have fewer bureaucrats in Ottawa and that would unleash even more money that we could leave in the communities so that you could build elder centers or treatment water treatment plants or other infrastructure. It seems to me that we need to simplify uh, and streamline and leave you to make your own decisions uh, with the federal transfers being predictable, generous, and, um, and, and monetizable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So we will now go to the microphone number two, please. 
Thank you. My name is uh, Marcel Head. I'm the chief of Show Lake Nation. I, I really enjoy listening to what you had to present here, uh, Mr. Polyev. But you got to realize, you know, that Ottawa has a whole list of policies and legislations that dictates as to what we can and cannot do. You have to make changes within that, within Parliament, to make sure that bureaucracies does not stand in the way of our efforts in determining our self-determination, self-government. We talk about government to government, nation to nation discussion on self-government, but it's just not there. I told uh, the minister yesterday, you know, it's just not there. But we have a process that I've introduced, you know, with your predecessor, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. I had the privilege to meet with him, and I told him, in order to right the wrongs of Canada, that uh, the injustices that have been done to us as a people, of first, first people in Canada, I told him, you know, you have to go back to the original, the spirit and intent of treaty, because there is a process that you need to understand the day before treaty, the day of treaty, the day after treaty. There was a process that was missed. You see, right after the day of treaty, the treaty was taken to Ottawa, and the government of the day said, we have the land, we have access to the resources. That was wrong. That was the injustice that was done to our people. And right after that, governments of the day started legislations, policies, that removed First Nations out of the picture totally. See, when I explained to Stephen Harper, that agreement, the treaty agreement, meant to share the land, to share everything. One prospers, the other partner was to equally benefit from the resources. And we could go back to that by listening, you know, that Ottawa needs to listen to our process. Today, you know, I, I present to you a win-win situation. Right now, within that solid government, we take back what is rightfully ours, the land and the resources. We take it back, but only this time. We're not gonna break our own treaty, but we are going to enhance you know, a process where everybody wins. Like in terms of the process, the forestry, for example, a company within our traditional territory is prepared to do business with Show Lake Queen Nation and Red Earth. I'm not gonna name the, the particular company, but they're ready and prepared to do exactly what should have been done the day after treaty. So industry right now is waiting for First Nations to take back what is rightfully theirs, and that's the land and the resources. Today, if we were to discuss mutual benefit agreements, there's a three way that profits could be split. One third to, to, to Canada one-third to the companies, and one-third to the First Nations. I think that's a win-win situation. And even the royalties, you know. But with that, you know, with the short time that we have, you know, I, I want to invite you to Saskatchewan and provide us an audience with you. You know, this, it's kind of pointless, you know, to come here and having to have four minutes in the, you know, with, with, with uh, the speakers here. And that's disgusting. But today, you know, I invite you to Saskatchewan. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Well, well, Chief, Chief I, I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, this idea that Ottawa needs to, Ottawa's bureaucracy and politicians can manage First Nations people is not only paternalistic and insulting, but it's proven wrong. I mean, what does the bureaucracy in Ottawa have to teach you about good management? The amount of money that's being wasted in our nation's capital. You, you know, the only thing I disagree with you on is you say that it should be a third for the, for the government, a third for the community. I don't think the federal government should get a third. I think it should get a lot less than a third. If the resources are developed in your land, you should get the money. The workers and the businesses that invest should get the money. We don't need the money to go to Ottawa where it will be squandered on bureaucracy 
My goal is to, to streamline, get the bureaucracy out of your life, have predictable fund funding flows so you can manage your future, and let you keep your own source revenues, including through a First Nations resource charge, so that when this forestry company does harvest timber on your land, they pay the benefits to you first, and then your community can be the first to benefit from it. Uh, I want you to, I, I don't want to run your life, I want to run a small and competent government that stays out of your way and lets you fulfill your full potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to microphone number one, please. Hi, Tep First Quest, uh, Judy Wilson. My traditional name is Red Hummingbird Woman. I'm from unceded territory of the Sequapam Ulu. I just wanted to say uh, thanks to the ancestral lands, the people here, but I also want to recognize our veterans who stood with their back to you. That should be acknowledged. Thank you. And our LGBTQAA+, because in your speech, you did not acknowledge missing murdered women. You did not acknowledge the United Nations. You did not acknowledge the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You did not acknowledge the inherent title rights where my people come from. A majority of our province are inherent title and rights. It's treaty rights and constitution rights, but it's also inherent title and rights. So you fail to, to recognize that. You need to educate yourself on that. So the other part is that you also uh, failed to recognize our residential school survivors, who is a real live issue. If you're working to be the next Prime Minister in Canada, it tells me you have a lot of education to do in those fronts. And coming here and not acknowledging it, it is a first step that you need to do. And also, one of the biggest things is our children and our families. And I want to also say, underscore climate change. I did not hear anything about the climate crisis, climate change issues. <laughs> There's a hurricane in the town right now that, from the remnants from Burrell. How can we dismiss climate crisis? It's real. It's happening. We have heat domes people are dying from. We have wildfires. That has to be one of your top agendas, not just the economy sure. yeah, and okay, business exactly. to Canada. You, you have to address the climate sure. crisis. But I want to share my time with uh, Mary T.G. that talk about the children and family. That's so important, and that's what we're dealing with today. Thank you, Thank uh, you. Chief uh, Kofi. I'm Mary T.G., Chief Proxy, Tackle, Tackle Nation. First of all, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, my sister's words, and I just wanted to reference your, uh, you, your saying that Harper apologized. We endured the worst 10 years ever under the Harper Conservative government. <laughs> An apology without actions and apology without money to back it and to make fundamental change are just hollow words in the wind and we want to ensure that what we endured under the Harper reg regime we won't under uh, we won't go through that with you so wh what assurances can you make sh can you give us I want to also ensure that under the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal of the hard-fought battle that we won and it proved Canada discriminated against First Nations children I want to ensure that you are going to honor any of the final settlement agreements that we have come to to ensure that there is discrimination has in fact truly ended and will never happen again. So I would like to have to understand like how you're going to do that to, to make us a, a clear plan and to ensure that the resources, the billions of dollars that we, have, were, that we fought for is going to be protected. And again, I must say that I haven't heard anything that, that talks about our social agenda. We talked about economic development. I just want you to know that the way that we are right now in Takla is that our children, our people, our lands will not be commodified and that we are the true, in, uh, to understand what inherent right means. I am hereditary chief. I am the Section 35 rights holder. So I think you need to really, again, educate yourself for that. And again, to have a really clear plan to ensure how our how are you, how's your government going to ensure that no, no longer will our women ever go missing and go murdered again? So we need to hear clear, clear plans. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sure. Thank you very much for that. A lot of different issues you raised. Um, on the issue of the climate, our belief is the best way to tackle the issue of climate change is through technology and not taxes. Uh, taxes are not working, they are impoverishing our people, they are making it more expensive for people particularly who live in rural and remote communities. Uh, we need to unleash the production of clean emissions free energy that includes nuclear, hydroelectric and other forms, but to do that we need to speed up the approval process to get these things built. Uh, that will bring down costs but also bring down emissions. On the issue of discrimination, uh, our party has been clear uh, when it comes to children's services, our party has been clear that we support Jordan's principle and that we will give uh, equal treatment uh, and we will support a redress of past injustices and discrimination in uh, ch child services. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will, we will continue to work with you to resolve the other outstanding issues that you raised. Uh, and we believe that economic reconciliation is part of social progress. We need jobs and opportunity for First Nations communities that will ultimately give people a chance to escape poverty and to provide resources for clean water, for education, for health, and for other basic necessities. Both of those things have to go hand in hand. Social uh, support requires economic reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So last speaker, so the last four minutes, do you make it the, the time you want to, uh, if you want to share your time, but over to microphone number two, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Sheldon Sunshine. I'm the chief of Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation and what is now known as uh, Alberta Treaty of Territory. Um, I, I applaud the, uh, the questions that came up this morning. Those, are, those were what I was going to cover. Um, but when you're talking about treaty and partnership, uh, we w I want to understand how are you going to implement that? We, we have been good treaty partners in Treaty 8. We, we allowed the colonizations of our lands, and yet we are sitting in, in probably the poorest nations in this country. And how are we going to address that? I think uh, if you were able to come and speak to all the chiefs in Treaty 1 through 11 to talk about the historic treaties and how that path forward is going to is going to be done, and uh, all of our issues that we have, we got poverty, we got we got uh, drugs, all of it, everything included, is all tied to our treaty. You know, uphold the treaty obligations that the that the Crown promised to each of our nations when we signed treaty, and I think that'll be a big step towards reconciliation. You know, I heard that the, the government of Canada is, is prosperous, that Alberta is having billions. Last year, there was $30 billion in, in tax uh, royalty revenue, uh, several billion going to Canada, yet we got people living on the streets, as we heard chiefs here yesterday, I have people living on the streets in poverty. So I think uh, having those conversations, meaningful dialogue, dialogue with, uh, with your government should you get in. and. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I would like an answer to that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So we'll go with Grand Chief Cody Daibo, Host Nation. Thank you. So first off, I'm going to start off with a statement in case you're not aware. Today is July 11th. This is the anniversary of the 1990 Oka crisis where we know what happened, where your government marched troops into your allies' lands. There still has never been an apology about that or any movement going forward. So if your government is con committed to repairing the relationships with First Nations, then I would ask you to start using the White Montour decision rather than the Sparrow and Vanderpeet test, which keeps First Nations people frozen in time. We're not some ancient piece of history. We can advance as well together. So those things need to start happening if we want true reconciliation where we can start taking a hold of our own fate rather than putting it in the hands of the Superior Court or Supreme Court of Canada. So, just wanted to say that. Miigwech, Miigwech, Grand Thank Chief. You. Over for the conclusion, final remarks, Monsieur Poiliev. Thank you, th thank you very much. And that is exactly the partnership that I propose, uh, to, to put you back in control of your decisions and your destiny. Uh, I, I agree with you that there has been a paternalistic, top-down relationship, an Ottawa be knows best approach, 
that has held back your communities and prevented you from passing on your traditions and your knowledge, your language, uh, and your prosperity to your people. And that, that, is, uh, that needs to change. We need to have a real partnership based on a nation-to-nation -nation relationship and mutual respect. Uh, we won't agree on 100% of issues, but we will work together in a respectful way and the promises that I make will be realistic ones that will actually be fulfilled. I restate what I said in my remarks, that I respect and will uphold the treaties and Section 35 rights, and these will be the, this will be the foundation of a successful relationship that, we, that is built upon mutual tr trust. So I want to thank all of you for your candor, your direct approach, and for continuing to educate me in all federal representatives on how we can go forward uh, in a true partnership to, to the benefit of all of our people. Thank you very much. Merci, merci, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Pierre Poilievre, pour le chef, le chef du Parti conservateur du Canada. Merci. Thank you for your time. Thank you, chiefs and proxies that had time to come to the microphone. Uh, I'm sure. We. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, we need to be recognized first at the microphone, and we have our guests waiting. Uh, already waiting since 15 minutes now. Thank you, chiefs. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur Pierre Poiliev. On that. I will now turn the floor over to my colleague for the next topic on the agenda for our, our next guest. Thank you so much, everyone. So uh, we will continue our morning, morning of discussions with uh, the, some of the federal parties of opposition. Uh, on continue maintenant no, nos discussions avec uh, certains des partis d'opposition du gouvernement fédéral. Uh, donc, on accueille le chef du nouveau Parti démocratique. We now welcome the leader of the new Democratic Party, Jagmeet Singh. Thanks so much. Thank you all. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank Veronique Picard, the Youth Council co-chair. Buju, Anin, Tante. Je tiens d'abord à souligner que les terres sur lesquelles nous sommes rassemblés font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé des Mohawks, qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rassemblement et de séance entre les nations. Uh, I want to say, it's, uh, first of all, it's a really huge honor for me to be here. I, I take this, the opportunity to be able to, treat, to address the, the AFN General Assembly like this as a huge honor. It's something that I, I'm very, I feel very special that I've been a allowed to speak to you all. And I want to start off with some thank yous, because there's a lot of important people in this room I want to thank. First of all, I want to thank your National Chief, National Chief Cindy Woodhouse. Uh, you have a very important role Lots of responsibility, and I thank you for all the hard work. I want to thank the elders. 
the elders and knowledge keepers. It's so important for us to honor the elders, to honor knowledge keepers, their knowledge, their wisdom, and uh, I want to thank them. At the same time, I also want to thank the youth. The youth are not just our future, they're our present. I want to thank the youth that are here as well. I want to thank the veterans for your sacrifice and your service. And of course, I want to thank the chiefs. Each one of you has a very important role in your communities, lots of responsibilities, and you do a very important work, and I want to thank you for that hard work. Merci encore, c'est vraiment un honneur pour moi d'être ici avec vous. C'est vraiment un honneur. I've talked with many of you, and I've heard you loud and clear. You continue to face significant injustice and human rights violations, frankly. You are denied basic human rights. You've shared with me your concerns about overcrowding in your communities, of homes that are in deplorable conditions, dilapidated, and how this is a result of decades of underfunding by both liberal and conservative governments. I've heard from you that even if homes are doubled in community, doubling the number of homes in community would still not be enough to meet the needs. I've heard from you about your concerns about not having access to clean drinking water, something that is so obviously a fundamental right that continues to be denied and your concerns that these very substandard living conditions are a result of underfunding. I've heard from you that you feel abandoned in the fight against the climate crisis, that you've been left to deal with the impacts of that on your own, and many of your communities are amongst the hardest hit by climate crisis. I've heard from you that Indigenous women and girls are getting murdered at a rate six times higher than non-Indigenous women and girls, and this is so fundamentally wrong. All of this, all these things I've outlined, are the results of colonialism and genocide, and it has to end. Nine years ago, you were promised real change. Trudeau made a lot of promises, lots of promises. Promised to lift long, long time standing, long term boil water advisories by March of 2021, and he broke that promise. Today, there are still 28 boil water advisories in effect, and dozens of communities that can't trust their water even though they don't even have an advisory. I've been to Nishkandiga, and Nishkandiga is one of those communities that has had a boil water advisory for 29 years. You've got people that have grown up never knowing what it's like to be able to turn on the tap and get clean water. Il a promis de mettre en œuvre les 94 appels à l'action. Il n'en a réalisé que 13 à ce jour et pas un seul l'année dernière. Il a promis d'investir dans des refuges pour des femmes et filles autochtones victimes de violences. Il n'a conçu aucun nouveau refuge. We've heard Justin Trudeau say that his most important relationship is with indigenous people. But sadly, I think it's all been just for show. One example, our teammate, one of our New Democrat MPs, Leah Gazan, tried to include free prior informed consent in the Canada Early Learning and Child Care Act, and the Liberals voted against it. I feel like Justin Trudeau only shows up when it's good for him. So I completely understand those who are frustrated by this government. I am too. I see the power that they have and the ability they could have used to use that power to make things better, and they refuse to do so. So it is clear in the next election we need change. But people will have to choose what type of change they want. And I feel, for Indigenous people, it's clear where Pierre Polyev stands. He has promised so-called economic reconciliation. But he voted against harmonizing Canada's laws with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, 
Not once, but twice. So for him, economic reconciliation doesn't mean respecting your fundamental rights. Because ultimately, he doesn't want you to have free, prior, and informed consent. What he really wants is for his rich developer buddies to get richer off of your resources, and he doesn't want you to make the decisions. And I think that's wrong. For him, it means cutting services, cutting funding for indigenous health and indigenous services. He talks a lot about freedom. But what he really wants is freedom for himself. For him, when he says freedom, freedom means not respecting treaty obligations. For him, freedom means not respecting your rights. For him, freedom means not getting your free prior and informed consent. After all, he's the guy that said indigenous people need a stronger work ethic, not compensation for the atrocities committed in residential schools. All right? He's a guy that said that chiefs like you have too much power. That's literally what he said. He's a guy who speaks to anti-indigenous organizations very recently, not years ago, but very recently, denying the truth of residential schools. He's a guy who right now has let a very well-known residential school denier, Aaron Gunn, run for his party. That's who he really is. When someone shows you who they are, you gotta believe them, especially when you, they show you again and again and again. Il ne fera jamais ce qu'il faut pour que justice soit rendue aux populations autochtones. Il réduira vos services et vous rendra responsable des difficultés que vous vivez. For New Democrats, we have a very different view of what economic reconciliation means. For us, economic reconciliation cannot happen unless it means respecting your rights to free, informed, prior consent. It means that you make decisions on your lands, on your territories, with your resources. You are in control of your destiny. It means upholding your rights, your rights to housing, clean drinking water, and all of the human rights that have been so long violated. That's what New Democrats are fighting for, and that's what we will continue to fight for. Just recently, Leah Gazan worked hard to have the House of Commons in support of all New Democrats we push to make sure we recognize the genocide happening against indigenous people. We also work to ensure that the Red Dress Alert pilot project is being launched to keep indigenous women and girls safe. Yeah. As a team, we are fighting to make sure we find every opportunity to include informed prior consent in legislation, including the national child care legislation. Our team supports our indigenous MPs, like Leah, who is a fierce leader in ensuring women and children are lifted up. Her bill on guaranteed livable basic income is gaining ground, and we support her work. Another one of our teammates, Laura, Lori Idlaut, is working to ensure First Nation rights are upheld. She's making sure to have legislation that returns jurisdiction to First Nations. She's working to close the infrastructure gaps, to protect indigenous languages, to ensure First Nations have safe and affordable housing and funding for indigenous policing. All of our teammates, but I'll shout out a couple of them in particular, Blake Dejarle, Nikki Ashton, Charlie Angus, Taylor Backrack, Gord Johns, Carol Hughes, and Rachel Blaney, our names that I'm sure you know in your communities, these are folks that have fought very hard for your rights to be upheld. Every one of us, all New Democrats, unequivocally, are using our power to add our voice to yours, to force government to do the things 
they would not have done otherwise. You might have heard recently, in face of that $350 billion infrastructure gap, the Liberals chose now as a time to also bring in billions in cuts to the services you rely on. Well, I made it clear that that was wrong, and we forced the Liberals to reverse those cuts. I know you are fighting every day for your rights to be respected. I believe it's time for you to have a government that truly respects you. When I was a kid, my mom taught me this teaching that's very important in the Sikh tradition, in my tradition, that we are all one. And, and she would say that when we look at the people around us, we have to imagine that that's, that's us, that we are all connected so deeply that we are really one people. And it means that if anyone around us, as a kid, my mom really enforced and taught me this very, very, repeated this again and again, put a lot of emphasis on this, that if any one of us are hurting, we're all hurting. But if we lift the people up around us, if we lift the people that are in our communities, that are in our neighborhoods, that are all around us, if we lift the people up, we all rise together. That's why I'm in politics. I want a Canada where we all rise together where we lift each other up, all of us. I believe we can build a country where we have more time for joy and less worry, where we have more hope and less fear, where we have more justice and more compassion and less greed. I want to work with you, truly work with you, in a true nation to nation relationship to ensure that all communities have safe housing and good infrastructure, clean water, that we use indigenous knowledge to fight against climate change and protect our land, water, and air. We want to ensure that everyone has access to indigenous health care, high speed broadband, and indigenous policing that's properly funded. I want to work with you to finally put an end to the genocide against Indigenous women. I want to make sure that all the TRC calls to action and, the, and all of the MMIWG calls to justice are implemented once and for all. I want to make sure your inherent and treaty and First Nations rights are upheld. And I want to make sure that the federal government provides adequate support to First Nations so you can make contributions to the Canadian economy and lead healthy and prosperous lives. Together. Thank you. Together, I believe we can rebuild First Nations capacity and support Indigenous-led institutions so we can walk together, so we can work together to lift up First Nations, to amplify your strengths and ensure your knowledge is a part of the decisions impacting your own lives. No more empty promises. In the next election, you've got a choice between Liberals who've let you down, Conservatives who want to cut and got the services you rely on and who continue to deny your truths, or new Democrats who are fighting for your rights, who are standing with you shoulder to shoulder and walking towards a true nation to nation relationship. Lors des prochaines élections, vous pouvez choisir un gouvernement qui souhaite vraiment bâtir une relation nation et nation. I can tell you, without a doubt, we will never stop fighting for justice for Indigenous people. I know that these assemblies are very important opportunities to align priorities, but know this, the NDP is here for you, we will always be here for you. During the next months, I hope to visit more of your communities as my commitment to learn how to better work with you continues 
I want to thank you again for all the great work you do. And I want you to know you can count on me as an ally, as someone that wants to stand shoulder to shoulder with you in building that brighter future together. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff Mixing. Uh, we now have time for a few questions. Uh, I remember you that we don't have a lot of time, so if from the beginning you can remember that, uh, and if you don't need all your time for your questions, you can already from the beginning uh, share your time with your colleagues in the line behind you. Uh, so I will start with the mic on number one. You'd actually win when the uh, Zoom in question is quenched. Uh, good morning and thank you, Jagmeet, for, for attending and uh, thank you for your, your words. Um, Regrettably, we didn't get a chance to hold Paul over the, the barbecue any longer than we could, but I was, I'll ask you the same question, but I already have heard you answer this to me in, in the past. I'm hoping that you will denounce and force the other governments to denounce the doctrine of discovery. That, uh, we've asked the Pope to do it. The Pope won't do it. I'm hoping that you'll start there. If we start there, then a lot of the things that were discussed earlier will help. And I just wanted to say that. So, and also the unleashing of the opportunities for us. Some of our nations want our land left exactly the way they are. We know the resources are in our backyard. We want to be able to say no. And we don't have that option right now. So, Cooks Jim. Election 1 1 and Jawa and Squash Lee Spahan Cook, we have in Seleku in the Cup Nation, BC. Uh, I, I remember speaking to you when you first came to the AFN and I asked a c commitment from you to come to BC and speak with the BC chiefs and, and to meet with the Nikola Five. I extend that invitation back to you again and, and hopefully I hear back from you. Cook Shem. can continue uh, with one more question. Thank you, uh, speaker. Uh, Chief Bruce Anthony Kunesko, Martin Falls First Nation. I wanted to ask, uh, you know, with uh, the flowery words with, uh, with uh, uh, Jagmeet, uh, you know, I just wanted to know, you know, he stands with the Liberal government today to promote more of the status quo on uh, Indian Act policy and how it, uh, how it uh, deprives our communities of, of growth. In my community, we had no growth for over 20 years no growth plan, no supports from uh, the Liberal government, yet uh, his party continues to uphold the Liberals and their power. Jagmeet, your power has the, has the power to change this, but still more of the status quo for First Nations on reserve and no growth in terms of uh, housing, infrastructure is badly needed. And you can only not only fix the water, but you could also fix the infrastructure that's needed. My, my community is closest to the Ring of Fire. That's our traditional land. We're working with the provincial government to make changes, but the federal government is reluctant to do so. You need to come to the table, uh, Jagmeet, with your, uh, with your buddy, Pierre. Uh, not Pierre, but uh, with uh, Justin. And uh, move things along for First Nations in the North. Yet you, uh, you, do, you don't seem to do so. You, you, uh, you stay in Ottawa and uh, promote more of the status quo for First Nations. Now is the time to act, Jagmeet, and uh, pr promote uh, uh, a, f a good future for uh, our youth and our communities. And uh, we don't need more, just, uh, more flowery words. We need action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chiefs, for your questions. We will now uh, let Mr. Singh answer. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll start off with uh, the first, of course, the first question on the doctrine of discovery. Uh, inherently a racist doctrine, of course I denounce it. There is no way that that uh, makes any sense. It, it denied the reality of indigenous people. And yes, I, I wholeheartedly denounce uh, the fundamentally racist belief. And uh, the chief also asked, thank you, the chief also asked, you know, what free prior informed consent means, what the United Nations Declaration means is that indigenous communities 
can say yes or no to projects. Uh, that's what it should be, fundamentally. And indigenous communities should be able to make that decision. And they should be able to make that decision meaningfully. And that it, we need to work in collaboration as nation to nation, as partners. And whether that means in protecting the land, uh, whether that means in moving forward with a project, uh, whatever that means, it means that indigenous communities are at the table making those decisions and I can say that with full confidence, I believe in that. That's what I believe in, that we, if we want to see growth or development, it has to happen with indigenous communities. If indigenous communities want to go a different path, that is also their right and we have to work together for that. Uh, thank you. The ch uh, chief, um, BC chiefs, uh, Lee's, uh, chiefs, Lee's Bahan, uh, invited, again, extended invitation. We will definitely follow up with you, Chief. Uh, I hope I can get someone from my team to, to get your contact right now, and we'll I'll try our best to follow up with that. Uh, I want to meet with as many Indigenous leaders and communities as I can, and so thank you for that invitation. Um, and then uh, the last question, I think it's something on people's minds, so I appreciate the question from the Chief. Uh, I, I've shared with you that I am frustrated with the current government. And there will be an election, and people will have a choice in that election. What we've done often, and this is something that I really believe in, is we get elected, and there's four-year terms, and what do we do with that power while we're elected? We try our best to use our power to force government to work for you. It's what the first leader of the party has done, Tommy Douglas, used his power when there was a minority government to get things done. That's what I believe in. I believe in trying to get things done. Ultimately, people chose the Liberal government. I, I wish they would have chosen a new Democrat government and a new Democrat Prime Minister. We would have made a lot of different choices and we would have done things very differently. So we're going to keep on fighting with the power we have to push the government to do more. It is clear that they're not willing to do enough. It's also clear that in the next election people have a choice. They got a choice with what we saw with Pierre Polyev and what he, who he really is. And people need to know. We need to go eyes wide open and who he is. He's someone that continues. This is not something that happened in 2008 and then he left it alone. His position on Indigenous people hasn't changed. He continues to show up in spaces that deny residential schools truths. He continues to allow candidates that are residential school deniers to run for his party. That's who he is. And he does not believe that Indigenous people have the right to make decisions about their own resources on their own lands. And so I reject that approach. And I want to put to you that you've got an opportunity for new Democrats who want to work with you. And so the next election is going to be very important. It's an opportunity for us to chart a new course. And I hope that that course is one where you see in me, a prime minister, and see new Democrats, an ally, that want to work with you and build that brighter future together. So as we had half an hour on, for this agenda item, and it's already been half an hour, almost half an hour, uh, we'll have time for uh, mic number two. Yeah, yeah. I'm flexible. Uh, but okay. OK, you can stay a little bit longer, so we might uh, have time for more, more questions. <laughs> Uh, so three. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll take three questions at a time. Uh, mic number two. What do you see? What do you see? John Martin Deluzi, a proxy by Maru, which didn't know Sakama Rockler, Keskabegi, a Cleut. Good morning. My name is John Martin. I'm a proxy for Chief La Rock from the Keskabegi Yamigamao First Nation out on the East Coast here in Quebec. Um, a question that I was going to put forward earlier, not able to. But uh, right now, uh, whoever forms the next government, this issue, this issue remains a concern for those of us who are involved in education. Um, and across this country in the past few years, there has been a couple of education agreements that have been signed. Uh, and uh, right now, from what we see happening in Ottawa uh, and uh, within the department, there seems to be a little bit of backing away from uh, those agreements and wanting to uh, you know, go towards the downward trend. That's really a concern because these regional education, ag education agreements have really allowed us to bring the standards of education for our children up in the community. And we're not prepared to go backwards. You know, the, any control of Indian education policy was in 1972. And it's just now that we are getting to a standard of education for some of the communities across the country because there are still a lot of regional education agreements to be negotiated and signed to bring the standards of education up. So. Uh, definitely, uh, whoever's in power next, uh, uh, 
you know, we, we want those, address, uh, those concerns addressed. We want to keep this funding going. It needs to be indexed. It needs to continue to grow so we can maintain the standards of education uh, for our children and the community. So that's the request for your support. I know the NDP has been there a long time uh, and, uh, you know, uh, supporting us in a lot of these issues. On another issue as well, the second issue is uh, our concern over the Languages Act and uh, the kind of funding that's been provided. Uh, funding that simply does not reflect the need that, that is there. We are in a critical situation with our languages. We're struggling to survive. And when you're in a critical situation with our languages, you have to be very careful what your next move is. You don't want to go on a downward trend. You need to go on an upward trend where languages are concerned. And I think that uh, right now, what's there, I think needs to be doubled. I mean, 85 million across the country is simply not enough. Oh, allow you. Thank you. Uh, as there is still a, li a little bit of time, Chief uh, Daibo, you can uh, go ahead. Grand Chief Cody Daibo from Kahnawake. Uh, so, in the spirit of fairness, I asked your predecessor, not your predecessor, your colleague, uh, the same question. So, today is the anniversary of the 1990 Oka crisis, where we still have not received an apology from Canada for marching troops on their allies. And will your government uphold the White Montour decision and oppose Vanderpee and Sparrow going into the future? Sorry, Grand Chief, I just missed the last part of your question. I said, would your government uphold the White Montour decision and oppose Sparrow and Vanderpee, keeping us frozen in time? Chief Gary Lehman, Beaver Lake Cree Nation, Treaty 6 Territory. Uh, I want to acknowledge that the uh, two-row wampum belt was uh, one of the original treaties and it, it started right in this area. So I want to acknowledge that. Also, um, Jagmeet, we, uh, the Treaty 1 to 11, the sacred treaties, we have a hard time having a, a, a seat with the Governor General with the king and and these are our treaty partners right the the crown is our treaty partner and we need to have a seat with the king with the governor general so we can talk about our issues it's it's not just the the government of canada you know they uh they hold our uh, a lot of our funding and stuff like that but our issues are with the a lot of times with the crown so we need to have that uh, open dialogue with the Governor General. Access to the Governor General is very hard to, to get. Just one more thing, open invitation, uh, Treaty 1 to 11 gathering, uh, August 26th to the 30th, Coal Lake, Alberta, you are invited. Thank you. Okay, we will now give time to Jack Mitzing to answer. Thank you so much. Uh, first question was around education and the education agreements. We want to see those agreements upheld and us to move forward. Uh, I've been to many of the schools. I've been to schools across indigenous schools across the country, and it's clear that the, the funding needs to be indexed. It needs to increase, and we need to lift up the level of, uh, of education in indigenous communities. And that is the direction of those current agreements, and we want to see that accelerated and move forward. We do not want us to go backwards, so that's something that uh, we support, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to fight to make sure that that education, those agreements continue and are upheld. In addition, the question will also touched on languages, and as someone, I learned my language later on in life. Uh, my parents were nervous and a little bit embarrassed to, for me to speak it when I was younger, and then later on thought I should learn it. As kids, you know, kids can be very stubborn, so I didn't. But when I was in my 30s, I tried to learn my language, and I, I can speak really fluently now. And I can tell you it is such a powerful way to connect with where you come from and where you are. And so I really believe that uh, for languages, this is something that has to be a priority, and it requires significant funding to keep languages alive, to support the growth of uh, and maintain maintenance of those languages. So I really believe this is something so fundamentally important and my wholehearted support around uh, languages, indigenous languages, have to be protected, have to be maintained, and have to be grown. 
the Oka crisis question from uh, Grand Chief, uh, it, it is a, a uh, mark on our history that military was used against indigenous people in that way. Uh, it was wrong, and uh, absolutely we should be pushing for a, a formal apology. Uh, I would say that uh, any time military police are used against indigenous people, it's wrong that way. And then the, the specific subject matter of the question was around uh, the decision, which, uh, which is what the crisis is all about. Uh, so I, I support, again, this is in light of the United Nations uh, Declaration, the, my belief in free and prior consent, the ability for Indigenous people to, to do uh, what they want with their land and to be able to have decision making over their land. I, I uphold the decisions that support your ability to do that. So of course I, I would be in favor of opposing um, the, the scenario that limits your ability to grow, that keeps you in, like as you put it, suspended in time. I think that that is, is unfair and, and uh, unjust. And then uh, last question, important question. Uh, chiefs often have a, a lot of uh, knowledge around, uh, around treaty and, and the interesting relationship that Canada has as a country where there is both, the, of course, the government, but then the, the crown and the relationship that is with both. And a and, uh, specific question was about access to the governor general. And uh, I can see why that is an important request. It's something that I haven't actually turned my mind to, but I, I'm happy to look at solutions where indigenous communities can get access to the governor general as proxy for the crown. So uh, happy to look at that, that idea more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Whatever you like, I'll, okay. I'll be in your hands. Uh, so we'll go uh, on mic number one. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My name is Kevin McKay. I carry a proxy for the Niska village of Dachazat. We belong to the Niska nation. We are 24 years into implementing BC's first modern treaty and is not without challenges, but still I have hope. And the reason I have hope is because all of the children born May the 11th, 2000, right up to the present time, have not had to live one day under the Indian Act. They live under their own government, the Nishka Nation government. So, sir, I am here today to ask for your support in upholding the implementation of BC's first modern treaty. We support the call for an independent office similar to the Auditor General that would report directly to Parliament on treaty implementation challenges. Because if Canada doesn't do that, then all of this treaty making is smoke and mirrors. Because currently, we still report to a department under the Department of Indian Affairs. We demand an independent office similar to the Auditor General. Thank you, sir. As we started this way, we'll continue on mic number one again, since there's still time. Good morning, Jagmeet. Thank you for attending our assembly. And thank you for reflecting on the basic needs of the people who live on the reserve, the need for housing and safe drinking water. Thank you for recognizing there's 28 boil water advisories outstanding in Canada. Ontario region has the majority of those boil water advisories. First Nations have been waiting decades, waiting and wondering if they can protect the health and safety of the people that live in their community because of the lack of access to safe drinking water. Urgent money is needed now, not after the election. 
you have the ability to, and the Prime Minister, to go to the Consolidated Revenue Fund to get additional money that's needed now to address the need for safe drinking water in Ontario and across Canada and, the, and the, the urgent need for investment in housing so that people won't live in overcrowded, unsafe houses or families with children won't be homeless. I want to know, will you do that now? Thank you. Uh, we will go on mic number two. We will return to mic number one and it will be the last question. So two last questions. Good morning, Chief Andy Alok, Big Stone Cree Nation. Welcome, thank you for taking the time to meet with the First Nations people today. Um, I wanna speak on a few items and I know that you had mentioned that we need good infrastructure. We need excellent infrastructure within the nations, but also equitable infrastructure we see in our neighboring communities, within the municipalities, and within our provinces that we're, our infrastructure isn't equitable. We need access to all the social determinants of health, education, housing. We need access to the data to show the disparities within our nations in comparison to our neighboring communities. We also want to know what action items are you willing to work on, regardless of you getting in as our next Prime Minister. We need to be able to measure the disparities of our First Nations people, determine a path forward, and strategize in partnership with every level of government to see how we're going to improve the quality of life of our First Nations people today and tomorrow. I want to know what is going to happen um, when and if you get in. How are these action items going to be achieved realistically we hear a number of times um, when people campaign, the promises that are broken. And they have been broken for the last few decades and the last 150 plus years. We also need to ensure that our treaties are recognized, um, not only at a federal level, but also at the provincial level. We need to ensure that the resources of our First Nations are being brought back for the benefit of our First Nations people. I want to know how that is going to happen. We also need to ensure that, uh, that the future generations of our children are able to identify with their First Nations community. There's so many people that have been lost because of Indian residential schools, in the 60s scoop. How are we going to identify our First Nations people that have lost their identity with their communities? Big Stone Cree Nation has lost so many people because of the opioid crisis as well. We have a number of houseless people, homeless people. How is the federal government going to be able to support shortage of housing when the traumas of Indian Residential School are still there? We need, no longer need Band-Aid solutions. We need long-term sustainable funding to implement positive change for our people that are affected by the traumas that Canada had put in place. I also want to extend an invite to you to come to Treaty 8, as well as extending an invite to Big Stone Cree Nation so you could see firsthand the disparities that we face every day as First Nations people. Thank you. Okay, uh, so since it's the last questions and there's still 48 seconds on this mic, uh, we only give you this time uh, to, uh, to speak. And then we'll go over to mic one. Microphone number two. Uh, good morning, Jack Mead. Uh, proxy Clint Peters, Bacajanon Territory, Wapal Island First Nation. I have a question regarding the Jay Treaty of 1794. Um, it seems that uh, Canada's in serious violation of not honoring this treaty. It affects our territory, it affects our people. We cannot cross freely in the border. There is no border. It is, we should be unmolested, whether it's work, trade, school, living, whatever it is. We want answers for that. We've been fighting that for years. The fight is going to continue, and I'd like to know what your government plans on doing for this and for our community and our territory. Miigwech. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over to microphone number one. 
and other stuff. And they need, both parties need your support to get what they want. So whoever you side with tends to get their legislations in and approved. So I'm asking you, the Liberal Party has been trying to get rid of our international treaties. They're not trying, they're in the process. They talk about the Indian Act, which they're going to get rid of, and yes, that Indian Act stripped our people of their authority, of their authority as sovereign nations. It did. So now, the Liberal Party, Trudeau is saying, oh, I want to do a great thing, I want to get rid of the Indian Act. But in the meantime, he's recolonizing us, keeping us subordinate to the Canadian government through other policies like the Land Management Act, you know, which is going to make our lands fee simple. They give us 10-year agreements with no guarantee after 10 years to look after the promises of treaty that the Canadian, our federal government has, that the Imperial Crown gave them. We're not here to look for handouts. We are here, just wait, we are here to look and make sure that our peoples prosper. Our peoples live in poverty, and you know that very well. So what are you going to do to help us that Canada can quit recolonizing us and ensure that there'll always be Indians. We are, oh, I know you're real Indian, but anyway, us Indians, <laughs> red Indians. Us red Indians, as they call us, that will always be here and will always have our territories for as long as the sun shine, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. Right now, Canada's trying to do away with that. Okay. So. Thank you, Miigwech, thank you. Wait, one more sentence. You're just taking um, up my time. One more sentence. You have your what four are minutes. you going to do to help us for Canada to live according to the spare and intent of our international treaties with the imperial crown, which Canada has no business interfering with? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. Um, it was worth sticking around, I gotta tell you. Uh, first off, I know that uh, uh, the chief who asked that question wanted to stay standing to receive the answer, so I, I appreciate the honor that you're giving me, but I can still respond to the first question, um, or sorry, the, the second question. But the first question was about the Niska Nation. I think that there's a lot of good that's being done around the modern treaties. I think this is a, a, could be a very potentially powerful step forward. And But the question was, the treaty could be good, but it's about the implementation. And if the impl implementation is not there, then it really takes away from the, pro the potential good. So the question was around my support for the implementation of the treaty. Yes, full support for that. Uh, but specifically the question was, the way it's structured is that even if it's a modern treaty, you still have to work with the minister who is governed underneath the Indian Act, and that's undermining all of that. So I, I hear you on that. And so the call was, could there be a different, or a demand was for a different system uh, to go directly to an independent office like the Auditor General that doesn't sit underneath the Indian Act. I think that's a really good solution. I haven't looked at that specifically, but I think it makes a lot of sense uh, that if you're a modern treaty, you don't want to then have to go back to working within an Indian Act structure. So I see the, the argument there, and I'm happy to work on a solution that doesn't, allow, doesn't make you have to go under the same system that you want to be separate from under a modern treaty. So I hear you on that. This is the question that the chief had waited. The second question was the chief wanted to hear the answer and was standing there. I appreciate that respect. It was around uh, acknowledging that the housing and water are issues, but what am I going to do to push for it now? And I think it's a very good question that, of course, I want uh, to be the next prime minister to make these decisions with the full power of government but I'm not gonna wait until then. And so right now we are pushing the government to move on housing, to move on 
water, and we are using the leverage we have to push them to act right now to get money flowing right now. So we are doing that, and we're going to keep. Oh, there you are, Chief. And we're going to keep on doing that. So you're right. It's not. We don't have to wait till the next election. We're we're pushing for that now and using the the, the power that we have to try to get results now. Uh, next question was on equitable funding, and um, and also data. Uh, the chief was really concerned about not just good infrastructure, but excellent infrastructure and equitable infrastructure. Maybe people remember the question that I was, I was posed about water, and someone said, well, how much is it going to cost? What if it costs too much? And I said, well, you wouldn't ask that question if we were talking about clean water in Montreal or clean water in Vancouver or in Toronto. Sure. Same with infrastructure. You wouldn't ask that question. So I agree that, that it should be equitable infrastructure. And, and it means that giving the first people this land a, a fair shot at building a bright future, you have to have equitable infrastructure that's equal uh, to the communities around them and acknowledges that in some cases, if it's been so bad for so long, we have to make bigger investments in. So this is something I, I believe in and I've been uh, constantly pushing for that. The other question was around uh, data to make better decisions and to point out the impacts being not equitable and having better data to show that the, the outcomes are different. I think that's a very good point. We need to be able to have good data to show that the outcomes are unfair, and so I support ways to get better data. And then the last two were acknowledging the trauma of residential schools. Absolutely, that trauma is still being impacted or still being felt today, the impacts. And some of the solutions were long-term sustainable funding. I agree, that's, that's one of the major solutions, working with First Nations, long-term sustainable funding to address the trauma. Uh, the ch specific question by another chief was on the 19 or the 1794 treaty and that there's violations going on. Uh, I'm not familiar with that specific treaty, but I'm happy to work with any nation that's being impacted by uh, violations of treaty rights in ways that I can advocate to be a, a, a champion to support your call. I think you were con particularly concerned about free movement uh, particularly over borders, and then that treaty is being violated. Happy to work with you on that issue. Um, there was a chief asking a question specifically for Teresa Point about advocating for a road. Uh, these are these are type of issues that we've been pushing for. Recently, we pushed for funding for a hospital in uh, northern Ontario that was long promised but not delivered. We were able to get that funding. It's helping uh, primarily Indigenous communities. So happy to push for projects like that. A lot of communities that are right now isolated uh, could have a road built and they could be connected to other communities. I think we need to be doing more of that work, so happy to look at that project. Um, last question was, this was uh, by um, Regina Crochild. Regina Crochild, uh, very powerful. I feel like another round of applause for the lots of great points that were raised. And. Uh, <laughs> Regina Crochel acknowledged that I, that I waited. I, I've been to uh, AFNs in the past, AFN assemblies, and I know how important it is for you to have your voices heard. And so sometimes I may not have all the answers, but I definitely have to hear the questions so I can at least reflect on them and think about them. And so uh, while I give a speech, I hope my speech has, has weight, I also know hearing from you is maybe even more important. So that's why I try to give it as much time as possible. And I told my team to allow for flexibility after the speech, knowing that there might be more questions. So I, I make that a request, or I make that a demand that I need to have a flexible schedule after the speech in case there's more questions so that I can spend here, spend the time with you. Uh, I think all leaders should do that. I think they know very well that uh, the chiefs will have questions. And so I make sure that that's a commitment to try to give you as much time as possible. So thank you for acknowledging that, uh, Regina Crochild. Uh, your question was around a lot of important points, international treaties, um, using our power in this agreement and using it in the future, questions about the Indian Act stripping authority from indigenous communities and what I'm going to do. Uh, I think there was a lot, a lot in that question and so I think it would be, it might be another 20 minute speech about how I, I could respond to all those things. But I think fundamentally, like just how do we solve any of the problems, I think, treating indigenous communities as, as, as equal partners, uh, working together shoulder to shoulder, not demanding or putting pressures or acting like Ottawa knows all. 
I think that's the approach to any of these solutions. Any of these problems can be solved with working with Indigenous communities together, true nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, hearing from you in terms of what the solutions are, and moving in a way that is respectful, is collaborative. Like these are the, that's the approach. I think it's the spirit that we have to challenge these problems. You just approach it with that spirit, and that's what I want to do. I want to approach it with that, that spirit, that intention. I, I've seen the federal government very close. I say the closest of anyone that's not in government. I've seen the way they work, and I know there's so many solutions. There's so much that can be done if you've got the will. And, and that's what I have, I have the will. I, I'm not satisfied with just moving along slowly. I wanna use everything I can to push for quick action, and so I'm gonna continue to do that. And that's the spirit I approach all these problems. I care deeply, as my mom taught me that we are all one, so I care deeply about the challenges you're up against, and I wanna be an ally, and I wanna work with you. So thank you so much. Merci oh, yeah. beaucoup au chef euh, du nouveau Parti démocratique, Jug Mitzink. Thank you, everyone, for those good conversations, those good comments. And now we're going to get into the business side of resolutions. Uh, we just have a few announcements, too. There is available at distribution a proposed omnibus packages cheat sheet, let's call it. So this is just so that you guys can know what's coming up uh, during the day. As is uh, the tradition here, we try to get through as many as we can. So we will be getting to these pretty rapidly. This cheat sheet is available at distribution. And if ever there are amendments that you would like to propose on any of these resolutions, it would be a great help if you can head over to the resolutions committee and already get that language to them so that we can roll through the process more efficiently. For now, we will be going to our draft resolution as revised. for revised draft resolution 58. And also I've just been handed a note saying uh, that there are still single resolutions, such as the one we are doing now. So it is not just omnibuses, these are just the proposed packages. So we can head to revised draft resolution number 58 for my technicians, thank you very much. And before we get to this, I think it's important to note that there is two opposing language resolutions included in the resolutions package. Resolutions number, draft resolutions number 57 and 58. But over the week, the technicians, the chiefs, have been working together to find language that will bring together a common language and a consensus approach for funding allocation formula. And this is what we have in front of us now. The hard work brought to consensus for draft resolution as revised number 58. We have as mover Cook B. Fred Robbins. So I will look to see if Cook B. Fred Robbins is with us. We have Cook B. Fred Robbins, thank you. And we had as a seconder Proxy Paula Akus. Do we have our seconder? That side. Thank you very much. Thank you for the heads up. So we do have both our mover and seconder. So I will go on to read the therefore be it resolved. Thank you, technicians. So therefore be it resolved for draft resolution 58, First Nations Languages Regional Allocation Formula. Therefore be it resolved, one, call on the Government of Canada to fulfill their legislative requirements through the Indigenous Languages Act, ILA, to provide long-term sustainable funding that reflects the actual cost to reclaim, revitalize, maintain, protect, and strengthen First Nations languages as determined by First Nations. Two, Call on the Assembly of First Nations, AFN, to file a complaint with the Office of the Commissioner of Indigenous Languages, OCIL, regarding chronically inadequate funding and misalignment with the principles and objectives of the ILA. Three, 
call on AFN Legal to provide an analysis, including recommendations on a potential Canadian human rights complaint on the ongoing and historical chronic underfunding of First Nations languages, uh, language reclamation and revitalization resulting in a further endangerment of First Nations languages. Four, call on the AFN to continue to work on gathering data on the regional allocation formula, RAF, factors outlined in the AFN's First Nations languages funding model in full partnership with the Technical Committee on Languages, TCOL, to develop an evidence-based approach to the RAF supported by a national data collection strategy and presented to the Chiefs Committee on Languages, CCOL, and Technical Committee on Languages for review and future co-development as soon as possible, but no later than two years. Five, direct the AFN to host a facilitated two-day strategic planning session with the TCOL and CCOL to discuss long-term objectives to support future co-development, including a discussion on national data collection and a funding strategy for the development of a RISE language for languages funding formula within six months. The CCOL and TCOL will reconvene after a framework is developed to further discuss the formula. Six, affirm that a co-development approach concerning First Nations languages is not intended to detract or hinder any self-government process or derogate from any existing First Nations treaty and inherent rights. Seven, call on the Government of Canada to implement the commonly approved interim funding approach over two years, as agreed upon by the CCOL by consensus on July 10th, 2024. Eight, call on the Government of Canada to work with First Nations to reallocate any unused funds from the above-mentioned formula as applied to Budget 2024 over two years to ensure they are distributed to regions able to allocate the funds in a timely manner. And priority will be given to those regions with the greatest need. And the final, therefore, be resolved. Nine, call on Government of Canada to redistribute any unused funds from the OCIL to the ILC to support First Nations community-led language initiatives. So we have read the therefore be it resolves into the minutes. And I would now move over to our mover, Cook B. Fred Robbins, for opening comments. You would have four minutes on the microphone, too, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, uh, I want to also acknowledge whose territory we're on, thank them for allowing us to be here today uh, as nations. Uh, I also want to thank our opening prayer to get us started off in a good way. I speak as the Chief Representative of the Chief's Committee on Languages as a mover of this resolution. It has been a long journey to get to this point. I'm proud to say that our technical representatives and our Chiefs have worked over the last two, last two days to find a path forward on a regional allocation formula for our language revitalization. The journey's been challenging but the resolve that our committee has demonstrated to find the interim solution has shown the power of census-driven decision-making by our leadership and our committee. We all agree to give a little, take a little. While this formula in no means is perfect, it is a temporary solution to a long-term strategy to come together in good faith and determine a better path forward for the long term <laughs> In the meantime, we have important work to do as chiefs. The resolution is about more than a formula. It's about holding the government accountable to its legal obligations to fund our languages to a level that ensures that they are revitalized, reclaimed in honor of our ancestors and future generations. This resolution is about agreeing to our frustrations aren't about the pennies that the government has thrown at us to fight for. The government thrives when our nations are held divided, but over the past two years of negotiations, language funding has drastically reduced for all of our regions, despite Indigenous Language Act passing in 2019. This resolution is about demanding that Canada upholds the UN Declaration and its legal obligation outlined in the Indigenous Language Act to ensure that all of our regions are equitably funded moving forward. I know each region isn't thrilled 
with the individual outcome of this formula. But I remind chiefs that we all had to compromise to move forward. I call on all chiefs to support this resolution in good and the good work of the chiefs and the technical committee on language and the important work in front of us. I also ask the resolution table to ensure that the translation not be lost from English to French and French to English. Mr. Chair, it has been quite some time since our languages across Canada have been acknowledged. And in the BC region, we have languages that are near extinct. And we need the support of this funding so that we can re re revitalize that for future generations. For far too long, the federal government has been holding ISC. It's so frustrating having to be First Nations in our territory asking the federal government for support when in the long run, as First Nations, all the resources and the extractions, and I thank uh, Little Child for speaking out about this, but where is the fairness when it comes to the billions of dollars that the federal government receives from tax dollars from our lands? So I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, ask that there be no friendly amendments to this resolution. Uh, we will be bringing it back in Winnipeg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cook P. Robbins. I would now look towards our seconder, Proxy Akus, to address. You have four minutes. Microphone one, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging Chief Ira MacArthur for his devotion to the languages. Uh, coming from a Nakota First Nation, we understand and appreciate the importance of, of language revitalization. Um, this draft resolution is a result of clear direction given by the First Nations in assembly to the Chiefs Committee on Languages and the Technical Committee on Languages. The regional allocation formula proposed by this draft re resolution applies to a new funding from Canadian Heritage for the next two years. Importantly, this draft resolution begins to address the concern that Canadian Heritage's previous regional allocation formula was developed without duly consulting the rights holders in all the regions. The previous formula did not have the collective consent of all the regions. This draft resolution calls for steps to be taken to fully resolve this issue and ensure that the rights holders of all regions are provided with free, prior, and informed consent on this important issue of language revitalization. First Nations have the right and obligation to ensure the Crown upholds its duty to consult. When, the First, Nation, when First Nations' right to free, prior, and informed consent is not upheld, it endangers First Nations' rights across all sectors and all regions. What is missing in this draft resolution and, that, and from uh, Canadian heritage programs is a focus on core funding for language revitalization. It has been five years since the Indigenous Language Act was passed in 2019, and the Canadian Heritage plans to maintain a proposal-driven approach for its Indigenous language revitalization funding until 2028. This is not right and does not align with the commitments made to the rights holders and grassroots people who strive to uphold our languages. The consensus during the consultation for the Language Act was to provide our communities with core-based language revitalization funding. First Nations must be directly provided with the core-based funding needed to achieve language revitalization. We will not revitalize our languages with proposal-based funding. Our communities must have core-based language revitalization funding. This draft resolution is only one small step towards achieving a future 
where all of our communities flourish in um, all, all of our languages flourish in all of our communities. I ask for your support for this resolution, and I can I uh, support the movers' request for no friendly amendments. Megwich. Thank you, Proxy Akus. So we'll now be going into our discussion period. I see Chief Martin or Proxy Martin at microphone number two. Microphone number two, please. Well, <laughs> John Martin Delvisi, Gaskabi Yaklewi, a proxy Bemado, Chitsama, White Roderick Lavak. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Martin from the Gaskabi First Nation and, and proxy for uh, Chief Lavak for, uh, for Gaskabi Yak. Um, just like to uh, state that uh, first, la first, first Nations languages are actually the first official languages of the land. And I think that's uh, an important acknowledgement to make and uh, uh, we always make that point, especially when you come from the Quebec region. And in the Quebec region, more particularly, uh, we are certainly under uh, uh, duress with regards to uh, the preservation of our languages. The Minister of Justice in Quebec uh, uh, maintains policies and uh, refuses to uh, recognize uh, that the policies and laws in Quebec uh, have quite a significant impact on the preservation of our languages. And I think. Uh, no, the policies of colonization continue. Uh, they're quite healthy in Quebec and, uh, and in other places as well. As a result, our languages are uh, in a very critical state. And um, any time that you find yourself in a critical state, I think it's important to take stock and make an assessment of where you are and what your next move is going to be. So I'm here basically to support this, uh, 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 this resolution. Um, the resolution speaks to uh, the uh, Language Act. I think it's a step in the right direction. Maybe didn't go far enough. But certainly, um, the financial resources are not there. If this act is going to get anywhere or accomplish the objectives that it's supposed to, uh, to accomplish, uh, you need a full tank of gas to get the destination. And right now, we have a quarter of a tank of gas. And uh, with the cuts that are uh, being made, well, they just punctured a hole in that tank, so it's going to be very hard to get the destination until we're able to turn that around. So that's uh, really, a, really a concern. You know, a little bit over $30 million to, uh, to divide right across the country. You know, 10 provinces, uh, the territories, uh, is, uh, is insufficient. So I think that, uh, you know, the Assembly of First Nations needs to mobilize politically. You know, be on the ground. Uh, there is a solid plan that needs to be put in place. I believe the resolution also speaks to that, uh, having a proper plan in place to be able to uh, strengthen the Language Act and uh, secure the resources that are needed to really address the issue of our languages uh, in the community. Uh, and uh, right now, we are. Uh, uh, there is an interim forum that formula that has been agreed to. Uh, we've managed to come to agreement on that. Uh, nobody's happy about it. Uh, we realize because there is insufficient dollars. So obviously, you know, uh, people had to make sacrifices and important sacrifices, you know. And uh, this is uh, felt in our region. Uh, we have two colonial languages that we have to do with, deal with. So anything we do is uh, is triple, right? So uh, that's uh, really difficult. Uh, with regards to the formula, any formula that may come out of this, that uh, you know, it should be a formula that um, leaves no language behind. Every language is important, and uh, you know uh, I support uh, this resolution uh, as presented today. And I thank the good work for that was done by the uh, the Technical Committee on Languages and the Chiefs Committee on Languages. Well, audio said one. Thank you. Well, Alan Chief, or well, Alan Proxy Martin. I will look towards our microphones, see if we have any additional speakers before going to the vote. I see we still have. Someone on microphone number two, Chief Denny. Uh, Chief Leroy Denny, Eskazonia First Nation. Uh, we, I just want to fully support this resolution, and I just want to commend our committee of all our uh, all regions uh, across uh, the country that we work together diligently in unity to uh, come together and brought this resolution uh, to a consensus. And I just want to commend as chair of uh, the language committee. I just want to commend all our committee members and our 
technician team, uh, technician team for coming together. And I just want to ask for a round of applause for our team. Thank you, Chief Denny. So final look around the room to see if we have someone who would like to address Draft Resolution 58 as revised First Nations Languages Regional Allocation Formula. Question has been called. We will now proceed to a vote. Is anyone opposed to Draft Resolution 58 as revised First Nations Languages Regional Allocation Formula? Do we have any opposition? Seeing none, we have one opposition. Does anyone abstain? We have one abstention. So draft resolution 58, as revised, First Nations Languages Regional Allocation Formula is adopted by majority. Thank you. everyone okay so now we will uh, introduce an omnibus package on fisheries five draft resolutions are contained uh, are combined in this uh, omnibus package first one today Fisheries, so we will introduce draft, resol draft resolution number 18, 19. Minor amendments have been made in this uh, draft resolution 19, then 20, 21, 22. So, on that, we will first, you know the process, but we will first uh, read all the titles of these uh, five draft resolutions. I will then verify if the mover and the seconder of this omnibus package are present in the room, and we will then read all therefore be it resolved sections of these five draft resolutions, and we will then open the floor for discussions. Okay, on that, we, let's read the first one, draft resolution number 18 entitled First Nations Inclusion in the Transformation of the Fresh Water Fish Marketing Corporation. The next draft resolution title, draft resolution number 19, First Nations Continued Inclusion in Canada's Oceans Protection Plan and Marine Safety Emergency Planning. Next resolution, please. Number 20, entitled 2024 Fisheries Act five-year review to ensure alignment with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Next, please. Draft resolution number 21, entitled First Nations Wild Atlantic Salmon Conservation Approaches. Draft resolution number 22, the last one on this, in this package, entitled Treaty Protected Rights Based Katik Katu Glass Eel Fishery Governance. This uh, omnibus package has been uh, moved by Chief Dalton Silver. Dalton Silver, are you present in in the room. 
Good morning, Chief. So thank you, Mover is there. It has been seconded by Chief Gerald Tony. Are you present in the room, Chief Tony? You're, my, you're the seconder? My, no change? Okay. Prox okay. Thank you very much. Microphone number one, so seconder is present as well. Okay, so now, what about a bit of reading in French this morning? <laughs> I'm sure you're all more than happy with that decision of mine. So on that, let's read the first one. <clears throat> Alors, il s'agit du projet de résolution numéro... Oh, 18. <laughs> Thank you. So, le numéro 18. Alors, pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée, un, enjoignent à l'Assemblée des Premières Nations d'élaborer une stratégie de plaidoyer pour soutenir, soutenir les pêcheurs des eaux intérieures des Premières Nations qui cherchent à obtenir le plan contrôle de leur pêche commerciale et de leurs modèles commerciaux. Le plein contrôle, pardon, j'ai dit le plan, mais c'est le plein contrôle de leur pêche commerciale et de leurs modèles commerciaux. Deux, enjoigne à l'APN de soutenir le Comité national des pêches et ses techniciens dans ses travaux de surveillance du groupe de travail interprovincial qui est composé d'organisations de pêche autochtones souhaitant acquérir l'Office de commercialisation du poisson d'eau douche. 3. Enjoigne à l'APN de suivre l'évolution de la transformation de l'OCPED et d'en rendre compte chaque année au Comité national des pêches. La prochaine, le prochain projet de résolution, numéro 19. Pour ces motifs, les chefs en assemblée. 1 demande à l'APN, sous réserve de la disponibilité de ressources financières adéquates, de collaborer avec Transport Canada, Pêche et Océan Canada et la garde côtière canadienne pour évaluer les partenariats avec les Premières Nations dans le cadre du Plan de protection des océans, PPO, en ce qui a trait aux capacités ainsi qu'à l'élaboration, à la conception, à l'exécution et à la gouvernance conjointe. Deux, demande à l'APN, sous réserve de la disponibilité de ressources financières adéquates, de collaborer avec Transport Canada, Pêche et Océan Canada et la garde côtière canadienne pour répondre aux besoins de financement, c'est-à-dire entente souple, financement de base et, à long terme, des capacités des Premières Nations vivant dans les zones et les régions visées par le PPO. 3. Demande à l'APN de faire valoir que toute réforme législative, réglementaire, politique et opérationnelle relative au PPO doit respecter les droits inhérents, les traités, le titre et les compétences des Premières Nations et doit reconnaître les responsabilités inhérentes et immuables des Premières Nations à l'égard de leur territoire traditionnel. Le quatrième paragraphe a été ajouté. Alors, je... J'attire votre attention sur ce fait. On le lit ensemble. Numéro 4 demande à l'APN de soutenir pleinement les efforts déployés par les dirigeants des Premières Nations en plaidant auprès du gouvernement du Canada pour qu'il travaille avec les Premières Nations à l'élaboration de stratégies adéquates d'intervention en cas d'urgence maritime qui répondent aux besoins unique des Premières Nations touchées afin d'éviter la perte de vie des pêcheurs des Premières Nations qui pratiquent leur mode de vie traditionnel sur leurs eaux traditionnelles. Projet de résolution numéro 20. Pour ces motifs, les chefs en assemblée, 1. enjoignent à l'APN d'exhorter le gouvernement du Canada à financer adéquatement les activités de mobilisation nécessaires pour garantir une pleine participation collaboration et consultation des Premières Nations dans l'examen quinquennal obligatoire de la loi sur les pêches, conformément à la mesure 38 du plan d'action. Entrepris en pleine coopération et consultation avec les Premières Nations selon un échantillon approprié et avec l'intention de mettre en œuvre les modifications permettant d'atteindre les objectifs de la Déclaration des Nations unies. 3. Enjoignent à l'APN de discuter avec le ministre des Pêches et des Océans et de proposer des modifications qui feront de la loi sur les pêches un instrument juridique permettant la reconnaissance et l'affirmation 
en bonne et due forme des pêches fondées sur des droits inhérents et protégées par des traités, ainsi que la protection et la conservation des eaux maritimes et côtières. Prochain projet de résolution, numéro 21. We continue. So, le, ce projet de résolution numéro 21, pour ses motifs, les Premières Nations d'Assemblée enjoignent à la PN de demander au Canada de fournir un financement et des ressources adéquates aux Premières Nations dans les régions de l'Atlantique et du Québec pour leur permettre de s'engager pleinement aux côtés du MPO dans la mise en œuvre des stratégies de, de conservation des Premières Nations, de participer à la politique et à la stratégie de conservation du saumon atlantique et de veiller au respect des droits inhérents et issus de traités des Premières Nations. Deux, demande à l'APN de solliciter le ministère des Pêches et des Océans de s'assurer que la politique et la stratégie de conservation du saumon atlantique sauvage sont conformes aux objectifs de la Déclaration des Nations unies et qu'elles les, qu les soutiennent pardon, et que la mobilisation répond aux exigences de consultation et de collaboration prévues par la loi sur la Déclaration des Nations unies. Numéro 3. Enjoigne à l'APN de s'assurer, en collaboration avec le MPO, que les conclusions des processus de mobilisation sur la PCSAS ou encore la SCSAS sont communiquées aux Premières Nations. Finalement, le dernier, le dernier paragraphe. Enjoigne à l'APN de demander que les modifications nécessaires soient apportées à la loi sur les pêches pour garantir le respect des méthodes de gestion des pêches et de conservation du saumon Atlantique sauvage des Premières Nations. Projet de résolution numéro 22. Pour ces motifs, les chefs en assemblée, un, soutiennent les Premières Nations, ah, Mi'kmaq et Wallace dans leur déclaration publique sur les droits ancestraux issus de traités de et de participer à la pêche, à la, et pardon, à la Kitty Katou. I'm sorry. <rire> euh, ou Sibel et le droit de mettre en place une gouvernance, une gestion des pêches et des systèmes de connaissances autochtones et scientifiques connexes pour favoriser une pêche durable fondée sur les droits. Alors, ce projet, de, ce, pardon, ce, cet ensemble de projets de résolution sur les pêches a été, a, a été proposé, coproposé et entrer élu et entrer dans le registre. Pour cela, nous allons maintenant ouvrir la période de discussion et nous allons aller avec euh, inviter le, le proposeur à introduire euh, l'ensemble le, le, de projet de résolution omnibus sur les pêches. So, on that, I will now invite the mover. If the mover can, wishes to uh, introduce this omnibus package on fisheries, you have up, up to four minutes. Thank you very much. Microphone number two, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm a, I'm a lot shorter than four minutes, I believe. Um, I, I think uh, there, was a, there was an amendment to number 19 that added uh, a number four, and I talked with the seconder, and, and we are totally in agreement with that. But on, on number 20, uh, the resolution, the title reads at the top, um, to ensure alignment with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, and actually we propose and we're agreed to uh, amend that to read United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, period. The reason being the act refers to federal legislation that is not totally implemented and uh, we want it to be consistent with, with the rights. And I think, Gee. you know, Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just want to make sure that um, what is the draft resolution number we're talking about at this moment and, and well, where? The, the first one was 19 at the bottom of, and I think it was up on the, on the uh, screen already. There was uh, an amendment on the therefore it be it resolves to add a number four. 
which will be inclusive of fresh water. Yes. Okay. And, and does that wording reflect what you just mentioned? Are you okay with that uh, wording? Uh, already um, included in this draft resolution number 19? Yes, marine and inland waters is what we're looking at. Thank you. Okay. And, Thank you very uh, much. On resolution number 20, on the title, it says to align with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, and we would just like to uh, take the word act off of there. So it's reflective of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, period. For, for a few reasons, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to make sure that the secondary is okay with that as well. And, uh, and this way, I will also ask if you could um, state your, your, your name. Uh, I don't think we got it properly, so it will be the perfect occasion to do so. Microphone number one, please. Good morning. Uh, Tyler Sack, proxy for Chief Gerald Tony, Annapolis Valley First Nation. The proposed amendments are acceptable. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chief. Would you like to, uh, to speak on that matter before opening the floor for um, other chiefs and proxies that wish to speak on that uh, omnibus package? Over to you. Microphone number one. Well, Alan, uh, as mentioned, I'm Tyler Sack, proxy for Chief Gerald Tony of Annapolis Valley First Nation in Nova Scotia, who is the co-lead chief on four fisheries for the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and our region's representative on the Chiefs Committee on Fisheries, who is seconding the omnibus packages. Uh, harvesting is a right that we all share. He wanted uh, to outline that we should uh, take great interest in protecting that right, ensuring that our people have access to economic opportunities related to our fisheries and that our resources are managed according to our own ways, our knowledge, and principles. In addition to seconding the omnibus package, he's also seconding or moving on Resolution 21 uh, that outlines the conservation measures to protect Atlantic salmon as our resource. Uh, and seconder on resolu Resolution number 22, these species are significant to our culture and our nation, and they're significant, and uh, we've been removed from the process of uh, co-managing and co-governing co that resource. We believe that this is a way to support the self-determination over those and reconnect our people with those ways of life, ultimately supporting sovereignty and self-governance. Um, the DFO have proven to us, species after species, that conservation management and governance mechanisms continue to put our species at risk rather than conserve them. We know how to best manage our resources and how to ensure fair and safe access for all of our harvesters through governance systems rooted in our traditional structures and knowledge. We support these resolutions as they are important to advancing our rights and protecting our resources. Walaliok. Miigwech, Chief. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite other chiefs, uh, other chief to uh, come and uh, speak uh, ad and address the assembly. Microphone number two, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hugh Breaker, proxy for Chief Kenneth Watts of Tsesha'at First Nation. I'm going to propose two amendments. On motion number 19, the, let me pr say in, in advance that the federal government has given a large grant to the Métis to uh, assess effects on Aboriginal fishing rights and uh, developments in the uh, ocean. They have no rights there. They're not even from BC. So I'd like a number four. Which but I think it's very important. I hear too much noise there. So please, if, uh, if you could keep your uh, side conversations, maybe outside the, the, the room or or very quietly, silently, because it's, it's disturbing a bit here. So thank you very much. And Chief, could you please specify again which draft resolution you propose an amendment to? This first one is for uh, resolution number 19. I'd like a number four. And I'm sorry, I apologize. I didn't type it out. I didn't realize there was a, an omnibus on fishing. In any event, uh, number four, that funding to assess ocean protection 
shipping and development in the oceans, on um, Aboriginal rights, go only to the title and rights holders. Thank you, Chief. So, Resolution Committee will come and see you to make sure they have the correct language. We will uh, update the Google Drive, the, the draft resolution, and we will come back on that. So, does that complete your um, intervention on the floor? Okay, so over to you. One more, Madam Chair. Um, the problem we have, the Fraser River is one of the largest uh, fisheries bodies in Canada. It uh, provides fish for more than 80 or 90 First Nations in British Columbia, and they are planning six major developments at least on the mouth of the Fraser, uh, rebuilding re, uh, the tunnel on Highway 99, uh, putting in a major uh, wastewater treatment facility in the south arm of the Fraser, rebuilding Patello Bridge, um, expanding, <laughs> expanding uh, Roberts Bank Superport, and I've forgotten two more. Um, the problem is the First Nations are not getting funding to assist in the assessment of those and their effect on their Aboriginal rights, and I'd like that funding to go to them. So it would be number four in uh, motion 20. It would say uh, provide adequate funding to the First Nation title and rights holders on the Fraser River to assess the effect of major developments in the lower Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So draft, resol uh, draft resolution. <laughs> Resolution Committee <laughs> will uh, we'll work this out with you and we will we'll come back for that. So at this moment, microphone number two, the speaker's list is closed on that microphone. We will come back on the two uh, proposed amendments. And now I invite microphone number one, please. Over to you. Uh, Vera Mitchell, Chief Poplar River in Manitoba. I, uh, I support the resolutions, despite the fact that they're very uh, ambiguous and uh, not to the point. And I want to make some comments regarding fisheries. It was a very big mistake when, when Department of Fisheries and Oceans decided to clump the inland fisheries and the coastal fisheries together. And I have to say that AFN has always put fisheries in the back burner. I quit trying to call AFN on behalf of my fishermen because there is no strategy, no organization, and no resources whatsoever to First Nations to try and discuss fisheries and strategize. And we're feeling that in our inland fisheries uh, in Manitoba that because we don't have the resources that everybody's all over the place. And fishermen in our, in our region depend on fishing as a livelihood to support their, their families. And we have so much challenges uh, with, in regards to all the garbage that's in our, our lake, the pollution, the, it's really hard to to be a, a fisherman, a commercial fisherman in our region. So I'm just reaching out to AFN to, to put more emphasis on, on assisting our fishermen, both in the inland and the coastal. I can't speak for the coastal fishermen, but I just uh, want to share that there is nothing at AFN, and let's get our priorities straight and support our, our fishermen that are trying to make a living. Thank you. Miigwech, Chief. So the speaker's list is now closed. We will come back on the proposed amendments that were discussed on the floor. And I will ask Encor to please put up on the screen draft resolution number 19, and we will go to the therefore be it resolved section number five. And we will read it. And I will then ask the chief at the microphone to make sure this uh, 
paragraph five does reflect is proposed uh, wording. Okay, so we will read it together. So, direct the AFN to advocate that funding to assess ocean protection and marine shipping and development in the, and the, sorry, in the ocean go only to the title and rights holders. So, the chief that proposed that uh, amendment uh, made a thumbs up, so that uh, that confirms that this language reflects what he proposes to uh, add. And now I'm going to ask the mover. Is the mover in agreement with that proposed amendment? Microphone number two, please. Yes, and thank you. Thank you very much. Seconder, microphone number one, please. Yes, in agreement. Thank you, Proxy. So, my, uh, draft resolution 19 has been amended. Technicians, if you could please put up on the screen uh, draft resolution number 20, and we will go to, therefore, be it resolved number four. We will read it together. So. Four, direct the AFN to advocate to the federal government to provide adequate, fu uh, adequate funding to First Nations rights and title holders on the Lower Fraser River for major developments. Does that, yes, thank you. So that reflects the, the, langu the, the, the language there, reflects the proposed amendment. So thank you very much. And I am now looking at the mover if, to see if he does agree with this proposed amendment. Microphone number two, please. Only slightly, and, and I talked with uh, the mayor who's typing it up, but uh, provide adequate funding to First Nations rights and title holders on the lower Fraser River for addressing major developments. So one word added, uh, to yeah. be added. Perfect. I got a confirmation from the chief that proposed that amendment. He's, he's, he's also perfectly okay with that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will now look at the microphone number one. Are you okay? Mover, uh, sorry, seconder, are you okay with this proposed amendment? Yes, all good. Thank you so much. So draft resolution number 20 has been amended. Anything else? This complete our discussion period on this uh, omnibus package number one for today on fisheries. So draft resolutions in this, dra in this omnibus package, it's, sorry, it's omnibus package number three, but it's the first for today, but it's number three on fisheries. Um, it contains five draft resolutions, 18, 19 has been, uh, amended, 20 as amended, 21 and 22. Is it? Perfect, thank you so much. And now, chiefs and proxies, uh, we will, uh, I will call the question and I will look at the, at, the, at the floor to see if there is any opposition to this omnibus package number three on fisheries. Any opposition, if you wish to oppose to that, Omnibus package on fisheries, please uh, raise up your red lanyard. I don't see any opposition. None. Any abstention in the room? I don't see any abstention in the room. So I now declare this uh, omnibus package number three on draft, uh, pa pardon me, on fisheries, including uh, draft resolution 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 as amended, has been uh, carried by consensus. Congratulations to you all. Thank you so much. On that, I will now turn the floor over to National Chief. Over to you, National Chief. <laughs> well, thank you, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I know there's lots of work to, to do, but um, 
course, legally, we're, we're always told to do one thing over another. And chiefs, over the past many assemblies, you have passed resolutions wanting um, a deal done on, on child welfare. And late last night, as we discussed in camera, we couldn't talk to it publicly. Uh, we, we can now, after I officially do this. Uh, but late last night, I want to thank the executive as well. I know um, standing here and there's there's many others that are in support. I know I know that there's lots of work that has went into it and all of us as a team have done that for you. You've directed us to go and get a deal out of Canada. You've pushed us over and over again to continue to negotiate in a good way, stay at the negotiating table and, and get the work done for you. And late last night, finally, <laughs> Uh, legal things aren't easy from time to time. It's uh, sometimes even just one word is a different thing, right? So all of the different parties had to go through that. And late last night, uh, we are pleased. And I want to, before going into that, I just want to say that um, I want to thank uh, former, you know, our former national chief uh, Joanna Bernard for all your hard work on this. The executive, um, Grand Chief Fiddler, Miigwech, Miigwech. Uh, Joel, Chief Joel Abram, Bobby Narcisse, Abram Benedict, and, and everybody in this assembly for getting us to this point. And negotiations can be tough. Dealing with the Prime Minister's office and Cabinet, all of us banging on those doors, we've done this together. And so we are pleased to announce that, um, and you will have the draft in front of you later today, for you to tell us in September what if you want this or not. And that's what I'm, that's the only thing that I want to do for you as National Chief is I'm going to take your direction. I've been following them to this date and it, it never, never wavered on that and my commitment to each of you Chiefs. We are pleased to announce that we have secured a commitment from the Government of Canada to provide a groundbreaking $47.8 billion in funding over the next 10 years for the necessary reforms outlined in the final settlement agreement. There will be a, uh, the minister is on her way and there will be a special press conference on the negotiated commitment at noon today with Grand Chiefs and Minister Patty Haidu, as well as our executive on the long-term form measures for the First Nations Child and Family Services program. The settlement will be distributed to Chiefs uh, today for your review um, and your feedback prior to the Special Chiefs Assembly in September where I get direction from you, not from agencies, not from AFN, not from staff, not from anybody else, but from Chiefs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, great announcement. Uh, so on that, just want to remind you all that the press conference is not here. It's in the, um, it's in the press conference room. I will ask my co-chair, Cedric. Confirm the room once again. So it's at noon. The press conference is at noon and in the in the press conference room. I don't have the exact number, but in the, in the press conference room. So congratulations to you all. On that, uh, we will continue to do business and deal with resolutions. Uh, so on that, I will turn the floor over to uh, coll my colleague. Uh, colleagues? I think they are negotiating. Uh, Hopefully it's not a raise because uh, the day is not finished and <laughs> we, we have to, uh, some more work to be done <laughs> right now. <laughs> so Veronique, I think uh, Cedric did good in negotiations and <laughs> Veronique is now the chair for this uh, next omnibus package. Thank you so much everyone. Good work. <laughs> okay, so we're now on the omnibus package on environment. I will try and get the mic right. Okay. Um, so I will read all of the 
recitals of the resolutions that are included in this package. So draft resolution number 50, 2024, advocating for an ambitious, fully founded and implemented First Nations climate leadership agenda. Draft resolution 51, 2024, First Nation participation in the development of a right to a LT environment implementation framework and environmental justice strategy. Draft resolution 52, 2024, full and effective particip participation of First Nations in Canada's nature agenda. Draft resolution 54, uh, participation of First Nations in the development of an international legally binding plastic treaty. Draft Resolution 55, removing impacts and reasserting First Nations juris jurisdiction and authority in carbon pollution pricing. Draft Resolution 64, 2024, protection of the Bathurst caribou herd. And the last one of the package, draft resolution 67, 2024, support the Dene First Nation to address contamination from the Exxon Imperial or limited curl mine, uh, mine site. So we have seven draft resolutions. There are some that are revised. Uh, so draft resolution 51 is revised, as well as 52, 54. And that's all. Um, uh, I will now present uh, the mover and the seconder. So the mover, the mover is Chief Biron Louis uh, from Okanagan Indian Band on mic two. And also uh, the seconder is Chief Terry Richardson of Papin ba Papineau First Nations. And we uh, will not uh, take any, uh, we will not present the, the omnibus right now. So there was a, a change, a quick change. I will pass the floor to Wina. Thank you so much, Veronique. And this is the life of a co-chair. And we need to adapt. We need to uh, be always ready for a change. And that's what we are doing right now. And I thank you, Chief. So I know you wanted to speak to that matter, but we just pause the, the dealing of this uh, draft, uh, this omnibus package. And we will come back on that. So it has been uh, moved, seconded, and it's going to be read and entered into the record just after lunch. Uh, because on that, we will have an announcement by, uh, another announcement by National Chief at this moment. And um, we will have some announcement also to make for before going to lunch. And on that, since I have some time, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, um, let you know that uh, the Circle of Trade will close today at 1 p.m. So if you uh, still want to make some uh, nice uh, gift or purchases, or you would need to go before 1 today. Uh, today we will end this day around 4 with our protocol, closing protocols. So we will uh, make, we will, uh, some draft resolution will uh, hit the floors this afternoon as well. So we will continue to uh, the work this afternoon. And, uh, and I still remind you that um, there's a press conference at noon in the press conference room. <laughs> and I'm waiting for... Um, 
support on the stage. Okay, so we need the drum group. So Eagle River Singer, are you available? Larry, I don't know if you're there, but we would need this, the River Singer, Eagle River Singers, <laughs> if possible. But uh, on that, en fait, le bien côté. Peux-tu le dire parce que là, je suis pas. And um, on that, I will turn the floor over to Cedric. Cedric will, will be the one to announce what is coming right now. Thank you so much. So we needed the, the Eagle River singers uh, for that part of the day. And I'm so sorry to make you wait. Uh, we're trying to figure this out. But at this moment, I will now take, okay, I'm, I'm, I am going now to announce the lunch. So uh, we'll have a lunch. We'll come back here at 1 p.m., Cedric. Veronique, 1, uh, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. here back in the room. Please be there, chiefs and proxies. We have uh, resolutions to, uh, to discuss and to vote. So we need quorum. We need you in the room. Uh, and we will continue with Veronique and the omnibus uh, package on what? And on environment. So have a great lunch, everyone. Circle of Trade closes at 1. We'll come back at one. See you all this afternoon, 1, uh, 1 p.m. sharp. <laughs> Thank you very much.
check, test, microphone, check, wireless microphone, drum microphone, wireless number two. Check, test, one, two, three.
So good afternoon, everyone. I just want to say that we will be starting in the next three or four minutes, let's call it like that. And then we'll get going with the resolution that we uh, had started prior to lunch. So again, we'll give another three, four minutes for chiefs and proxies to come into the room and we'll get started. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. So we, we are ready to start again. We will uh, continue with uh, where we were at uh, when we left uh, this morning. So we were there with the omnibus package. Um, I just want to remind you, uh, chiefs that, and proxies, that if you have amendments, uh, we kindly, kindly ask you to go see the resolution committee. There, um, if you do that, they can really have your amendment ready to show it on the screen so it can uh, accelerate our process. The resolution committee is just over there, so you can go and see them if you have amendments. So this morning, uh, we presented the titles of the resolutions in the omnibus of environment, regarding environment. So we will proceed. We also introduce the movers and seconder. Uh, so we are now ready to proceed and read the other sections. Um, and I will read them in French. So we can show uh, resolution 50-2024 on the screens. Our mover for this omnibus is Byron Louis, uh, and our seconder is Judy Wilson, uh, chiefs. And I want to verify if they are in the room. Yes, the two of them are in the room. Perfect. So we can now read the there to be resolved. Um, so for resolution number 50, Je vais poursuivre en français. Pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée demandent au gouvernement du Canada d'assurer la participation entière, directe, transparente et sans entrave des Premières Nations à la fin finalisation du processus de leadership des Premières Nations en matière de climat, notamment dans le cadre de la rédaction du mémoire au cabinet et des présentations au Conseil du Trésor. Demande à tous les ministres concernés du gouvernement du Canada de s'engager à mettre pleinement en œuvre et à financer les recommandations formulées dans le programme pour un leadership des Premières Nations en matière de climat, y compris les recommandations propres aux régions en assurant un financement stable, adéquat et à long terme pour les détenteurs de droits, de, de titres et de traités des Premières Nations afin qu'ils puissent mettre en œuvre leurs propres priorités et stratégies en matière de climat. Enjoigne à l'Assemblée des Premières Nations, le cas échéant, d'appuyer les responsables régionaux des Premières Nations et les dirigeants des Premières Nations dans la conception, l'élaboration et l'articulation du programme pour un leadership des Premières Nations en matière de climat, en se fondant sur les priorités régionales et les, et les éléments prioritaires décrits dans la Stratégie nationale pour le climat de l'APN. 4. Enjoigne, enjoigne à l'APN de collaborer avec les détenteurs de droits, de titres et de traités des Premières Nations afin d'éliminer de, de, les cloisements et veiller à ce que tous les ministres concernés, tous les ministères concernés du gouvernement du Canada adoptent une approche pan-gouvernementale pour mettre en œuvre les recommandations énoncées dans le programme pour un leadership des Premières Nations en matière de climat dans le cadre de la politique fédérale sur le climat. Cinq, Enjoigne à l'APN de présenter une mise à jour aux Premières Nations en Assemblée sur les progrès réalisés dans la mise en œuvre du programme pour un leadership des Premières, en des premières Nations en matière de climat. Donc, ça, c'était pour la résolution 50. 
On va poursuivre avec le, le projet de, réso de résolution révisée numéro 51-2024. We will proceed with the uh, resolution, uh, revised draft resolution 51-2024. Pour ces motifs, l'Assemblée. Euh, I will just. Je vais simplement regarder s'il y a des changements euh, dans les attendus que. Donc, dans les attendus que, euh, au point F, il y a un amendement euh, qui spécifie. Parallèlement, le Parlement a examiné le projet de loi C-226, loi concernant l'élaboration d'une stratégie nationale visant à évaluer et prévenir le racisme environnemental, ainsi qu'à s'y attaquer et à faire progresser la justice environnementale. En parenthèse, projet de loi C-226, le projet de loi a reçu la sanction royale le 20 juin 2024. Amendement J. Révision J. Euh, la surveillance environnementale de la pollution et des contaminants menés par les Premières Nations s'avère essentielle pour comprendre le lien entre la dégradation de l'environnement, le racisme et la justice. Au point 2, demande au gouvernement du Canada et notamment au ministre de l'Environnement, du Changement climatique et au ministre de la Santé de travailler avec les Premières Nations y compris avec l'Assemblée des Premières Nations, les organisations régionales ou autres des Premières Nations, ainsi que les détenteurs de droits et signataires de traités, afin de s'assurer la participation pleine et entière des Premières Nations à l'élaboration et la mise en œuvre d'un cadre de mise en œuvre du droit à un environnement sain, notamment à l'intégration des systèmes de connaissance des Premières Nations avec le consentement libre, préalable et éclairé, en respectant la souveraineté des Premières Nations en matière de données, notamment en vertu des principes de propriété, de contrôle, d'accès et de possession des Premières Nations. Et ah, pour ces motifs, donc, on est dans les motifs. Donc, pour ces motifs, un, demande au gouvernement, les Premières Nations en Assemblée demandent au gouvernement du Canada de reconnaître les effets croisés, cumulatifs et fondés sur le genre du racisme environnemental sur les Premières Nations, ainsi que ses liens avec le colonialisme et le projet de cadre de mise en œuvre du droit à un environnement sain. Donc, pour le point 2, on a lu le 2 et le A comme c'était amendé. Et puis, on tombe au point B, la protection des droits et l'autodétermination des Premières Nations, la mise en œuvre de la Loi sur la Déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones et le respect des engagements en matière de réconciliation. La détermination des ressources particulières destinées au renforcement des capacités et du leadership des Premières Nations dans l'ensemble du processus. 3. Demande au gouvernement du Canada de travailler en partenariat avec les Premières Nations, y compris l'APN, les organisations régionales ou autres des Premières Nations, ainsi que les détenteurs de droits et signataires de traités, en particulier celles qui ont connu le racisme environnemental à l'élaboration d'une stratégie en matière de justice environnementale dirigée par les Premières Nations pour s'attaquer aux effets croisés cumulatif et fondé sur le genre du racisme environnemental et les injustices auxquelles font face les Premières Nations. 4. Enjoigne à l'APN de travailler sous la direction du comité consultatif sur l'action en faveur du climat et l'environnement et avec les ministères fédéraux concernés à l'établissement d'un mécanisme bilatéral entre l'APN et le gouvernement du Canada qui servira à porter les préoccupations et les priorités des Premières Nations en matière de santé et de protection de l'environnement à l'attention du premier ministre du Canada, du ministre de l'Environnement et du changement climatique du Canada et du ministre de la Santé. 5. Enjoigne à l'APN de travailler avec les ministres fédéraux concernés afin d'élargir les, les efforts de recherche et de communication sur la santé environnementale et la protection de l'environnement des Premières Nations, y compris les possibilités appropriées d'améliorer la surveillance de la santé environnementale des Premières Nations et l'intégration des points de vue, des préoccupations et des systèmes de connaissances des Premières Nations dans l'évaluation des risques, la gestion et la prise de décisions en matière de protection de l'environnement.
Donc, pour le projet de résolution révisée numéro 52, assurer la pleine participation des Premières Nations dans le cadre du programme pour la nature du Canada. Nous avons une révision au point C. Les Premières Nations protègent et conservent, conservent et gèrent de, de manière durable leur environnement, leurs terres, leurs eaux et la biodiversité qui s'y trouve depuis des temps immémoriaux. Grâce à l'exercice de leurs droits et responsabilités inhérents à leur système de connaissances associés à leurs lois traditionnelles. D. Jusqu'à 80 de la biodiversité restante dans le monde se trouve sur les terres et territoires traditionnels des peuples autochtones, bien que ces derniers ne représentent que 6,2 de la population mondiale. E. Il est de plus en plus reconnu au niveau national et international que les Premières Nations et les peuples autochtones jouent un rôle de premier plan dans l'obtention de résultats positifs en matière de conservation. F. La résolution 64-2018 de l'Assemblée des Premières Nations, Air protégé et préservé autochtone, initiative en route vers l'objectif 1 du Canada, préservation 2020, et la résolution 41-2021, Air marine protégée et de conservation autochtone charge l'APN de travailler avec le ministre de l'Environnement et du changement climatique pour promouvoir l'établissement, la mise en œuvre et la reconnaissance des aires protégées et de conservation autochtone dans les milieux terrestres et marins. G. Il incombe aux Premières Nations de veiller à ce que leurs systèmes et pratiques de connaissances traditionnelles soient reconnus, respectés et pris en compte et intégrés de manière appropriée dans tous les processus de prise de décision connexes. Et puis, les deux derniers amendements seraient I. La stratégie et le plan d'action pour la biodiversité du Canada a été élaboré en même temps que la loi sur la responsabilité envers la nature visant à légiférer sur certaines parties de la stratégie et du plan d'action. Le projet de loi a été déposé à la Chambre des communes en, 2020, en juin 2024. Amendement J. La table des, pré des Premières Nations sur la nature a été conçue en tant que mécanisme bilatéral visant à garantir la participation des Premières Nations et la mise en œuvre de la SPABC ainsi que du programme pour la nature du Canada dans son ensemble. Donc, pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée demandent au gouvernement du Canada de veiller à ce que les Premières Nations, y compris les membres de la table des Premières Nations sur la nature, participent pleinement à l'élaboration et à la mise en œuvre de la stratégie et du plan d'action pour la biodiversité du Canada, ainsi que du programme pour la nature au sens large. 2. Demande au gouvernement du Canada de veiller à ce que la loi sur la responsabilité envers la nature proposée prévoit la pleine reconnaissance et la protection des droits inhérents et issus de traités, des systèmes de connaissances et des compétences des Premières Nations et sa ligne sur la Déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. 3. Enjoigne à l'Assemblée des Premières Nations de continuer à promouvoir le leadership des Premières Nations en matière de conservation, notamment en affirmant que la conservation des terres et de l'eau ne peut être scindée. 4 enjoigne à l'APN d'élaborer une stratégie de conservation des Premières Nations et d'organiser des rassemblements nationaux des Premières Nations sur la conservation. Donc, projet de résolution révisée numéro 54. Participation pleine et entière des Premières Nations à l'élaboration d'un traité international juridiquement contraignant sur les plastiques. Euh, il y a seulement une révision majeure, donc la révision J. Les microplastiques sont des fragments de plastique dont la taille est inférieure à 5 mm. Les microplastiques peuvent provenir de la décomposition et de n'importe quel débris plastique, mais aussi être produits sous forme de microbilles, plastiques, polyéthylène manufa manufacturés, qui sont souvent ajoutés aux produits sanitaires en tant qu'exfoliants. Par exemple, dans les nettoyants et les dentifrices, en raison de leur taille minuscule, les microplastiques traversent facilement dans les systèmes de filtration de l'eau et se retrouvent dans nos écosystèmes terrestres et aquatiques. Ils ont également été retrouvés dans le corps humain, notamment dans les organes fondamentaux, le sang, les tissus cérébraux, le, pla le placenta et les fluides fétaux, ce qui menace la santé des nouvelles mères, des femmes enceintes et de leurs enfants à naître. 
Pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée demandent au Comité intergouvernemental de négociation dans le cadre de l'élaboration d'un traité international juridiquement contraignant sur les plastiques de protéger à protéger les droits inhérents, les traités, le titre et la compétence des Premières Nations et de reconnaître les responsabilités inhérentes et éternelles des Premières Nations à l'égard de leur territoire traditionnel. B. Prévoir des mécanismes pour favoriser l'inclusion significative, durable et visible des peuples et des voix autochtones. C. Défendre efficacement les droits, intérêts et contributions de tous les peuples autochtones. D. Reconnaître la situation et les droits distincts des Premières Nations par rapport aux communautés locales, aux groupes vulnérables et aux minorités ethniques, conformément aux normes minimales réaffirmées dans la Déclaration des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones. E. Garantir l'éthique et l'inclusion éthique et équitable du savoir autochtone dans la réglementation des plastiques et des polluants connexes et F, s'inspirer des idées et des, et des expériences recueillies, recueillies auprès des dirigeants des peuples autochtones dans les forums internationaux. 2. Enjoigne à l'Assemblée des Premières Nations de demander, en partenariat avec les détenteurs de droits et du titre, la prise en compte appropriée des droits, des systèmes de connaissances et de la participation des Premières Nations dans la négociation d'un traité international juridiquement contraignant sur les plastiques. 3 enjoigne à l'APN de s'associer aux détenteurs de droits et du titre des Premières Nations pour demander aux gouvernements nationaux et internationaux un financement suffisant et durable pour permettre aux Premières Nations de participer à, activement à la négociation et à la mise en œuvre d'un traité international juridiquement contraignant sur les plastiques. 4. Enjoigne à l'APN de demander la participation des Premières Nations, tant au niveau national qu'international, à toutes les mesures prises, notamment par les gouvernements fédéraux, provinciaux et territoriaux, pour conscrire à la, à la crise du plastique. 5. Demande au gouvernement du Canada de veiller à ce que les Premières Nations participent à tous les volets de la réglementation des plastiques, tant au Canada qu'à l'échelon international, d'une manière qui promeut et respecte les droits inhérents, issus des traités et protégés par la Constitution des Premières Nations et qu'elles reçoivent un financement adéquat à cette participation conformément à la Déclaration des Nations unies. And I think I will continue for the three last resolutions in English now. And I will take a sip of water as well. So, for draft resolution 55, removing impacts and reasserting First Nations jurisdiction and authority in carbon pollution prices, uh, the, therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in Assembly re reiterate the call for the First Nations in Assembly resolution 09. 2018 develop First Nations specific solutions for the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing, Pricing Act that the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act must respect a First Nations inherent right, treaties, title, and jurisdic jurisdiction, and recognize First Nations inherent responsibilities to our traditional territories. B, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People including reference to the standard of free, prior, and informed consent, and C, First Nations' right to self-determination, including the creation of a First, Nation, First Nations' carbon pricing regimes. To call on Canada to demonstrate transparency by disclosing the allocation formulas underlying the allocation of proceeds to First Nations governments to ensure that First Nations are not being disproportionately impacted and are receiving the entire, entirety of the fuel charge they are paying. Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations to urge Canada to restructure the carbon pollution pricing system to ensure that First Nations can access rebates through means other than Canada Revenue Agency. Four, 
call on Canada to tangibly respond to the outlined requests from First Nations to ensure or ensure that First Nations are fully exempt from paying the carbon charge on and off reserve. Five, call on the Ministers of Environment and Climate Change Canada, Finance and other departments to provide adequate finance, financial support for First Nations to minimize the impacts of carbon pricing, explore the implications of carbon pricing on their territories, as well as opportunities for their participation in resource revenue sharing in the clean energy economy. And there's two last resolutions there it be resolved to read. Draft resolution number 64 protection of the batter's caribou herd. Therefore, be it resolved resolve that the First Nations in Assembly, one, support the Yellow Knives, Dene First Nations, in its effort to create its own batter's caribou conservation plan. Two, support the YKDFN to hold a meeting of the chiefs of the surrounding communities that use the winter road for caribou harvest to discuss A, the potential for a complete caribou hunting ban along the winter road, and B, training programs for, for young hunters who wish to hunt along the winter road. Three, call upon Canada to provide funding for the Denny chiefs to meet and discuss a potential hunting ban of caribou along the winter road. Four, call upon Canada to assist the YKDFN and Dene Nation to create training programs to train new and young hunters in proper caribou hunting techniques. Five, direct the AFN to assist the Dene Nation in seeking funding from the Government of Canada to create and implement the YKDFN Bathurst Caribou Conservation Plan. Six, direct the AFN to further assist the Dene Nation in seeking funding to host a caribou summit in collaboration with the indigenous peoples of the Northwest Territories and the Inuit from Nunavut who harvest from Bathurst Earth, from the Bathurst Earth. And our last resolution, number 67, 2024, support for Dene First Nations to address contamination from the Exxon Imperial Oil Limited curl, mi curl mine site. Therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in assembly, one, support the Dene First Nation of the Northwest Territories in their pursuit in seeking accountability from the government of Alberta and the oil and gas industry on the management, noti notification, and monitoring of tailor tailings, ponds, spills, and leaks. Two, support the Dene First Nations of the Northwest Territories in urging Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada to expand the Northern Contaminants Program mandate to consider contaminants from domestic Can Canadian resources, Canadian sources, such as tar sands, abandoned mines, pulp and paper miles, and hydroelectric projects, which all contribute to cross-boundaries pollu boundary pollution. Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations to, to call upon all levels of government to meaningfully engage with First Nation governments as full partners on regulatory development and reform efforts for tailings management. Then I will take a sip of water before the four and five. Four, direct the AFN to call upon the ministers of CIRNAC and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to dedicate multi-year funding and resources from the Northern Contaminants Program and other applicable programs for the First Nations of the Northwest Territories to A, develop indigenous-led monitoring efforts that include an independent study by structural, structural engineers 
to evaluate the integrity of respective tar sand tailing, tailing spawns and B, develop a database for sharing indigenous-led observations and studies on climate change and cumulative impacts throughout the Mackenzie River Basin, and C, participate in all related transboundaries, transboundary water-related issues, including the Mackenzie River Basin Transboundary Waters Master Agreement, and D, establish partnerships with independent laboratories for reliable and independent assessment of samples collected for contaminants te testing and E, O subsequent water summit in the Northwest Territories. Five, direct the AFN to call upon the Alberta Energy Regulator to develop protocols with the Dene Dene Nation of Northwest Territories related to the Mine Financial Security Program that will ensure that industry pays for the reclamation and remediation of tar sand tailing pounds. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> I now ask the mover to, uh, <laughs> to please uh, come and present the resolution. Um, you, have, you have four minutes. Martin Lewis, uh, Chief of the Okanagan Band, and I'm moving the motion. And uh, with the om omnibus packages, uh, what, we're or what we're looking at is under the draft, re uh, draft that Resolution 50 is advocating for an ambitious, fully funded and implemented First Nations Climate Leadership Agenda, or the first uh, FNCLA. And uh, the uh, draft resolution 51 is to ensure full and effective uh, participation in uh, the development of a right of a healthy environmental implementation framework and an environmental justice strategy. And I think these are so important when we're talking about the lack of consultation and accommodation, but even more so when we go and we look that there's been absolutely nothing in terms of justification, and yet we have species that are beyond uh, being extirpated and are actually extinct, which means that's an extinguishment of a right. And there's absolutely no justification to date, and we're all affected by this. And when we're looking, uh, DR uh, 54 is participation of First Nations in the development of an international legally binding plastics treaty. I think it's really important that we remind government that all international agreements, covenants, treaties, and such are subject to domestic law, which includes Section 35, but also need to be reminded this also includes the economic component of our rights. Uh, and, uh, the other is uh, uh, removing impacts, uh, removing impacts, and reasserting First Nations jurisdiction and authority over carbon pricing. When you come into BC and other places, to the extent the logging has taken place or through fires through all of Canada, sometimes the only benefit is going to be through carbon uh, credits and others. And government must realize that the first in line for any such credits is the First Nations, and it should be us because uh, there's uh, the removal of all our resources and opportunities for that. And what we're looking at uh, final, is uh, protection of the Bathurst her uh, herd. I think that's so important for all of us. You know, when you look at uh, Gas Bay uh, caribou on the south side of the St. Lawrence River, the uh, decline in Labrador, Quebec, uh, all northern uh, prairie provinces, northwest territories, and then where I come from, uh, we have six subpopulations that are now extirpated, which means the extinguishment of a right, and we have yet to have the, uh, the provincial government justify the use of Section 92 to extinguish those rights. And the problem of that is, is constitutionally under certain uh, laws like, uh, or uh, decisions like, uh, that have determined that uh, while provinces may infringe, they lack the constitutional authority to extinguish, and yet they are the cause of that extinction. 
And finally, it's uh, addressing uh, Dene First Nations uh, contamination from Exxon Imperial. I think uh, you look at some of the damages going right across Canada. You look what happened in places like Grassy Narrows with uh, methyl mercury. You look at uh, what happens in uh, Am uh, Amjawan that has about, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, where petrochemicals surround their entire reserve. But that's not the only place. This is happening. These types of things are happening all over Canada. Canada, and yet there is no justification of infringement. And uh, when I first got into uh, politics, I was told by our elders that uh, look after the animals and they in turn will look after you. But if you look at every last court decision since the 1980s, it's those animals and it's the environment and everything that's given us back our rights. So I think with that, we could actually really support these, these animals that done that and gave us back our rights by ensuring that there's no longer, uh, that we can reverse, you know, uh, environmental degradation and we do it with those rights what we have back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Louis. We will now open the floor for amendments. If you have amendments uh, or comments, you can uh, go on a microphone. Microphone number one. Uh, can you please uh, specify if it's a comment or an amendment? Uh, Bushu, it is a comment. Um, my name is Janelle Namabin, also known as Red Cloud Woman from Amjanong First Nation. I'm the acting chair uh, for our council in Amjanong. Um, in respect to uh, resolution number 54 for the plastics treaty negotiations, um, I just want to say that um, I had attended as a, an observer along with Eco Justice um, in solidarity with the Society of Native Nations. And what I recognized at that table is that there's no indigenous representation, very limited. There's roughly 150 industry representatives there. Um, and this was here in Ottawa on unceded territory, the Anishinaabe lands, and we weren't able to actively participate. So I'm hopeful that the support from the other nations for this resolution will lead to a further assertion of our rights to take it to an international level because Canada's um, speaking on our behalf at these tables, and that's not okay. So um, I would really appreciate the support in that manner. Jimmy Gwench. Thank you for your comment. Uh, microphone number two. Can you, you please specify if it's a comment or an amendment? It's Hugh Breaker, uh, proxy for Chief Kenneth Watts, Tsha'at First Nation. Um, yes, I would like amendment, but I don't know how to word it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, between 2012 and 2016, the Minister of uh, in Indian Affairs, or whatever she was called at that time, came to our reserve and I asked her what she was doing about climate change in First Nations. And she said at the time, we haven't turned our mind to that yet. And that was the last I heard. I then had the Minister of Climate Change come to Vancouver last summer and I asked him, why haven't you started talking to First Nations about climate change? and talking to the chiefs about climate change. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, we have to start doing that more. And that was the last I heard of that as well. So I would like to see, I think it's probably m motion number 50. I would like to see a section that requires the ministers to uh, ISC and, uh, or whatever, whichever one, and Climate Change Canada to meet with the First Nations at least a couple of times a year. At the very least, I think it should be more, but try get that out of the ministers and you can't. So I'm going to say at least twice a year um, to develop or to talk about the problems the First Nations are facing. Otherwise, we're going to leave it to the last minute. Uh, the oceans are rising already on the west coast of, Brit of British Columbia and uh, it's just going to get worse and worse and if we leave it to the last minute, I don't know what's going to happen then. So I think somebody's going to help me with the drafting here with the uh, uh, committee you have for that. Thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. We will help you with the wording and we will come back to that uh, later. Um, we will close the speakers list now. Uh, so the five um, that are at the mic are the five last that will be able to speak on that uh, omnibus. I will give uh, mic number one. Uh, Marcy, uh, 
Just to speak to the, uh, 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 first of all, my name is uh, Johnny Cadella. I'm a uh, proxy vote for Sosoke uh, and Sosoke First Nation. Um, yeah, on that, uh, on that motion, uh, I think the most important part is, uh, is that there's, there's an ice road that was built by the diamond mines. And uh, instead of being like a, a private road, uh, the government of Northwest Territories uh, opened it to be a public road. Because the use of that public road, uh, a lot of people from, not only from around the surrounding com communities, but also in the provinces, uh, they go hunting on that, on that road and uh, taking out a lot of animals. And in 1994, we had about uh, well, over 400,000 caribou. Now we're down to six. So, so we're seeking support uh, so that, that that ice road that's being used, that could be banned. So hopefully uh, we can get that support. I hope. That's it. <coughs> Thank you. I will now go to microphone number two. Um, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, thanks to everybody who's here today. And I want to make note of the comments that were made this morning, uh, that it's July 11th. So it's the anniversary of uh, the 1990 OCA crisis. I don't mean, think that's a crisis in so many ways. I listened this morning to a, what amounted to a lot of empty rhetoric from from the conservative leader, Pierre Polivar, uh, and he's talking about ways that we could further exploit our own environment. I am uh, Chief Ross Montour. I'm the proxy for Grand Chief uh, Cody Daibo here, and that's uh, as a proxy I'm speaking. But uh, I, I just want to say that I'm moved by the words that were spoken and the, uh, and the, uh, the resolutions that were being brought forward in terms of the protection of environment. A little bit about myself. I, I first was elected to uh, the Mohawk Council of Gautamawage in uh, 2018 and took on the role of Indigenous Rights and Research Portfolio Chief. And in that, it is heavily, heavily involved with duty to consult. And the duty to consult is now uh, established in the courts. However, both the, uh, well, I'm going to say from my perspective, in Quebec and in Canada, it is often enough and too often it's ignored and it's not taken seriously. When I first started on my council, uh, the duty to consult I found was just a checkbox affair. It was just like, well, chief, how many of your people fish for uh, walleyes or, or this species or that species in this given area? 10 miles this way, 10 miles that way. And I said, no, that's, that's the wrong way to look at this. And I brought into the discussion Honda which is in our language, as they called it, literally the words that come before all, all, all others. And it establishes the relationship of us as human beings, Nguay Sohan, all the way to Nguay Dizu, the creator, and all of the elements of creation in between. And that those, nobody's talking about, say, the rights of the birds, the rights of the fish, the rights of the water. They exist. But that's all about our responsibility as indigenous people, as native people. Uh, I know we were struggling with language about indigenous, but we're talking about First Nations people over Turtle Island, where the Creator put us. And our role is, and our responsibility, and I would say my, my biggest right is my responsibility to defend and protect the land. And you know why? Because we need to look forward to the future, the face is yet to come. And when I speak to that, to proponents, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, uh, duty to consult, whatever, and I say, look, you listen to what I'm talking about in terms of the Hundagari Wadekwa, and then you take into account a traditional way of looking at how we make decisions. And in that way of making decisions, you have to take into account first the peace, and peace is not just about war, right? It's about a peace among all of our relations. And those relations are the land. They are the creatures that sustain us, that support us. We need to take those things into account. Then we need to consider the environment, okay? And that is, we are part of that environment. And that is our role as, as First Nations, is to look after the environment. You know, we speak as, as Mohawk people, we talk about the, uh, the uh, Gaswenta or the Turo, 
okay? And that relationship of like the ship in the canoe, but there's responsibility tied to that, okay? And those people need to take into account and respect our laws, let alone the laws of Canada. So when we talk about that, the last thing we have to consider before you make these decisions is the faces yet to come. If you can't meet all of those, then we're in the area of EPIC. We're in the area of uh, free prior informed consent. Now in 2018, 2019, I addressed the, standing the Senate Standing Committee on the Amendments to the Impact Assessment Law. And in there, when we, the Indigenous presenters went to speak, all of the Conservative Senators marched out. And I want to remember that when I'm listening to Pierre Polivar, because the questions that we got came from the Liberals, and they weren't even, they weren't even uh, here this, today. And they Thank said, you. are you people looking for a veto on projects? And we said, no, but well, you've got to ask yourself, when is enough enough? And when is there any opportunity for a veto on, on projects? Thank you for your comment. Thank you so Nyawa. much. Nyawa. Nyawa Ngoa. Uh, before uh, going with our three next speakers, uh, we will read the amendment that was written on draft resolution 50. We added a sixth, uh, therefore be it resolved, uh, call on the ministers of Ind Indigenous Services Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada to meet with all impacted First Nations across Canada at least twice a year to discuss First Nations climate change issues and needs. Are the movers and seconder, uh, um, do mover and seconder agree with that? Yes, mover, seconder, yes, perfect. Uh, microphone number one. Uh, Ani Bojo, uh, Chief Tanner Simpson, Alderville First Nation. Um, I'm here today to uh, uh, support resolution number 54. Um, I would also like to have uh, one of our Alderville members, Suzanne Smoke, speak to this issue as a subject matter specialist. Suzanne is a member of Alderville First Nation. She is a representative of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus and the Society of Native Nations who are participants in the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committees 1 through 5. Suzanne will be attending, the inter, will be attending and intervening in INC 5 uh, in Busan, South uh, Korea, as well as uh, INC 6 in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I would now like to give the rest of my time to Suzanne. Thank you. Um, we will go to the second. You're together? Oh, okay. Miigwech, Chief Simpson. Um, I'm here representing the Society of Native Nations, Alderville First Nation, and I'm with the Indigenous Peoples Caucus at the INC Plastics Negotiations. We as Indigenous people, as my relatives was just saying, we coexist, we are part of the environment, we are not separate from the human nation, we are part of all of creation, and it is our role and responsibility to protect all of that as well as our environment around us. We are part of that water and that land, we are born into it and we will go back to it. So it's important that we understand that we can't be separate from because Canada is now using that and justifying the abuses on our land and our bodies and that colonial violence. With the INC, negotiations, there is very little or no representation from Indigenous peoples. We called on Canada when we came here to Ottawa and we were told that they did not have to negotiate with us, that they only had to consult with Kitigan Zibi because that is whose traditional territory Ottawa sits in. They're gl glaringly wrong and we spoke to that. We've intervened on several levels. I sat and listened to ministers yesterday talk about environmental equity, justice, equalization, and fairness, yet we are not at the table while Canada is signing an international legally binding treaty with 175 other plus countries. We had industry polluters and oil people sitting at those tables and we can't have greedy people signing treaty for us and over us and over our voices. Canada has had their boots on our throats from Elsa Pogtog to Wet'suwet'en to land back to our Fort Chip relatives in the Ring of Fire. We are all there, we are all present, and we are holding Canada accountable, and we're here to raise awareness to all of our chiefs and all of our leadership that they need to be here at these negotiations, that they need to be at the table, and Canada has no right to speak over us and for us. Canada talks about resource extraction and how they can dig and take all of these minerals from the earth, but they can't dig for our fallen relatives and landfills. 
So we need to hold Canada accountable and we call on our leadership to bring awareness to this, to come to the table, and we demand Canada to include Indigenous peoples in these negotiations. Right now they are watering down, they are, they are already moving into INC5. They're already talking about the text. They're talking about Canadian. They're talking about indigenous people and vulnerable communities. They are watering down our traditional ecological knowledge. They're calling it nation-based solutions, nature-based solutions. We know that is our traditional ecological knowledge. The language in this treaty has to protect our traditional ecological knowledge, our elders, and the future of our communities. So we ask and call on all chiefs to be aware of this plastics treaty and that we need to be at the forefront. And I'm lucky enough not to have had to listen to the Conservative minister because because everything they're talking about, they're not doing that. What they're doing with their left hand, watch what they're doing with their right. And that's what I have to say. Now, miigwech. Thank you, miigwech. We will now hear our last speaker on this, uh, ish on this matter. Microphone number two. White Hantla Jawan, Squesh Lis Bahan, Cook Bivin Seletku. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Lee Spahan, Chief Co-Water Band. I'm also a proxy holder for the Swaywell Tooth Nation. I'd like to comment on Resolution 67 because of the impacts that is, it has had on, on our people and our territory, but also the mines around Canada that has impacted all the territories of all of our peoples that sit here in this room today. And the impacts that have happened in the past and the impacts that are going to happen in the future because you see what happened with Mount Pauly and, and the impacts it has had when it happened and how long it has still impacting our peoples. And I think as First Nations people, we have to be there to be the voice for our cultural values that we hold very close to each other and to stand up for each other. And we got to do that by holding the government accountable for what's happening to the resources within our lands, and I needed to comment on that. Gukstam, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. We are now ready for the vote um, on this omnibus on environment with the seven resolution we just discussed. Any opposed? I don't see any opposition. Uh, there. Okay. And any uh, abstentions? I don't see any. Therefore, this omnibus on environment is carried. By consensus. By consensus. <laughs> Congratulations. I will now turn the floor to my colleagues. My colleague Cedric. <laughs> Chief King, I see you're at the mic. Is this a point of order or? Microphone one, please. Good afternoon, Chief Wilfred King, Kiasagi and Shnepek, Kalbe First Nation. I just want to remind the chairs that uh, they should ask for a question to be called before a, goat, a vote is uh, asked. And it's not the chairs that ask for that. The chairs must ask the assembly for a question to be called. So just for a point of order, miigwech. Thank you for that comment, Chief King. As to... So we will be continuing on with our agenda. Uh, and I would ask for our drummers uh, from the Eagle River Singers, if they can please come by. I see you guys. Uh, just as a point of information also, National Chief mentioned that the draft agreement uh, would be made available to chiefs for review. And this draft agreement will be sent out by email to all chiefs, as well as being made available on the AFN website by the end of the day. So you should have access to this, and I believe it's already been distributed in certain regional caucuses. We were asked to have a moment for fishermen who have gone missing and have a blanket dance. So just under two weeks ago, three men from Missipewastik Cree Nation 
that is near Grand Rapids, Manitoba, went missing after setting off on boats on Lake Winnipeg to go moose hunting. And tragically, one of these individuals was found dead. The search continues for the other two men. So to help the families in this difficult time, we are asking that we open our hearts and those who can to, de ge to donate generously to the families. In the center of the room, we have two of our colleagues who will have the blanket as our drummers play, and they will be there taking donations, which the AFN will ensure will all go to the families. So I would look towards the Eagle River Singers. Are we ready to start? So you may go to the center of the room if you have donations. Thank you, Eagle River Singers. And thank you for everyone for your generosity. Uh, like I said, the AFN will ensure that all the go donations go directly to the families who are affected. 
I'd like to thank you for the time. I think this is the kind of event that shows uh, the solidarity that we have as Indigenous peoples. Before we move on to more resolutions, uh, one of our knowledge keepers asked if he could come and sing a song to honor the leadership, honor the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and the court convicted on four accounts of first degree murder, as was mentioned by our speaker yesterday, Andraf Rezus in 65, the person has found guilty on all charges. So I'd like to invite knowledge keeper, Fred Kelly, to come up to the stage. After I just uh, told you what I am and what I represent, I'm in Medeo and spirituality of the Anishinaabe peoples of Turtle Island. And yesterday, we had a moment of silence in honor of Alex Jenge, who passed on. And I uh, asked for this uh, moment to share with you, because each and every one of us in our communities, we've lost elders, knowledge keepers. We've lost people that despite being exempt from conscription, went and fought foreign wars. And there are represented many of them with our honorable veterans here with us today. But I'm not singing them a song in the way of as though they had passed, but the fact that they had the courage to sign up and prevent any incursion on Turtle Island and our peoples. Many of you have also lost loved ones. Today, I just read a little while ago, and I saw a sign as a lady spoke earlier this morning, a sign that said, find those lost women in the landfills. And I just read today that Skiviki, who had been charged for murdering those four women, has been now found guilty. It's not for me to speak on behalf of those families because they are in grief. My purpose is not to speak on behalf of anybody. The song I'm about to do is a song of consecration. And that while that may sound a little contradictory, given the circumstances which our people have left this world, I had a vision, I had a, I had a visit from the other side some time ago, and I was given a song that comes from the other side, from those people who have left. And that's what the song I'm uh, going to uh, render for you as best as I can. So it's a song of celebration, even at the time of solemn grieving. 
No human being since the beginning of time, especially on Turtle Island, has been able to withstand the tragedy of losing a loved one. So each and every one of us has grief, active grief, unresolved grief. And yet, from the other side, they want us to try and get through it. My son who took his life gave me a note when he left and he said, I want you to get through it, meaning we will never get over it, but somehow we need the strength and the courage to get through it. And on the other side, when I do traditional funerals, I have to remember that's a transition. And that transition is to eternal happiness, where we came from before we entered here on this earth. Now we go back to the Creator. And I want you to know that part of that message that I received was, we are happy. We are free. We are at peace. And we are well. It's hard to celebrate that because we still have the emotions and the physicality of this temporal world. But the song is intended to give you some hope and to give you some faith, courage, strength in these times. And it was done yesterday when we had that moment of silence. That's when it came to me again that I should have to share this with you because it's not just for me, it's for all of us. So those of you that are still going through unresolved grief, may you find some consolation and some condolence in this particular song, what it says. And I will sing it for you. I will translate what it says, first of all, before I actually sing it. It says, do not be sad that I flew away. I am watching you. I love you. The second part goes, do not be sad that I flew away. I am watching you. I love you. And I'm taking care of you. So from the other side, they do take care of us. From time to time, you may feel a touch on your hair, sometimes in your cheeks. Somewhere you get a little poke, a gentle poke. Those are the spirits of our ancestors and our loved ones trying to make contact with us. But we are not in the perfect world of the spirit, in the, in the perfection of the spirit world yet. So it's hard for us to understand what it's like over there. And so they are trying to give us some condolence and give us the strength. And I wanted to acknowledge as well I've had the privilege when I came into this forum back in the 60s. I've worked with many of our leaders, the Assembly of First Nations, many executive members. Some of them are gone. And they are here with us. They are here in spirit, giving us the inspirations and so they've laid down some of the institutions in some of the forums that are now so beautifully carried forward by the current executive that we have over here. So this, uh, what they've done for us is laid the groundwork for us that we can celebrate life in a good way for the sake of our children. And also want to mention to you, this song is also dedicated to those of you who are still feeling the pain and anguish of the murdered, missing women, girls. And I also want to tell you that I spoke to my nephew this morning, Bob Kinu, who was my nephew, the first premier in current times to be, and he has vowed to help the uh, find those remains that are still missing. 
So they've laid down. Those fears have laid down for us the path that we are now currently going. So that's why this song is a song of celebration of life. It's a consecration song to their memory that we do not forget them and what they've done and what they've laid for us that we must follow through in the best way that we possibly can for the sake of future generations and for your own condolence, consolation, and well-being. Give 
With that, I want to remind you that that is a message translated to, do not be sad that I flew away. I'm watching you. I love you. That's every one of you. Do not be sad that I flew away. I'm watching you. I'm taking care of you. So they are guiding us. And that is to your mothers, to your fathers, to your brothers, your sisters, our people that we love so much who gave their lives that we might have a better future as we try to have a, create a better future for our own children. And so I want to thank Alex Janje for doing that, my brother. We share a family. I knew him very well. He's an expert, an artist, a fantastic artist. If you go to the museum, you'll see his murals that he did with his son, Dean, who had to leave yesterday before he uh, was going to make a presentation. That's how dedicated our people are. And yet he had to go catch a flight. But he didn't tell me. He said, just keep me in your prayers because he said, there's something heavy. But he said, I'll tell you what it is. So he told me then, yesterday, that uh, after he had left, he said, yes, my dad passed away 3 o'clock this morning. And uh, Candace also had to leave yesterday for that same reason. So this is a song that I share with you, each and every one of you, those of you who are still breathing, that we remember our uh, loved ones, and that they, in fact, now they are free, they are happy, they are at peace, and they are well in the perfection of the spirit world. I thank you very much for your time. Miigwech. On behalf of the Assembly First Nation, I want to thank Elder Fred for this beautiful tribute, well said, and absolutely beautiful song. I'd also like to thank our co-chairs, Cedric Wiener and Veronique, for providing the space today in a busy agenda to allow Fred to speak to us in such a wonderful way. Thank you very much, co-chairs, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Chief. And thank you, Knowledge Keeper, for that good medicine. These days are intense, these days are long, and words like that do help us get through them. So I would now turn over to my co-chair, Wina, so we can continue on with the resolutions process. Chiefs and proxies, I would now like to turn your attention to the next draft resolution, number 68, entitled Protection of Drinking Water for Anishinaabe. So it's a revised draft resolution. This, uh, draft, this revised draft resolution has been moved by Chief Copenas 
Are you present? I don't see you. Oh, yeah. Hi. So the mover is at microphone number two. We will now, we will come back, the usual, we will come back to you. Uh, but for now, at this point, I would like to uh, make sure that the seconder is present in the room. So proxy, Kimberly, Sue, Det Weller. Thank you, Proxy. So both the mover and the seconder are present in the room. Therefore, we will now go right through the therefore be it resolved section of this uh, revised draft resolution number 68, and we will read it together. Therefore be it resolved that the First Nations in assembly, one, support the Ojibwe's of Onigaming in their call for a mor moratorium on all exploration and mining activities, including clear cutting for aggregate in their traditional territories until their state of emergency is, lift and, uh, is lifted and they can engage in good faith. Two, support the Ojibwe's of Onigaming in calling on all local First Nations to work with the Ojibwe's of Onigaming to prevent the advancement of any further destructive exploration and mining near Kagagi Lake, Crow Lake, and the interconnected sacred spring-fed lakes. Three, direct the AFN to advocate the Canada, to the Canada and the Ontario for the full protection and conservation of the sacred interconnected lakes in the tra traditional territories of the Ojibwe's of Onigaming in order to protect the families, children, and all future generations of the Ojibwe's of Onigaming. Four, direct the national chief to write to the prime minister and the, pri the premier of Ontario to explore protection and conservation measures to protect Kagagi Lake, Crow Lake, and the interconnected sacred spring-fed lakes for future generations of the Ojibwe's of Onigaming. Five, last one, call on all First Nations to fully consider the environmental and health impacts of economic development, including in the transportation and disposal of nuclear, nuclear waste on other First Nations in their decision-making processes and to engage with these impacted First Nations. This uh, revised draft resolution number 68, 68 has been moved, seconded, read, and entered into the record. And I'm, I'm going now to open the discussion period. And first thing first, I will look at the mover and invite him to speak to that matter and introduce this uh, draft resolution. Chief Kopenas, you have up to four minutes. Microphone number two, please. Miigwech. Buju, Miskwe Abnindijnikaz, Makwanin Dodam, Nishnabe and Dao. It's an honor to be here, and it was really honored to hear um, Elder Fred Kelly sing the song for us for our healing. We also have um, a very large delegation of, um, from the Ojibwe's of Onigaming. Can I get a round of applause for Onigaming here? They're all standing at the back here. And we have uh, many of our young people and families back home in Treaty 3 and Onigaming that are watching. So hello, hello to them, Buju. We're here today to ask for help from the chiefs across the country. We've been under a state of emergency since 2014. There were multiple suicides that year, which triggered the original state of emergency. You know, the reality is that we've faced so many suicides and young deaths that we should have been under a state of emergency likely even earlier than that. There have been many suicides. There have been many overdoses, including recently. And many, many deaths, all, all too young. I think many of us here have been experiencing, especially as 
The poison toxic drug crisis continues to get worse and worse across this country, especially in our nations. Sadly, we get calls on a daily basis from children threatening their own lives. As we try to save the lives of our young people, we find ourselves begging for help. We, sound ourself, we find ourselves begging to save the waters that we make home. We make home on a lake called Kakagi Lake or Crow Lake. And it's a series of interconnected sacred lakes that again, um, we have uh, sustained ourselves for thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. We're begging to save our traditional ways of life. We don't want to be assimilated Canadians. The people back home have made clear they want to be Anishinaabe, proud, strong Anishinaabe in our traditional ways of life, and we want to maintain that. And we're begging most of all to save our drinking water. As we continue to face and experience these funerals, I attended a young funeral of a young mother just last week. We find that Canada and industry are racing ahead at an incredible rate for mining, for aggregate, for clear cutting, and recently for the burial of nuclear waste. And we're asking for help. We're asking for a moratorium on all of this development, specifically in our traditional territories, until our state of emergency can be lifted, until we're actually in a point where we've got the capacity, where we've got the services, and we've got the infrastructure to truly make a safer place for our young people so that we're not facing this level of suicides and overdoses and calls of threats of life. I truly fear that we don't have the ability to sit down in good faith in any good way with industry and with the governments of Canada and Ontario. And again, we're asking for your help. You know, lastly, as I get closer to my time here, I just want to urge those First Nations to really think about what you're doing. Those that have accepted money for the burial of nuclear waste in our homelands, for those that have accepted money for the mining and destruction of our lakes surrounding us, I ask you to think about that and to reconsider and to get back to what we came here to do as chiefs and leaders, to fight for our waters, Nibi, and to fight for our future generations, our children. And I just want to thank all of the chiefs, but mostly I want to thank the support for our families back home that have traveled all this way. We've traveled all this way just to be heard by all of you. We appreciate all your support. To Mother Earth, to our lakes, we'll never stop fighting for you. Kachimigwich. Miigwech, Chief. Seconder, if you would like to wish to this matter, if you would like to, to if you wish to discuss this matter, you, you have the possibility to do so. Otherwise, I will look and um, invite other chiefs and to, or proxies to come to the microphone. So I see no one at the microphone at this time. So I assume you are ready to call the question, so to put the matter to a vote. And for that, I will now ask first question. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Great teamwork here. <laughs> um, so, any opposition in the room? If you wish to oppose, if you want to oppose, please raise up your red lanyard so I can see it. <laughs> I see no opposition in the room. Any abstention in the room? Any abstentions in the room? I'm looking at you to make sure that my eyes are still open. <laughs> and I don't see any, oppo uh, any abstentions in the room. So on that, I now declare this revised draft resolution number 16 entitled Protection of Drinking Water for Anishinaabe is carried by consensus. So congratulations.
Thank you very much. And now we will now continue with the next item on the agenda. And since, since I'm alone on the stage, I guess my co-chair wish to <laughs> they delegated me for the next one, or I don't know, but I'm always ready and happy. So for that, uh, we will now go to the omnibus package, num package number five, rights. Are you um, help me? The answer is no. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so an announcement. So uh, the fundraiser for the donation, we have the total amount here. It is $3,896. Just want to mention it's Canadian dollars. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you for it. Thank you, everyone. That's amazing. Uh, okay, so rights. We, so omnibus package number five. And the mover, uh, I'm sorry, going back, there are six draft resolutions contained in this uh, omnibus package. Draft resolution number 28, 30, 31, 33, 34, 49. And uh, these, uh, draft, these, uh, this uh, omnibus package, sorry, the mover for this package is Kelsilem. Kelsilem, uh, oh, I see you. <laughs> Hello, Kelsilem. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry, I'm, I just been advised or noticed that it's a, there's a mistake on my sheet. So it's not 28, it's 29. Seconder, so the seconder for this, uh, for this um, omnibus package on rights is uh, Chief Baron Louis. So Chief, uh, I see you. Both chiefs at, are at the microphone number two. On that, Kelsey Lam, uh, just a very, very, very kind uh, uh, message. But if you want, you can, you can sit down the time I read, <laughs> and I will come back to you. It's just for you to decide. Uh, microphone number two. Just a, quick, oh, just a quick question. There were some amendments that came in for, I think, uh, DR29. And I just wanted to confirm it. I think we submitted it to the resolutions committee. so. There were some amendments uh, on this one. Okay, so while we're we're yep. we're figuring this out, thank you. I, I am thank you so much. I am going to read them all. So the six uh, draft resolutions, we're going to read them all right now. So that's why I offered you to take a break <laughs> while I'm reading. So on that draft resolution number twenty nine. I, I am going to read in French. Maybe I can do both, like Véronique did earlier. So, projet de résolution numéro 29, intitulé « Faire progresser les droits des Premières Nations au moyen d'un financement durable, mise en œuvre de la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones ». Ah, okay, I just said, okay, I, I'm going to continue reading that. I was about to go through, right through the, to, therefore be it resolved. I think I'm going, that's what I'm going to do. So, Encore, maybe just go back. It's me that I, I changed the way, but uh, thank you for, <laughs> for adapting to the situation. So, I just, we're at draft resolution number 29, and I just mentioned the title, and now I'm going to read the therefore be it resolved sections, and I, go, I am going to do that for each draft resolutions contained in this omnibus package on rights. So, nous sommes maintenant au, euh, à la portion de la décision du projet de résolution numéro 29 et nous allons lire maintenant la portion, c'est ça, pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée. 1. Rappelle que le leadership total et significatif de Premières Nations dans la mise en œuvre de leurs droits 
y compris par l'intermédiaire de la loi sur la Déclaration des, des Nations unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, nécessite un financement suffisant, prévisible et durable en tant que condition absolue et sans réserve pour le succès de la mise en œuvre de la L LDNU. Deux, demande au gouvernement fédéral de fournir un financement de base aux Premières Nations et à leurs gouvernements et institutions représentatifs pour la mise en œuvre de la LDNU à la place d'un financement de projets basé sur des propositions et limité dans le temps qui ne fournira pas le financement adéquat nécessaire aux Premières Nations pour mettre en œuvre leurs droits inhérents et issus de traités, leurs titres, leurs compétences et leurs droits au titre de l'article 35. Numéro 3. En joignant à la PN et au comité des chefs sur la LDNU de demander à tous les ministres fédéraux, en particulier la, le ministre de la Justice et le ministère des Finances, d'élaborer conjointement avec les Premières Nations des modèles de financement suffisants, prévisibles et durables pour permettre aux Premières Nations et à leur gouvernement et institutions représentatives de participer de manière significative et efficace à la mise en œuvre de la LDNU. Numéro 4 enjoigne à la PN et au comité des chefs de la LDNU de demander à tous les ministères fédéraux concernés par les mesures du plan d'action de financer et de soutenir adéquatement l'engagement direct des Premières Nations et de leurs gouvernements et institutions représentatifs afin qu'ils participent de manière significative et efficace à la mise en œuvre de toutes les mesures du plan d'action. I will alternate between French and English. So. Draft Resolution No. 30, entitled Advancing First Nations Self-Determination by Reforming Indian Act Registration. Therefore, be it resolved, number one, direct the AFN to meaningfully engage with Canada on the, de the co-development of a suite of... I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> I'm gonna... So, direct the AFN to meaningfully engage with, the, with Canada on the co-development of a suite of registration and ban membership reforms and support the Canada, the Canada's direct engagement and consultation with First Nations rights holders on these reforms. Two, direct the AFN to develop a broad engagement strategy with Canada to engage and support First Nations to co-develop opt-in alternatives to Indian Act registration and citizenship. Three, direct the AFN to advocate for legislative, regulatory and policy reforms and co-develop these options with Canada so that elements of the Indian Act surrounding enfran enfranchisement de the registration and second generation cutoff will a create opt-in alternatives to the Indian Act's registration system with a framework developed and controlled by First Nations supporting their right to self-determination and recognition of indigenous identity and b ensure that any person registered by a First Nation is automatically eligible for recognition under the federal Indian registration system, thus affirming First Nations' autonomy in fully determine, determining their citizens without any separate system for receiving Indian registration. Four, direct the AFN to call on Canada to support these legislative changes to be implemented before October 2025. Five, direct the AFN to bring back co-developed legislative, regulatory, and policy changes for consideration and endorsement by the First Nations in Assembly. Next, projet de résolution numéro 31 intitulé « Modification de la loi sur les élections au sein des Premières Nations pour permettre le vote électronique ». Pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée, 1. demande au Canada de travailler avec les Premières Nations à l'ajout d'un règlement en vertu de l'article 41 de la loi sur les élections au sein des Premières Nations. 
qui permettent aux Premières Nations participantes d'utiliser, lorsqu'elles le souhaitent, le vote électronique à et à distance pour leurs élections. Deux, demande instamment au, au gouverneur général en conseil, conséquemment à une mobilisation auprès des Premières Nations, de prendre un règlement en vertu de l'article 41F, petit 4, de la loi sur les élections au sein des Premières Nations, sur le vote électronique et le vote à distance, afin de permettre aux Premières Nations de choisir ces modes de vote pour leurs élections en vertu de la loi. Draft Resolution No. 33, entitled « Call for Crown Support of First Nations Developed Consultation and Accommodation Guidelines ». Therefore, be it resolved, number one, call on Canada to provide, to provide adequate resources and funding to the AFN to work collaboratively with First Nations rights holders to develop materials to support First Nations direct engagement on Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada, CERNAC, process to update the federal guidelines for federal officials to fulfill the duty to consult March 2011 built on the foundation of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and free, prior, and informed consent. Two, call on Canada to respect and adhere to existing First Nations protocols that set out consultation and accommodation standards. standards. Three, direct the AFN to call on CERNAX to affirm its commitment to principles outlined in the UN Declaration by investing and providing equitable funding specifically designated to First Nations to develop their own consultation and accommodation guidelines. Four, direct the AFN to call on CERNAX to provide capacity support and adequate funding for interested First Nations rights holders to to lead discussions and amendments on CERNAX guidelines for federal officials to fulfill the duty to consult March 2011. Le projet de résolution numéro 34 intitulé Soutien à un financement suffisant, prévisible et durable pour les Premières Nations. Pour ces motifs, les Premières Nations en Assemblée, numéro 1. Demande au Canada de collaborer avec les Premières Nations à l'élaboration d'un nouveau cadre financier facultatif semblable au programme fédéral de, pré de, pré ré de, pardon, de péréquation et conforme aux principes de réconciliation qui respecterait des dro les droits inhérents issus des traités des Premières Nations et qui serait aligné sur la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones et deux enjoignent à l'APN de chercher des ressources pour entreprendre une mobilisation auprès des Premières Nations sur l'établissement d'une position globale des Premières Nations qui tienne compte des points de vue régionaux sur les paiements de transferts fédéraux et pour étayer sa position pour mettre en œuvre la résolution 95-2018, accord de financement fondé sur les droits inhérents ou issus de traités en vue d'une prochaine approbation par les Premières Nations en Assemblée. So there's a little glitch here, or a little. Uh, so it's not one, it's three in French. Enjoigne à l'APN de demander une augmentation immédiate du financement des Premières Nations pour aider les gouvernements des Premières Nations à fournir des services de programme équitable à leurs citoyens. We made it. We read all six draft resolutions contained in this uh, omnibus package uh, number five on rights. And this is the time that I will now invite mover Kelsey Lim uh, to come back to the microphone and uh, address the assembly to introduce this omnibus package on rights. And you have up to four minutes. Microphone number two, please. 
Martin Lewis, uh, uh, Chief of the Okanagan Band, uh, seconded the motion. And as it reads, it's pretty well straightforward. It's just basically on uh, how we can be more accountable or support for our bands. And uh, with the exception of uh, 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 draft resolution 49. And this one is really important to all First Nations because it talks about the Statutory Instruments Act. And the Statutory Instruments Act is a tool of government that they use to uh, measure risk, and that's whether to uh, implement or not implement the statutory instrument. And the statutory instrument can be anything from a cabinet directive, uh, a, uh, a claw, or uh, a regulation, or an act, or similar. And what it uh, what it calls for in the Statutory Instruments Act is there is a requirement of government to do a, a regulatory impact analysis to determine the, if there's a cost or a benefit that will be uh, that could be um, uh, had when it's uh, when uh, the uh, the clause is being implemented or uh, statutory instrument. And what's required is what's uh, under that, uh, under the, uh, statu or the what is it? statutory impact uh, assessment is an analysis which is uh, uh, that where you have to cut a so or conduct a social economic analysis. And the problem of that is there is no model there for measuring impacts to First Nations peoples. And to give you an example, there's a, you know, a nation out in our area that said that every man, woman, and child would consume about 1,000 pounds of salmon per, uh, per year. Now that doesn't sound like much when you break it down to 365, then break it down into three meals a day. But when you times that by 10,000 other members, you're talking about a significant amount of about uh, 120 million pounds of uh, salmon or fish. Now if you can't get that in the river, yeah, do the math, you start timesing that by about 12, uh, well, no, it's, uh, well, um, anyway, and what it works out to be, you know, when you times that by about 1250 a pound, you're talking about 120 million. And, uh, and what you're talking, uh, and that's just the value of that sustenance. But you need to be able to develop the formulas, but what they're doing is they're passing these regulations or what's called a RIAS, or Regulatory Impact Analysis Statement, and they don't actually qualify or quantify that Aboriginal right, and that is very important because that is a infringement, and they're actually using that to either implement or not implement a, 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 a piece of, uh, or a statutory instrument, excuse me, I'm getting pretty tired. But anyway, um, it's very important. I encourage everyone to, to look it up and to Google it and find out what that is all about because that Statutory Instruments Act is, it can be a benefit to us or it can uh, infringe upon our rights. Okay, thank you. Miigwech, Chief. Louis, seconder, will go to the mover. Microphone number two, please. It is getting long and I had to pull up my speaking notes so I can remember what to say. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone, uh, and very grateful to be able to support the omnibus uh, resolutions here, um, hopefully to help us expedite getting through many resolutions for decision today before we close. Um, I'll just speak specifically to resolution 30 um, that's included as a part of the omnibus. Um, there's a lot of background that's included in the preamble that sort of explains the rationale, but the main point that I want to explain to the chiefs and proxies here is, as of right now, and as many know, the federal government through the Indian Act and its various amendments control the destiny of so many of our First Nations. And I'm gonna give you an example. When I was born into my nation, my nation was growing at a population growth rate of around 4.7%. So every year we had you know, deaths and births, and when he added up the deaths minus the births, we were growing at about 4.7%. By 2013, that growth rate dropped to 1.6%. This last year, my nation has started to decline for the first year in probably 100 years. We are now declining in the number of people who are registered with my nation. Part of the reason for this is because the Indian Act and the Indian registration system is a breach of our indigenous rights. 
fundamental to nationhood is the ability for us to determine who is our people. But because of the Indian Act and the Indian registration system, we're still at the mercy of who the feds recognize for the purposes of equitable funding and meaningful uh, fiscal relations, where things like health and education, housing, and so many services are dictated by who is considered a registered Indian. So the resolution that I've written, um, and with the support of AFN staff who provided a lot of good feedback to align it with existing policy work that is already happening, is really to call on the federal government to create with us, with, with First Nations directly, legislation that would enable those nations that wish to exercise their right to self-determination to determine their own citizenship and create a system or a process where whoever we recognize as members of our community, whoever we recognize as citizens of our nations, the federal government just automatically recognizes for the purpose of Indian status and the benefits that are accrued to that. That this two-tiered system where the feds still have control over determining who is a, a status Indian needs to end, but, but do it in a way that allows for nations to opt into the system, not forced into it, opt into it, when those nations who would like to exercise those rights and to be able to affirm those rights uh, could pursue that. Ultimately, the resolution also speaks to uh, sort of calling on the government to, to work with us on this, calls on the AFN to work with us on this, and that any proposal that is drafted or developed has to come back to the chiefs and proxies for approval. Um, but the main concern and the urgency that I would, uh, I would state on this as I realize I'm getting down to my last 20 seconds, is we do have the looming federal election. And I am concerned that if we get a change in government, we are less likely to get support for these types of changes. There is commitment already from the federal government through the UNDRIP Action Plan, where they've already committed to exploring this type of opt-in uh, system, but they want direction from chiefs and proxies, and that, that's what we hope to accomplish with that resolution. Miigwech. And uh, thank you very much to the mover and the seconder. Very um, good presentation of this uh, omnibus package number five on rights. And at this moment, I take a picture of the microphones here in the assembly and I, and I close the speaker's list. We'll go to microphone number one and then we will, uh, we will uh, the, the, the speaker's list will be closed. Microphone number one, please. Thank you. Well, once again, my name is Sheldon Sunshine. I'm Chief of Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, Treaty of Territory in Alberta. Um, I'm going to share my, t my time with uh, uh, Headman uh, Pauline Hunter, uh, Satellite Cree Nation. I just want to make my point brief. Um, you know, I'm still a little fired up from yesterday. Um, you know, when I, when I hear all of these resolutions and we start getting into omnibus uh, resolutions, it starts becoming problematic for, for me and my nation. Uh, when we see that uh, co-legislation and policy changes and all, all that type of stuff, you know, I, I, I have issue with some of that um, process. When we take a look at that uh, Bill 61, the water legislation, when I, I presented in front of uh, the INAN committee, it was mentioned that uh, we had consultation through AFN and other bodies, and I questioned what were the other bodies, because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't my nation. So those are just some of the things I want to point out. When we get to these type of things and start talking co-legislation, um, I just don't feel that we have a voice. Alberta doesn't have a reputation at this table, and uh, we need to develop that process. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sunshine. My name is Pauline Hunter. I'm a direct descendant of Unchamnehus' Little Hunter. My grandfather, who was signatory to our Treaty Number no. 6, I'm also head woman for Sad Lake Cree Nation. And I stand in the spirit of treaty protection today. And I speak for the future of our children and our families. In doing so, I'm also here today to give formal notice to AFN that Sad Lake Cree Nation is officially withdrawing from AFN. And we want this to be on record and it must be noted that our withdrawing and silence in all current and future matters does not constitute or mean consent. 
In fact, it means the opposite. This means that AFN does not have our consent to speak on our behalf, nor does AFN have our consent to take any funding or negotiate for any funding on our behalf. And this needs to be clear. So now, let me tell you why. AFN's work to date, along with all the resolutions going forward in the past few days, just reconfirms what we thought. The AFN is mirroring the federal government's agenda, policies, and guidelines, and we want no part of this. AFN has been working without our consent, despite being told over and over that your processes, your direction, and your relationship with Canada has become too close. It's like you are now one and the same. Basically, you are setting yourselves up to be the next Indian agents. We see that. We also see that AFN is needed more so now by Canada than by us as rights holders. And AFN needs to know that there, there are existing treaty nations like ours within treaty number six that are fed up with AFN's actions. In fact, many of us are contemplating legal action against the AFN and Canada on behalf of our people. I have a BCR here, which is a legal document and it speaks to the MOUs on both the joint and fiscal priorities and the permanent bilateral mechanisms. We have not given AFN consent to proceed with any of these. And to all the leaderships who, who have existing relationships and rights under treaty, please see that AFN in Canada under co-development are not closing the gap. They are pushing us all into it. Let us all be reminded that AFN was built on the work of treaty warriors. Thank you very much. For in the, the last couple of years. The time is up, so uh, thank you very AFN much. Is not please close the rights. microphone number one, please. And we will now, I will, so first, uh, I please, uh, chiefs and proxies, um, for the, the rest of the day, we will not entertain any comments not related on topic of what we're discussing. We're discussing an omnibus package related to rights. And on that, I am going to go to the microphone number two for the final comments. Okay, um, Chief. First of all, yeah, Chief Ross Montour, proxy for Grand Chief Cody Daibo again for the Mohawk Council of Gothenwagen. And I, and I wish I could have heard the rest of that uh, chief's statements, but these are the rules here. Okay, having said that, okay, Gothenwagen is, this is, not a, this is not a mystery to this body that we have taken a position historically that it is only the Mohawks of Gatanawage who have the right to determine who the we is. It's not citizens, it's about who our families are, who our parents are, who our grandparents are, who our children are, who are the ones we recognize as being Ganyekahaga of Gatanawage. No government, and I will remind people that the Department of Indian Affairs and the Indian Act was set up to eradicate our people. So when you look at how it defined an Indian within the meaning of the Act, that was meant to, dis to take our women away, take our mothers and our sisters away, and to bring an outside influence into our families, and thereby eradicate traditional knowledge, our languages, our ways of life, and now to say, well, I'm going to say, uh, speak to this omnibus bill where it speaks about that. I say to you, it's not, it's not for the government of Canada or this body, I have to echo those statements, to uh, negotiate that on our behalf. I sit at the head of the Gatlinwagi Canada Relations Table, and we told previous Minister Mark Miller before we entered into that, well, we are not sitting at terminations tables. We're not talking about right, rights and recognitions tables. We're talking about self-determination. The Mohawks of Gatlinwagi have been involved in self-determination for well over 30 years. It's in us as, as Ganyakahaga people. And we are the ones who will determine that. It is up to us to speak directly and I'll say that, I mean, some people would say, well, you're a band council. I say I am a Ganyikahaga. 
and we are rights holders. And it's for us to speak directly to the government of Canada and say, this is how you need to get out of our lives. Stop making paper Indians through this registration process and only recognize who we are when we tell you who they are, because that impacts all manner of things, including the land. And I don't want to, I, I want to point out, if I just have a little bit of time, to say that this is all about the land. It is all about getting rid of us. I remember Duncan Campbell Scott's words from 1925. He had a better mousetrap when it came to our people. It was either you're going to bleed us out or through the residential school system, you're going to wipe our minds clean. You're going to brainwash us so that when we go home and speak to our, our, uh, our Duras, and uh, Anishinaabe, your, your Kukums and uh, Mishamases, okay, that you won't even recognize them. So you'll be ashamed of who you are. So anything having to do with the Indian Act and saying the Department of Indian Affairs or whatever they're called now, CERNAC, ISC, why are they in that business? It's only us. They only continue to make matters worse. Tony Wanege, Yawa. Miigwech, Chief. So on that, we will now call what? <laughs> Question. Um, <laughs> just to keep you uh, alive and kicking <laughs> this afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, any opposition in the room to this uh, Dra uh, omnibus package number five on rights, which contains draft resolution number 29, 30, 31, 33, 34, 49. Any opposition? I don't, s oh, yes, I see one hand. <laughs> A raised one, uh, one red lanyard is raised up in the air. Uh, I don't. One there, so we're the count is three in the middle here. I don't see no opposition. Okay, so three oppositions in the room. Any abstention in the room? One abstention in the back. In the middle. I don't see no abstention here. One, one abstention? We're not under discussion period. We are the voting. I'll come back. I will come back, Chief. Any abstention here? No. Okay. So, omnibus package number five on rights is carried by the majority. Thank you very much. I need to follow a process. So chiefs and proxies, as you all know, we need to follow the process in the rules of procedure that you adopted the first day. That's what I just did. But on that, I'm going to recognize chief at microphone number two, please. Yes, no, I think it was very important. It was very difficult for me to say uh, oppose or, not, or abstain, because if I abstain, uh, in, in some way it reflects saying maybe go ahead with it. And I still say, from, from the Mohawks of Kahnawake, we are opposed to it, okay? Uh, if I, it's not my place to dictate how any other First Nation in this country decides to say, move forward with something. But I have to raise those concerns. So it's a qualified, it's a qualified no, it's a qualified abstention. I can't agree to it. I understand, Chief. Thank you for your comment. Uh, last uh, chief at the microphone before moving on to the next omnibus, uh, just to make sure that we can uh, get some more business done today. Microphone number two, please. Thank you. I just want to be clear on my position. Uh, like I said, with the, that omnibus, there's so many problematic uh, issues combined in there, and it's not specifically against one. It is a process. I don't agree with the co-legislation. I don't agree with that process. It's not fair to... All the chiefs that aren't here, like I applaud the chiefs that are here, 
uh, sitting through it. And uh, I know with Chief's life is very busy, but you know, it's not fair to, to our nations, to our people, to have to go through this process. You know, I think when you talk about uh, reform, I think that really seriously needs to take a, take a hard look at that. You know, AFN, um, we have issues with representation in Alberta, uh, the information we get just a few weeks before the, for the meeting, and for our technicians to get through it and, and really come up with some strategy on how we face these things, yet we get them thrown in our face in omnibus packages. And that's very problematic for my nation and, and my people. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, well noted. Thank you very much. On that, I now invite Veronique, youth co-chair for the next omnibus package on health and accessibility. Thank you very much, chiefs and proxies. Okay, so we're about 35 minutes from the end of the uh, official end of the assembly as planned on the agenda, and we have many more omnibus to come. Um, so we're on omnibus number, um, I don't know the number, but on health and accessibility. Um, I will read. I will read all the titles. There are four res resolutions on this package. So resolution, draft resolution number 24-2024, establishment and funding for a First Nations Healing Fund. Draft resolution 25-2024, First Nations with Disabilities Across the Lifespan Services on Reserve. Draft resolution 26-2024, work to address misdiagnosis in First Nations, and draft resolution 27-2024, treaty, medicine, chess clause, political, and legal strategy. Our mover for this omnibus is Chief James Obart from Spossum First Nation, and our seconder is Ojima Rachel Manitowabi uh, from Wimekong First Nation. We have both mover and seconder in the room. I will read the, there it be resolve, therefore, be it resolved, I will get it before this, the end of this assembly. Um, so I will read them for the four resolutions, then we will hear the mover. Therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in assembly Di one, direct the Assembly of First Nations to call on Canada to fully fund and support the creation of a First Nations healing fund that will be governed and administered by First Nations aimed at improving the physical and mental health of First Nations that addresses the ongoing multi- and intergenerational trauma from residential schools, day schools, the 60s scoop, 60s scoop the child welfare system, and missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and to spirit lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, asexual plus. Call to call on the AFN to advocate for this fund to provide resources from all levels of government to support First Nations in creating culturally appropriate and trauma-informed healing centers whereby healing programs services and activities are developed and implemented by First Nations, including the preservation and revitalization of cultural tradition, traditions and languages. Three, direct the AFN when engaging in discussions with Indigenous Services Canada regarding Action Plan Measure 81 on Canada's Action Plan on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act to seek the sec to secure support and long-term sustainable and dedicated funding for the First Nations Healing Fund. We will now pass on draft resolution 25. Therefore, be it resolved that 
the First Nations in Assembly, one, direct the Assembly of First Nations to call on the Government of Canada to work directly with First Nations to determine the needs and on, for an unreserved disability program, two, direct the AFN to call on the Government of Canada to work with the provincial, territorial governments and First Nations to develop and implement comprehensive disability services for First Nations citizens on reserve. This would include capacity building and training for First Nations and all service providers, infrastructure in investments for the determinants of health, including accessible housing and community facilities and reform policy to address systemic barriers and inequities. Three, direct the AFN to call on the Government of Canada to encourage provincial territorial governments to invest in unreserved disability programs for First Nations. Four, direct the AFN to call upon the Government of Canada and the provincial territorial governments to develop pathways to the utilization of the Investing in Canada infrastructure program under the Rural and Northern Communities Infrastructure STEAM, STEM, STEAM, to improve education and or health facilities specific to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. Five, direct the AFN to advocate for a distinct First Nations pathway to, be, to removing systemic barriers to First Nations under utilization of the Federal Enabling Accessibility Fund. And sixth, six, direct the AFN to call on the Government of Canada to provide long-term and sustainable funding for a non-reserved disability programs for First Nations. Draft resolution number 26. Therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in Assembly direct the Assembly of First Nations to ad advocate for adequate and appropriate funding from the federal government to build capacity to undertake a, a feasibility study to inform a national action plan on accessibility, misdiagnosis, and undiagnosis of First Nations. The study will identify knowledge gaps and biases with the field of healthcare to assess the prevalence and impact of misdiagnosis and undiagnosis in First Nations. Two, direct the AFN to advocate and secure resources to address the unmet needs of misdiagnosis by developing culturally responsive referral and assessment toolkits based on the outcomes of the feasibility study the AFN will support interested First Nations in developing equitable services and programs to address colonization-induced traumas linked to the ongoing detrimental impacts of intergenerational trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Three, direct the AFN to establish a, a, a horizontal permanent working group on accessibility to guide the feasibility study to inform a national action plan on accessibility, misdiagnosis, and undiagnosis of First Nations, and to report back to the First Nations in Assembly on its result. Four, direct the AFN to call on the Canadian Psychological Association and the Psychology Foundation of Canada to provide an update uh, and an action plan an update and action plan for the implementation of their 2018 report on implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. And the last resolution on this package, number 27, 2024. Therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in Assembly, one, direct the Assembly of First Nations to draft a list of all the listed or excluded medicines, treatment, treatments, therapies, mental health services, medical, ima ima medical imaging, dental and medical procedures and equipment to the Government of Canada demanding that they be covered under treaty and ensure that those in Northern First Nations have access to professional and sufficient medical services, Western medicine and traditional healers. 
to direct the AFN to immediately develop a political and legal strategy to address these breaches of treaty, including regress, redress for all out-of-pocket expenses incurred by First Nations for medicines, treatments, therapies, medical imaging, medical procedures, and equipment. And it's the end of the omnibus package. I will now call on the mover uh, to present the omnibus. Uh, you have four minutes on mic number one. Good afternoon, and thank you, everybody, for sticking around. This is really important, and it's, uh, I'm passionate about this. It's around health, and you know, as you've heard already, and I think there's some, coinc some things that coincide with all of the different resolutions. At first, I was frustrated they were put together in an omnibus, but I'll say that for right now, it does make sense. There's a lot of things that coincide with this treaty one, as well as what we're looking at, because a lot of the medicines, a lot of the things that happen in the medicine chest will be determined by uh, how the, our people are assessed. And so this resolution is based on inclusion and can be in, informed by those who have long needed the space to speak. And I think that that's what we're after, is that we see the other councils that are being brought in. And I think that the real reality is we really need to catch up with human rights. And I think that this resolution does that. And I think in a good way, it actually helps us put puts our, uh, puts those people with those gifts in a place where they actually can feel honor and respect. And so I wanted to just make sure that because of the amount of time we have, I'll only speak a few minutes on this resolution because uh, I'm passionate about it. I could go on and on, but I also realize that there are a lot of people here that want to get onto their resolutions as well. So I'm hoping that my uh, my understanding of your time will actually overlap into those that are behind me and on the other mic. So, Kukshchem. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, since we don't have a lot of time, I think we will uh, do the same as the last omnibus and close the speakers list uh, with the speakers that are now standing. Uh, we'll go over microphone number one. Good afternoon, Chief Wilfred King, Gull Bay First Nation. I just want to comment on um, resolution number 27. I'm not asking for any amendments. Uh, under therefore be it resolved is the um, uh, legal strategy. I know that provision in the treaties is very important, and yesterday we had a resolution that said they didn't want the AFN to get involved in treaties. Now we're talking about a very specific pr provision in those treaties. Uh, but I, I'm not here to argue that point. That resolution was defeated yesterday, and I accept the results. But uh, right now, under, we're under the same pressure in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting prescriptions not uh, covered by NF NHIB. And, but there is the appeal mechanism, and we've been successful in doing the appeals. And often on the first appeal, you're, 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 that would be funded. Uh, and there are four stages to the appeal mechanism. And I think what's needed is not so much a legal strategy is that we should be appealing the decision of NHIB for not funding those prescriptions and those sort of things. So I, I'm not here to change the resolution just for food for thought that uh, I think First Nations using your health authorities to challenge those, um, uh, those when you get rejected, challenge them, appeal them, then at the last resort, then we should look at maybe perhaps legal action. Miigwech. Thank you, Chief, for your comment. Uh, we will take a comment on microphone or an amendment on microphone number two. Please specify which one it is. It's actually number 25. Yes. Uh, and and 27. So amendments? Is, yes. Perfect. Uh, my name is uh, Proxy Chief Frank Buffalo for Samson Cree Nation. I'll be giving my time for my comments to my treaty um, technician, Laurie Buffalo. I'd like to submit a resolution revision uh, to the therefore be it resolved number two. Uh, within number two, within the first sentence right after develop and implement comprehensive, I would like to see an insertion of self-determined And then in, therefore, be it resolved, number three, 
I would like to revise the entire therefore be it resolved number three because the word encourage, in my opinion, isn't strong enough. So I would like to propose direct the AFN to call for the direct support and funding of First Nation led and design, sorry, uh, direct the AFN to call on the government of Canada and the provinces and territories to implement immediate investments towards self-determined, equitable, rights-based investments directly to First Nations led, designed, and implemented disability programs that meet the needs of all disabilities. I would also like to propose an additional, therefore be it resolved, I'm not sure which uh, number it would be. I propose the wording as to direct AFN to call for the direct support and funding of First Nations led and designed data collection, data disaggregation in accordance with OCAP principles, including the direct and ongoing support for the continued Indigenous disabilities research led by Indigenous researchers. The team is, the team is working on uh, wording this. If you have other amendments, you can continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, my follow-up is on Resolution 27. I would like to directly speak to the second, therefore be it resolved. I would like to see it revised to direct the AFN to directly support the numbered treaty nations in the development of their own self-determined legal and political strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Just one second. Okay, so we can go back to resolution 25. We worked on the wording. We will, we will read it and uh, you can tell us if we understood right. Uh, so resolution, perfect. Uh, we added on the second, uh, there, it, there be it resolved, self-determined. Then three, direct the AFN to call on the government of Canada and provincial territorial governments to implement immediate investments towards, investments towards self-determined, equitable, right-based investments directly to First Nations-led, designed and implemented disability programs that meet the needs related to all disabilities. And we added four. Direct, the AFN, direct AFN to call for the direct support and funding of First Nations-led and designed data collection and data disaggression in accordance with the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, possession, including the direct and ongoing support for continued Indigenous dis disability research. That's good. Uh, microphone number two. To add on to the end of that particular sentence, that it be led by indigenous researchers. Okay. So, to be led by indigenous researchers. researchers. Okay, perfect. Full stop. Thank you. So, for uh, draft resolution 25, our movers and sec are the, is the mover and seconder, yeah? Over yes and seconder yes to perfect yeah perfect okay we can go to 27 on the second therefore be it resolved direct the AFN to directly support the numbered treaty nations in the development of their own self-determined political and legal strategy to address these breaches of treaty 
uh, including, and the rest wasn't changed. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Thank you. And mover uh, agrees, the seconder agrees. Perfect. Thank you. Microphone number one for the last comment or amendment. Uh, thank you, Jordan Catala, Susoke, Donald Sultan, First Nation. Just to comment on the resolution of number 27, <coughs> as it's written up there, about the use of traditional healers. Uh, we're a treaty, you know, so we get covered uh, through medical, we get uh, medication, uh, all that kind of uh, modern kind of uh, uh, treatment. <coughs> and sometimes you get a case where the doctors can't do anything no more. They, they, uh, they try everything. They try their, their, their different kind of therapies or different kind of medicines that they have, and they can't help the patient no more. So they gave up, and they, uh, and they say, well, you know, you, you have an option to, to, uh, to try uh, you know, a traditional healer. <clears throat> And, and from where we're from, from Northwest Territories, uh, uh, we've got what we call a non-insurable non, non health benefits. Uh, but it goes up, uh, to put a request through, it, 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 it goes up uh, further north, uh, and then from there it goes to Ottawa, and then it sits there, you know, sometimes weeks, months, uh, and while patients are, you know, suffering and, uh, you know, they don't have money to access, to travel, like we're like remote community. And so in a lot of cases, we, as uh, First Nation, you know, we, we, we uh, care for our people and uh, <clears throat> whatever kind of financial supports we have, you know, that we put that into it, you know. You know, we have to do things like that. But yet, you know, they got, you know, traditional healers up there. And, and they're gonna have a lot of problems. You won't have a lot of problems right now, like just to access that. You know, unless you provide your own money. But, but under non-insurable health benefits, <clears throat> it seems like it's part of the treaty right, because it's there. But it's hard to access it. The only way you probably could do it is probably a, you have to like negotiate some kind of a package. I think that's about the only way you can do it. <clears throat> Unless the other way is that you gotta wait. And uh, you don't have that time. I mean, uh, a lot of our people get sick with cancer and you know, uh, they have a time limit. And uh, so, <clears throat> so hopefully, you know, through this uh, resolution that, uh, that, you know, the use of uh, traditional healers will be the same as uh, the way that we use uh, modern doctors. I uh, hope, that's it. <clears throat> Thank you, for, thank you, Chief, for your comment. We would be ready for the vote. One, one comment, yes. One friendly amendment is to, uh, line two is to directly support First Nations instead of the numbered treaties, because I think that that excludes British Columbia because we don't, aren't numbered treaties. Just con First Nations. Perfect. So mover agrees, that's for sure. And seconder, <laughs> yes. I just have one other um, revision that was uh, just overlooked under draft resolution 25 that uh, the title uh, on reserve be removed and that it just be reflected as First Nations with Disabilities Across the Lifespan Services. That's the only um, revision that was overlooked. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, you, you confirm that you agreed with the pre the previous amendment, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. 
Okay, so we are working on the wording of this, uh, this uh, proposed amendment. Um, we will ask the resolution team to come and see you to make sure we get, uh, we get the wording right. And since we're working on the wording, we will make an exception and take microphone number two for comment on our amendment. You, you might have to wait for that. I'm going to call a question. Okay. For the formalities, let's keep this moving and going. So. Perfect. <laughs> It won't take long, we, we will just work on the wording. Okay. So we have the wording. Um, it's on resolution 25. Is it the one that we have on screen? Yes. Which number? Okay, so we will go up the resolution on the title to make sure we rewarded the title right. First Nations with disabilities across the lifespan services and we removed on reserve. So the mover agrees with this change. <laughs> Chief, you agree with the, this amendment on the title? Yes. Yes, because you proposed it. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. We w yes. I, so, sorry, in the, my last statement around take, uh, taking the numbered treaties off, I was actually thinking of a different resolution and I was actually hearing the words to take it off, and, but I realize now that needs to be in there because that's on the treaty resolution, so I'm sorry. Okay, so we take it back to what it was? Please. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So we erase First Nations and we keep treaties, number treaties. Yes. Okay, perfect. So since the amendment was uh, removed, we can proceed. To the vote, uh, any opposition? Yeah, call for question. Yeah, I heard. Okay. Uh, any opposition? I see none. Okay, any abstentions? I see none either, so congratulations, this omnibus is carried by consensus. I will now turn the floor, I think, to Cedric. For the omnibus on infrastructure. So after a long three days, sorry for scaring you, Chief, uh, I think we have to go through maybe a bit of procedure, also remind you of what's going to happen since this meeting will soon be coming to a close. So on page 21 of your conference booklets, in other notes, on point one, 
If the resolutions do not get debated due to time constraints or lack of quorum, the chairpersons may refer the draft resolution to the next AFN Executive Committee meeting with recommendations for the consideration. So due to the time, we will not be getting to any further resolutions. We'll be looking towards uh, going to our closing. And to start that off, I would invite over uh, my co-chair, Wina Siwi, uh, for her closing words. We see microphone one, Chief King. Uh, Chief, oh, good afternoon, Chief Wilfred King, Gulbay First Nation. Um, you know, again, uh, it is four o'clock on the last day, and I want to thank all the chiefs and proxies that have stayed. Um, I said this at the very opening that uh, when we come to these meetings, I make sure I'm here for the full three days to entertain resolutions. I'm not a favor of these omnibus resolutions that were passed yesterday. That's why I voted against the first omnibus and I abstained on the second omnibus. I think the resolutions are very, very important. And I don't think it should be left to the executive to deal with these resolutions. Um, we're here today. I think we still have a quorum of chiefs that want to still conduct business. And I'm willing to stay to deal with, uh, I think one of the most important resolutions we talked about that's on this is the Clean Water Act. We've been talking about boil water advisories, I don't know how many years at this assembly, and yet that resolution wasn't entertained. It should have been entertained yesterday, or at least at the very first this morning. So I, I'm, I ask for your indulgence, Mr. Chair, that if there's a show of hands of the chiefs that want to stay to maintain quorum to deal with these very important resolutions that we do so. Miigwech. Thank you, Chief King. Chief Denny. Microphone number one, please. Yeah, Chief Leroy Denny, Escazoni. Um, just uh, my, my concern and disappointment with the uh, running out of time. I, had, I waited all day, all, all week, really worked hard to the next res uh, resolutions that were coming up for education, also for income assistance. Uh, my communities and our nation really relied on this next uh, uh, resolutions. Education is very important, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it looks like this could be moved to December. These omnibus bills that uh, we're all talking about takes, take a lot of time. I'm kind of disappointed. Omnibus, it's a colonial word. We shouldn't even use that word. We, use, we should find our own indigenous word for deal with this matter. And uh, I'm just disappointed and discouraged that uh, we were able to uh, have ran out of time. Um, I knew this was happening once we talked about four minutes. I don't agree with four minutes. Uh, t if we have four minutes, 10 people in the lineup, that's 40 minutes of deliberations. It took a lot of our time. We spent every person here, I don't know how much we pay, a lot of money here. We brought in a lot of economy here in Montreal, you know, other than, probably almost a million dollars. And, and then uh, and these resolutions, especially in education, is going to be bumped bump down till December. I'm very disappointed. If we want to have four minutes, at least let's work through the evenings or have add another day at least. If we have a guest speaker uh, from Prime Minister or whoever, they should at least, at least be to ask a question. It only takes um, probably a minute to ask a question, not four minutes. I'm, I'm just discouraged and disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Denny. I'm being informed that we will continue then with our next resolutions package. Final. Our final resolutions package. <laughs> this is a question is a suggestion. <laughs> so let us then go through our final omnibus package for the day. We have our omnibus package on infrastructure, which includes draft resolution 07, Bill C61, First Nations Clean Water Act. We have draft resolution 08, 
support for First Nations-led responses to chronic and unsheltered homelessness. We have draft resolution 09, transition of the First Nations Market Housing Fund to First Nations control. And finally, draft resolution 76, remote airport infrastructure funding for required upgrades. We had as an identified mover, Chief Lance Heyman. I do not know if Chief Lance, Chief Lance Heyman is right here. Thank you, Chief. And we had as a seconder, Isaiah Bernard, proxy for Potlatek uh, First Nation. I see Isaiah Bernard here. We will, as is process, read all the therefore be it resolves, and then go to our four minutes for our mover and seconder. If I can have just for illusion seven, therefore be it resolved on screen. Therefore be it resolved that the First Nations and Assembly, one, urge Canada to prioritize the implementation of the First Nations Clean Water Act, FNCWA, in full partnership with First Nations and to ensure that the legislation comes into force on the day of enactment. Two, calls on the federal government to affirm its commitment to fully implement Article 19 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People by consulting with potentially impacted First Nations in obtaining their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing any legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. Three, urge the federal government to ensure adequate funding for First Nations to participate throughout the implementation of the FNCWA and to immediately begin co-development of, at a minimum, a funding framework for the First Nations Water Commission and regulations under the Act. Four, urge the federal government to immediately prioritize resolving drinking water advisories and long-standing issues. We will now move on to draft resolution number eight. Toward therefore be it resolved. Thank you, team. Therefore be it resolved, one, call on the federal government to fully implement the calls to action from the advocates' report on homeless encampments and to develop a na national encampments response plan by August 31st, 2024. Two, call on the federal government, as well as provincial and territorial governments, to ensure the National Encampments Response Plan includes measure to meaningful, measures to meaningfully engage First Nations, including dedicated resources for engagement with First Nations on an ongoing basis, and support for First Nations jurisdiction over funding, supports, and services aimed at addressing First Nations homelessness. Three, call on all levels of government, including municipalities, to end the forced eviction and displacement of First Nations citizens living in encampments, and to ensure that the encampment's residents are provided with safe, adequate, and culturally appropriate housing and social services. Four, call on the federal government to meaningfully engage the Assembly of First Nations, AFN, and First Nations in the development of its National Encampment Response Plan, and to ensure that a proportionate amount of funding committed in Budget 2024, as well as any future investments to address chronic and unsheltered homelessness are allocated to First Nations on an opt-in basis and through a process that respects First Nations' rights and jurisdiction. And five, call on provinces and municipalities to engage directly with the unhoused people who are most impacted when implementing measures to address encampments, as well as with local First Nations whose citizens are often overrepresented and on whose traditional territories encampments exist. For therefore, be it resolved, or draft resolution nine, Therefore, be it resolved, one, renew their 2013 call on the federal government to co-develop with the Assembly of First Nations, AFN, requirements for the transfer of control of the First Nations Market Housing Fund, in parentheses, the fund, to First Nations without delay. Two, call on the fund and the, Can the Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation, CHMC, to hold regional engagement sessions as soon as possible to consider First Nations control options and to seek First Nations views on the role of the fund. Three, call on the fund and the CMHC to delay the submission of recommendations to cabinet until the results of these engagement sessions can be included. And four, call on the federal government to transfer the fund to First Nations with maximum flexibility to determine its priorities in line with the full co-implementation of the 10-year national First Nations housing and related infrastructure strategy. In our final resolution in the package, Draft Resolution 76, therefore be it resolved, call on the federal government as well as provincial and territorial governments 
to equitably invest in remote airports across Canada that serve as a lifeline for First Nations communities, given that the lack of investment has impacted their human rights by inhibiting access to essential services. Two, call on federal government to amend the national airport's policy to include an essential service airport standard to adequately fund the required investments in remote airport infrastructure that will improve safety and access to remote First Nations. Three, call on Transport Canada, Indigenous Services Canada, NAV Canada, provincial, territorial, and municipal airport operators, and all relevant partners to work collaboratively in addressing the significant funding shortfall for remote airport infrastructure across Canada. And the final, therefore, be it resolved. Four, call on remote airport operators to work collaboratively with First Nations and government partners in identifying infrastructure gaps across Canada to accurately identify the monetary need for closing the remote airport infrastructure gap on reserve by 2030. Therefore, be it resolves, have been read into the record. So I would turn to our mover, Chief Lance Heyman, for four minutes. Oh. Microphone number one, please. So good afternoon, uh, Chief Lance Heyman, Kebawek, uh, First Nation, Quebec. So on resolution number seven, there was a friendly amendment that I see did not make it into the final version. So I would like to read that, uh, um, that, 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 that clause so that it can be added. So it's demand that no representative of the Assembly of First Nations Secretariat, political office, executive, or legal counsel shall approve any co-development policy, legislation, or regulation unilaterally. Any co-development policy, legislation, or regulation in the final phases of negotiation must be approved directly by the First Nations in assembly before being submitted to the Crown representatives. Any draft policy, legislation, or regulation must be provided to all First Nations leadership at a minimum two months before a vote can be conducted to ensure adequate time for engagements with right holders. Thank you, Chief Heyman. I will look towards our resolution committee. So we have added, if we can scroll down for our technicians, we have added a fifth, therefore be it resolved. If we can scroll down. Chief Heyman. So with uh, resolution seven, as you can see, it's uh, on Bill C-61 water legislation. Again, recognizing that a lot of work has gone into the various iterations of this uh, legislation. And so, therefore, you know, we're still looking forward uh, to supporting and moving it uh, forward. Resolution number eight, again, speaks, you know, clearly that uh, homelessness affects our communities uh, proportionally and we need the support. So I think the, the resolution is pretty straightforward. Resolution number nine, uh, transition to the market housing fund is an update of our 2013 resolution. Uh, which speaks to uh, the First Nation Market Housing Fund must come under the care and control of First Nations. And this uh, resolution speaks to the process that should happen. Uh, so consultation occur occurs, occur uh, occurs with our communities uh, before uh, that happens. And the last resolution, uh, I didn't see it and realize it was in the package, but I see it's about improving infrastructure for airports for northern communities and again fully support uh, that that initiative and i'll stop there i'll give the, the floor to the seconder thanks thank you chief Heyman. before we continue i'd just like to confirm with the seconder that the amendment proposed by chief Heyman for the addition of a fifth by getting a thumbs up by proxy bernard proxy bernard your opening words sorry I'm, <coughs> sorry i'm tired but uh uh, yeah, I agree with all the motions in hand. Uh, I also want to apologize to Chief Leroy back there who made a comment earlier. As I'm the one who made the motion to accept the four minutes. Hindsight is 2020. Oh well. But anyways, I accept all. I accept uh, everything as it is. Tahoe. Thank you, Proxy Bernard. So we'll now be going to the discussion period. I will start with microphone number one. Good afternoon, Chief Wilfred King, Kiasagi, Nishnebek, Gulby First Nation. I don't have any amendments. I just want to have a commentary. 
Um, Gull Bay First Nation was on the second longest boil water advisory in Ontario and might have been Canada. I think Niskanaga First Nation was ahead of us. Um, we, we currently built a $26 million water treatment plant in our community. Uh, our water treatment operators have confirmed that we have the best drinking water in Ontario right now. Um, when these plants were first initiated uh, way back when, First Nations had the option of looking at whether they would adopt the federal or provincial standards and which ones were more stringent, and we had that option. Uh, we looked at adopting the Ontario drinking water standards as a result of Walkerton. They have one of the highest drinking water standards in the Western world. And uh, when we looked into it, the issue is if you adopt those regulations, then comes the liability with that. And the liability is for chief and council and your water plant operators. And often, um, if there's, uh, if you um, cause any harm to your citizens, you would, you could be charged with heavy fines and imprisonment. So I, I caution First Nations that are looking at the regulations that to be very careful, do your due diligence. And even if you have an insurance, if the liability issues come up, if you're if you're found to be negligent, your insurance company won't cover you. So when you, I, and I think what I'm looking at then is the is the um, number three where you talk about the, uh, we urge the federal government. I think it's um, we got to make sure that there's adequate funding to ensure that we do have um, you know a clear framework in terms of that funding. It's it's no sense adopting a, a a regulation if you don't have the money to operate your plants. And my friend here, my blood brother from uh, Don Miracle here, chief of the Mohawks of Bay of Quinte, is going to support my uh, comments. Miigwech. Thank you, Chief King, and congratulations to your community for that. So we will be closing the speakers list as it is now, so Chief Don, you'll be the last. Microphone number two, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Chief Ron Bear, Muscatty First Station, Saskatchewan. First of all, I just want to uh, acknowledge the veterans, the chiefs and the proxies. I don't have uh, any amendments to the current resolutions, but I just got a comment that I want to make. I think we're using really passive language here by uh, using some of the words that we're using, like call call on the government for this. We should be using more stronger language when we're dealing with the federal government here. And uh, I just had to get up and say that, so I just wanted to make knowledge of that when we're doing these resolutions, we should be using the strongest language we could possibly use when we're approaching federal government on trying to do action for the First Nations. Thank you. Hey, Chief. Microphone number one. Thank you. Again, I'm Sheldon Sunshine, Sears Lake Cree Nation. Um, I just want to, again, uh, say the omnibus package is uh, not fair to me or my people. And I'd ask that we take out that uh, Resolution 7, speaking to the, uh, the water legislation, uh, Bill C-61. It is now in the, uh, in the I-9 committee's hands, and uh, we're doing work in, in our territory on the analysis of this legislation. So I think it's a little premature to ask for that resolution to go forward. I ask that we strike it from the Somnus package and have it on its own so that it's a contentious uh, uh, piece of legislation and I think it's, it's unfair to the nations that are not here um, and, and unfair to the chiefs to decide on this matter uh, it being that contentious. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sunshine. So there's a motion to remove resolution seven from the omnibus package. Again, just as a point of information, if this is done, it does not guarantee that we will get to the resolution after this. Uh, so that is a point of information that I'd like to make. There is, however, a motion on the floor to remove it. So the motion on the floor is to remove draft resolution 07 from the package. I would like a raising of hands and of lanyards for those who are for removing Draft Resolution 7 from the Omnibus Package. We will continue on with process, so those who are in favor of removing, I saw we had four hands. Is there anyone who abstains from the motion? We have one abstention. So the motion is defeated. 
by majority. We will now go back to our speakers list. Microphone number one with uh, Chief Marigold. I, I share the same uh, concerns that Chief King has brought forward, that once this is enacted into law, the party of a jurisdiction, which will be the First Nations government, will hold the liability to ensure compliance with the, with the standards. And right now, the federal government doesn't have a plan to, of investment to correct the problems that exist. And in the province of Ontario, 20 of the 28 boil water advisories are still unresolved. In addition to that, the majority of the drinking water wells and also shore wells, oftentimes they get do not use orders. In my community, 226 homes of the 1,200 are subject to these conditions. I think the language and the resolution and also in Bill C-61 is too weak regarding for the funding issue. All oh, the minister is going to make best efforts. That's, that's subject to interpretation. And we're going to urge the federal government. We should be demanding that they provided uh, the funding because safe drinking water should be in the category of an essential service because it is a basic health need. You can't protect public health in your community if you don't have safe drinking water. And the federal government should maintain responsibility for citizens living under land, federal land, because the, the Constitution says it's still the jurisdiction of the minister. So I think the, the bill, the, the minister asked if there's any way to strengthen the bill. He asked us yesterday, I came to the microphone to make a suggestion about the, to strengthen the funding, and we weren't heard. So I don't know whether or not these other changes can be, can be established at committee, or it's too late. But I, I think the chiefs are deserving of a legal opinion about where does the liability fall when there's non-compliance with the regulation and the federal government hasn't provided the money, because that's what the situation is going to be in Ontario. Thank you, Chief Maracle. So I would look towards you, and if I understand, you propose to amend the words put, put urge. Is there somewhere that safe drinking water is an essential service and will remain the responsibility of the federal government to provide money to correct it because it's a federal law that puts the obligation on the First Nations? So I hear two amendments I support, that are being I support proposed. the need for a law. I support the need for standards, but with, it will not work without funding. And we can't park it up into, oh, well, we're going to close the gap by 2030. That is a very reckless way to deal with a public health issue. The money should be needed, needed now because it falls within the realm of protecting public health. Thank you, Chief Miracle. If you can stay at the microphone, I just want to make sure because I understood two different amendments. The first one is to change the word urge and therefore be resolved one, two, and three yeah. for demand. Like, and have the federal government guarantee that this money is going to be available so that First Nations can comply with the law. So what I would propose is if you do have wording for your proposed amendment, okay. we have our resolutions team member just beside you. Okay, number three. Ensure the federal government guarantee funding will be provided, adequate funding will be provided to enable First Nations to be compliant with the new, the new Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. I will look on our resolutions team. And that for the federal government recognize that safe drinking water is an essential service and the federal government and the AFN demand the federal government ensure that immediate steps are taken to provide adequate funding so First Nations can comply with the new drinking water standards. Perfect. Thank you, Chief Miracle. I will ask if you could work with our member uh, next to you on the resolutions team to make sure we get that language. After this, we will go back to microphone number two and continue on uh, before confirming uh, these amendments. So if we can go to microphone number two. Uh, I just have a comment. Um, Chief Sherry Lynn Hill from Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario. Um, abstaining this omnibus because of number nine. It assumes that First Nations are in favor uh, that, like all First Nations in favor of the transfer of the care and control of the First Nations Market Housing Fund. Thank you for your comment, Chief. If we can return to their, uh, draft resolution 7, 
in TBI R3. We have new language, which I would look towards Chief Miracle. Chief Miracle. So Chief Miracle, I would ask, uh, is the wording as seen? We're getting it? Perfect. In future, I would recommend that the assembly, anything that's deal with legislation, that that be dealt with sa separately and there be adequate time on the agenda to deal with legislative reform. It should have been dealt with yesterday. It was, it was on the agenda. We should not uh, uh, defer something that's so vitally important. And just think we can bundle it all up in like this because it's reckless. Okay. Thank you for your comment. I just want to have a on, uh, so uh, I'm being told by the resolutions committee that therefore be resolved three as uh, the proposed amendment would include the language. I would look towards Chief Miracle to confirm the language as presented. Friendly amendment, friendly amendment. We'll get through this one first and then we'll come back to it. Well, it's going to impact his, uh, his approval of it. Mm. We'll get through this one first, please. It's a, it's a friendly amendment. It's, it's straight from here. Don? Mr. Chair, I would just add that a friendly amendment, take out the word adequate. Adequate is not the high bar. It should be requisite funding. Requisite pertains to regulation. Adequate is, I don't know, subject to interpret. That's my only friendly amendment, and I'm pretty sure my friend, Chief Miracle, will agree with that. And the mover and the seconder. Adequate for requisite. We can go to that one, because I believe the language is simple. So replacing the word adequate for requisite, I look towards our mover. Yeah, microphone one. Uh, so Chief Heyman, uh, I agree with the uh, amendments that have been made. And I just want to make a point of order. I think that when someone asks for a resolution to be removed for, from a package, I believe that the mover and seconder has uh, a say before it should go to the vote, to just for future reference, uh, to get that clarified. Because again, we'll never get any business done if there's one individual who objects and continually um, brings forward a motion. I think you know the procedures indicate that we should have an opportunity uh, to have a say as to whether or not we agree as the mover and seconder. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Heyman. I would look towards Proxy Bernard for the proposed amendments. What he said. <laughs> what he said. So we'll go down to same resolution, draft resolution 07. Therefore, we resolve six, which would be added. Therefore, we resolve six, demand that the federal government recognize that safe drinking water is an essential service and provide adequate funding so that the First Nations can be compliant with the act. So we're looking towards resolution, uh, draft resolution seven, therefore we resolve six. Question has been called. We looked at our mover and seconder agree with the changes of the addition of six and seven, as well as changing the word adequate for requisite. So 
I look towards my mover and seconder. And I look towards my mover also, Chief Heyman. And our final one that we have to, we have to confirm, therefore be it resolved seven that has to be read into the record, would be direct AFN to obtain a legal opinion on the liability flowing to First Nations as a result of Bill C-61, where there is a non-compliance due to insufficient funding. I look at Chief Miracle, the language is good. I look towards our mover and seconder to confirm, therefore be resolved seven. I'm getting, and a thumbs up from Chief Haven. Perfect, so question has been called, and as chair, I do believe we should go to the vote. The speaker's list had been closed. So I will be looking for omnibus number seven on infrastructure with draft resolution seven, Bill C-61, First Nations Clean Water Act, draft resolution eight, support for First Nations-led responses to chronic and unsheltered homelessness, draft resolution nine, Transition of the First Nations Market Housing Fund to First Nations Control. And draft resolution 76, remote airport infrastructure funding for required upgrades. I would ask if there's any opposition to the package. We have one opposition. Is there any abstentions? We have one abstention in the back. You're against, at the microphone is against, so a second opposition. Any more abstentions? Thus, infrastructure omnibus number seven is adopted by majority. Thank you. I just, just, yes, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, I'm talking, I just wanted to invite you, I, Chief, Chief, just a second, because I need to ask the technician to open the microphone, that's the only thing, if you want people, chiefs and proxies and the delegation to be, to hear you and to get the translation and the sign language, we need the microphone to be open, so this is, this is just a, a, um, a way to express a respect over the, 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 the chairs as well. So microphone number two, please. Thank you. You know, it's a little frustrating sitting here. Uh, I've been chief for two years. This is the second time I've been here. And we run into the same issues all the time uh, coming from Alberta. Um, you know, I question quorum. Is quorum, do we have a quorum here? And the second part of that is we're getting into dangerous situations here. You know, that, that situation that we had yesterday, that was a very dangerous, and I don't know if people understand the impact of what would have happened should, should have that, uh, that resolution passed yesterday. Like, we're all, all our rights are at stake here. You know, and this Bill C-61, we're, we're supporting that to have that push through. Um, we got serious questions on, on how that's gonna affect us. We're, they put us in this little box and yet we're going to agree to have them give us jurisdiction in this little box. Why? Why are we doing that? You know? And I just want to make sure that, that we've got to get that point across. You know, what is quorum? And why are we agreeing to have them put us in a little box? Maybe we expand it a little bit to the, the water outside of our little box, but yet we're still in that box. Why are we doing that? We never ceded this land. This is First Nation land, this is Cree land, this is Algonquin land, this is, uh, this is all of our land. And yet, we're trying to fight within these constructs. Why do we do that to ourselves? I just want to remind everybody, we never ceded that land. That treaty is written in their favor. I went and seen the actual treaty document in the archives, and it's right there in bold, cede and surrender. And they never discussed seed or surrender. Never. Because you know our people, our, our creation stories, we are from the land. Why would we give up part of us? We would have never done that. So we need to seriously think about what we're doing here and, and passing these things that are going to affect us long term to keep us in that box. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Hey. 
Miigoch chief. Uh, so on that uh, question was, uh, <laughs> I think I'm getting uh, tired, maybe IQ. <laughs> but uh, question, uh, quorum was question. So you read our minds, chief, because we thought the same thing and we did a count already. So we have quorum, we confirmed that. So um, the quorum is, uh, yeah. So the, thank you so much, chiefs. Yep, because you're all there. You, you're there. You, it's, it's long days, a lot of work, and you're still there. So congratulations. It's it's very appreciated for all chiefs and proxies here because we can't continue and we're there for you and we want to and we heard you. We want to continue to do a, a omnibus re draft resolution if that is what you want to do. Um, but we also need to make sure that our closing protocols, that we have some, some um, like the drums, uh, the elder, uh, we need to make sure that they are available as well. So we will try to make a fit with all those uh, things. And, uh, but this is a mark of respect because it is your assembly chiefs and proxies and we heard you and that is why we continued because we were supposed to, to, to close at four. Huh? So, yeah, so, and on that, I am going to look at my uh, co-chairs and, um, and make sure that we uh, are on the same page for the next item. Thank you. All right, thank you for your patience. So again, as mentioned, we do have quorum. We still do, we just had a count that was conducted. There is, in our agenda, we are supposed to go towards a closing. We extended to an additional omnibus package due to the important nature of the resolution as was mentioned by a speaker. However, our closing protocol might be affected due to some of our members that do have to participate in the closing must uh, or have other engagements. I would propose to go towards the closing of this assembly, but there can be a motion on the floor, which would take a mover and a seconder, to extend and continue the work and continue on with the work of the resolutions. Again, that might affect closing protocol. So I would look towards the chiefs. I am proposing as well after having uh, spoken with my co-chairs that we do go towards the closing of the assembly. This is the end of the third day. I have a speaker on microphone one. Does this work? Oh, there we go. There is. Jeez. Uh, hi, Isaiah Bernard, proxy for uh, Bolodek First Nation. I'm looking to make a motion to continue this work because we have some really important work that needs to be passed. Thank you. So you have a proposed duration for the extension. It is already. Oh, let's just get it done. We have okay. about 30 resolutions left. <laughs> well, we, we, there's a hammock I've seen over there. We can go camp and. But I don't know what works for you guys, Chiefs. I'm, I'm open for the suggestions, like an hour, 30 we minutes. Can, we can propose a certain period of time, and at that point after this, we can continue. Half hour. A half hour is proposed to extend the meeting. I'm looking for a seconder for this motion. I second the motion. Chief Leroy Denny has Kazonia. I second the motion. Chief Leroy Denny seconds. And I have a proposition. I have a, I'm a mover, and, and also I have a, a mover for both files, uh, the social and education, along with uh, Chief J.R. Gould. We're, we're both movers and seconders on that, and we're going to propose to uh, merge them. Thank you. 
if you can head to the resolutions committee with that. For now, we will be looking at the motion to extend by half an hour, proposed by Proxy Bernard and seconded by Chief Denny. We will now go towards, we'll go to discussion. So microphone number one, please. Uh, just a, a consideration. Are the omnibus movers and mo or motioners and seconders in the building if we continue with that work? Uh, because if they're not, we're either going to have to replace them. Thank you for thank you for that comment. I'll be looking towards the resolutions committee. I'm getting a thumbs up, so saying that we should be good. And if ever we do have process to find a second mover. Seeing no other people at the microphone, I will now put the decision or the motion to extend by a period of 30 minutes. It would be about 5.05 uh, to continue our work on resolutions. So do I have, the motion is to extend by a half hour and put the ending of the assembly at 5.05. I have a question that's been called. I will look towards all those who are opposed to extending the time to 5.05. Do we have any opposition to extending the time to 5.05? Do we have any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion is carried unanimously. We will now be closing at 5.05. I will now turn it over to my co-chair, Veronique, to continue with the work. Perfect, so we will continue with package resolution number eight on reconciliation. We have three draft resolutions on this, uh, well, Cedric renamed them resolution packages, we'll say that this way. Um, so the first one is uh, draft resolution 28, uh, supporting public education on First Nations cultures and histories. The second one is uh, draft resolution number 47, support First Nations accessing ICMP expertise for missing children, unmarked graves and burial sites associated with former Indian residential schools. Draft resolution 48, 2024, advocating for full and effective participation of indigenous peoples at the United Nations. The mover of this uh, uh, package is uh, Chairperson Kilsim from Squamish Nation. He's in the room over there. Um, and the seconder is Don Tom, which is over there. Perfect. I will now read the Therefore Be It Resolved. on draft resolution number 28, uh, 2024, supporting public education on First Nations culture and history. There, the, therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in assembly, one, call on the assembly of First Nations to provide education broadly on the concept of time immemorial and its distinct relationship to First Nations land use, occupation, and government, governance of the land now known as Canada. Two, call on the government of Canada to ensure that reference to the concept of time immemorial in the context of indigenous land use, occupation and governance for legislative purposes and other considerations reflects the truth rooted in both First Nations and Canadian law that First Nations have been practicing 
our traditional governance, culture, and ceremony since time immemorial. Three, call on the AFN to work with the Department of Justice and the Canada School of Public Service to support the, de the development of training for federal public servants on First Nations histories, rights, and title treaties, the United Nations declarations on the right of indigenous peoples, the dynamics of respectful relations, indigenous specific systemic racism, and meaningful reconciliation. On draft resolution 47, Therefore, be it resolved that First Nations in Assembly 1 reaffirm Resolution 02-2021, preliminary examination of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court directing the Assembly of First Nations to a immediately begin work with all First Nations in Canada to support the investigation of former Indian residential school sites with the purpose of identifying crime scenes of children. B, work with all First Nations in Canada to support additional works as required and considered appropriate by each First Nation to conduct archeological investigations, document research, and other such me methods of investigation as required to collect more information about any grave sites discovered during the investigation. Two, support Pimisimkamak Cree Nation and all other First Nations in accessing technical support and expertise from the International Commission on Missing Persons and by extension, the objectives and activities of the ICMP, Canada Residential Schools Project. Three, direct the AFN and the Chiefs Committee on Indian Residential Schools to engage with the ICMP for the benefits of those First Nations that wish to engage and access the technical supports of the ICMP per the technical arrangement they entered with Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs. Four, direct the, F the AFN and Chiefs Committee on residential schools to advocate to Canada on behalf of First Nations for the complete independence of ICMP Canada Residential Schools project na Project's national strategy for the identification and repatriation of human remains of Indigenous persons while maintaining the collective First Nations position to seek justice through intervention at the International Criminal Court as per AFN Resolution 02-2021. And draft resolution number 48. Therefore, be it resolved, I see that there are a lot, so I will take a sip of water. Therefore, be it resolved that the First Nations in Assembly, one, call on the United Nations in both the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council to support the enhanced particip participation of Indigenous peoples within the UN system, ensuring the direct participation of First Nations through their representative institutions. Two, reiterate the distinct, the distinct status and rights of First Nations as distinct from local communities, vulnerable groups, and ethnic minorities, in line with the minimum standards reaffirmed in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations to advocate in partnership with rights and title holders specific priorities for First Nations on venues of participation, participation modalities, selection criteria, and selection mechanisms in national and international contexts for the enhanced participation of indigenous peoples in the UN. Four, direct the AFN to seek funding to hold information sessions and collective discussions with First Nations rights and title holders to explore the concept of enhanced participation and proposed tangible recommendation to the UN. Five, direct the AFN to work with First Nations rights and title holders to advocate 
Did I just read this one? This is also. No? Okay, perfect. Uh, direct the AFN to work with First Nations rights and title holders to advocate for sufficient and sustainable funding for First Nations to participate actively in ongoing efforts towards enhanced participation at the UN. Six, direct the AFN to work collaboratively with Indigenous peoples to see the full implementation of this resolution. And seven, call on Global Affairs Canada to accelerate implementation of Action Plan Measure 72 to enhance the participation of Indigenous peoples in decision making on matters which would affect their rights internationally. So that's our package for reconciliation. I will now ask our mover to present this package. Microphone number two. Hello, Salem, Squamish Nation. I'll be very quick. <laughs> Um, we did submit uh, a friendly amendment uh, that I think the mover and seconder wanted to add, which is a, num a number eight. Uh, and this is based off feedback from others who approached us. Um, so number eight would read, call on Global Affairs Canada and the Department of Justice to co-develop with First Nations a fund to support the participation of First Nations delegations to international forum fora which impact Indigenous rights. So it's just adding a clause uh, calling for funding for the implementation of everything else in Resolution 48. We, we will add that. It's added, oh yeah, it's over there, okay. Eight, call on Global Affairs Canada and the Department of Justice to co-develop with First Nations a fund to support the participation of First Nations delegations to international fora which impacts which impact indigenous rights um, is it written as you wanted it to be written yes uh, so our mover agrees and our seconder agrees as well perfect um, we can now go into discussion and amendments on this package Question, perfect. So we can now vote on this uh, package uh, with three resolutions. Any opposition? I see none. Any abstention? I see none. Therefore, this package on reconciliation is carried by consensus. Thank you. Our next point on the agenda, uh, as suggested by Chief Loire Denny, so they worked with the resolutions team to combine two. So we will now be going towards an omnibus package on social and education. We have five resolutions that are together for this. We have draft resolution 32, bringing our own children home under our governance. Draft resolution 56, chronic underfunding in education. Draft Resolution 59, National School Food Program. Revised Draft Resolution 60, State of First Nations Education, Sovereignty in Canada and Globally, Measure 19 and Regionally Based First Nation Implementation and Evaluation of the UNDA Action Plan. And the final one, Draft Resolution 62, Income Assistance Program Reform and Poverty Reduction for First Nations. So just for our technical team, I see uh, this is a quick change. So again, Draft Resolution 32, 56, 59, 60, and 62. Our mover was Chief Leroy Denny. Just to make sure you are in the room, Chief Denny. Chief Denny, I see you. And we had as a seconder, Chief Junior Gold. 
Mr. Gould, there you are. Perfect. So we have both of our mover and seconder. I will go on to reading the therefore be it resolved into the record. We have microphone number two. Is this a point of order? Point of order on microphone number two. Hello. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tim Katchoy, proxy for Chief Harley Chinji, McLeod Lake Indian Band, Treaty 8, which is in British Columbia. So um, just for this particular omnibus, I know there is, we, we have agreed that the assembly is going to end at uh, 505. Thank you very much to the chairs. I know how difficult it is to manage this process. You guys have done an amazing job. Thank you very much. Uh, just to get through this very quickly, I know there's five resolutions, did you say, in this? Um, I'm suggesting that, uh, putting to the floor, that we suspend the rules for this particular piece to um, read every single therefore be it resolved. So you don't have to read every single therefore be it resolved. The chiefs know what is in this omnibus package and you can just read the resolutions, and then we can support this omnibus package as the last one of the assembly, and we can close it down in a good way. So that, that's, my, that's my suggestion. So there is a motion on the floor to suspend the rules so that we do not need to read the therefore be resolved into the records. We would need a seconder on this motion. We have Chairperson Kel Salem, who is seconding the suspension of the rules as a motion. We will open it up to discussion on the motion to suspend the rules which require the reading of the therefore be it resolved into the record. I'll go to microphone one. Yeah, I, I that would work really well as long as there aren't any amendments. Uh, so there's an amendment behind me, so that won't, you don't have to read it, but you're going to have to bring it up to make the amendment. Perfect. Your comment is heard. Thank you very much. So thank you for your comment. I'm being informed by the Resolutions Committee that there are certain amendments that were made, uh, revisions, I should say, I'm sorry. Uh, so those would have to be read into the record no matter what. Uh, but then we can then continue with the motion. So I will continue with the discussion on this, knowing that we still have to read those that have been revised into the record. We wouldn't have to read them all if the motion passes. So again, are there any other questions or comments on uh, the motion by uh, proxy or proxy catchway, right? Thank you. We are going to question, has been called on the motion to suspend the rules so that the therefore be resolves do not have to be read into the record, excepting those who have been revised uh, prior. I would look towards any opposition. Seeing none, do we have any abstentions to this motion? We have one abstention. So the motion to suspend the rules so that the therefore be it resolved do not have to be read in their entirety is carried by majority. So we will return to our omnibus on social and education. Resolution, draft resolution number 32 is as is. Draft resolution 56 as is. Draft resolution 59 has revised language and therefore be it resolved four. The new therefore be, res be it resolved for number four is support the Chiefs Committee on Education, the National Indian Education Council, and the Assembly of First Nations languages and learning and health sectors to co-develop any national guidelines or authorities that support local and regional approaches in the National School Food Program. We also have an, a revised language in the same resolution at point eight, therefore be it resolved eight, 
that says, eight, affirm that the National School Food Program and future co-development must not detract or hinder First Nations or regions from advancing their own school food programs or food sovereignty initiatives. Draft Resolution 60 as revised. The title has been updated as already read into the record with the addition of Measure 19 and regionally based First Nations implementation and evaluation of the UNDA Action Plan. We have additional whereas that were revised. So D, some nations have identified that none of the measures to date substantially address their control over education or the work required by Canada to meaningfully support their jurisdiction over education. We have whereas E, there must be regional approaches to implementing measures in the National Action Plan respecting the diversity across nations and regions. And in whereas F, the settler colonial crown must be accountable for recognizing nation sovereignty, the right to self-determination, and the right to establish and control their own education systems as affirmed by Article 14 of the UN Declaration. And all of these, therefore, be it resolves, do have revised language, so we must read them into the, re the minutes. One, therefore be it resolved one, affirm that there can be no meaningful United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, UNDA 2023-2028 Action Plan without regional specific approaches to the interpretation and implementation of Measure 19 as determined by the self-determining nations in those regions, which may include, among other things, subpoint A, mechanisms to formally move away from the Indian Act and its application of sections 114 to 124 as a tool of power over First Nations government and their education systems. B, mechanisms for appropriate, comprehensive, and fully equitable funding that meets the needs, including historical redress of First Nations lifelong learning systems based in First Nations led and designed regional First Nations education models, frameworks, approaches, and formulas. C, mechanisms and arrangements that support First Nations exercise of education jurisdiction, including appropriate education funding options outside of the regional education agreement program. Two, call upon the government of Canada to respect regional approaches, models to interpreting and implementing the UNDA 2023-2028 Action Plan Measure 19 as determined by nations in those regions and to negotiate honorably and in good faith, including to provide meaningful funding to support First Nations participations in negotiations. And three, direct the AFN to engage with the federal government on the UNDA 2023-2028 Action Plan Measure 19 to ensure alignment between Action Plan Measure 19 and UMDRIP Article 14. And our final resolution, Draft Resolution 62, Income Assistance Program Reform and Poverty Reduction for First Nations is as is. We will now go to discussion, and we have someone at microphone number one. Microphone one, please. Okay, there we go. Uh, Chief Shelley Boer Frappier, Tomogamy First Nation. I'm asking for a friendly amendment on resolution number 59 for the National School Food Program in number four of the therefore be it resolved that we add after support the add rights holders, comma, First Nations leadership, comma. Thank you, Chief. So we have in TBIR number four for DR 59, I will look towards our resolutions committee. And if we can have it posted on screen by our technical team, draft resolution 59, therefore be it resolved number four, please. So as our team is setting it on the board, I will do it the old school way. We have, therefore, be resolved four, which would say support the rights holders, comma, First Nations leadership, comma, Chiefs Committee on Education, national, and continued. I look towards uh, our chief. Is the word incorrect? The addition of rights holders, comma, First Nations leadership, comma, after support the. The wording looks correct. So I will move to our mover, which is Chief Leroy Denny. You agree? And Chief Gould, you agree? Thank you. So DR 59, the amendment has been accepted. I'm looking towards our microphone. I see we have a speaker on microphone number one. If I've got, microphone one, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Chief Peter Wesley, Moose Cree First Nation. Um, proposing a friendly amendment for draft resolution number 56. 
a new clause be added, call on AFN Legal to provide an analysis, including recommendations on a potential Canadian human rights complaint on the ongoing and historical chronic underfunding of First Nations education. Thank you, Chief. So we are talking about draft resolution 56, the addition of a new clause, or a new therefore be resolved, I'm sorry. I believe he's working with the resolutions committee on the language. So the language as proposed by Chief Peter is approved by our mover and approved by seconder and will be read into the minutes in just an instant. So we have, therefore be it resolved six, call on AFN Legal to provide an analysis, including recommendations on a potential Canadian Human Rights Tribunal complaint on the ongoing and historical chronic underfunding of First Nations education. Good, thank you. I call question. And question has been called, I will, Seeing no one's at the mic. Question four, omnibus on social and education, which includes draft resolution number 32, draft resolution number 56, draft resolution 59, draft resolution 60, and draft resolution 62. Is anyone in opposition? Seeing none, are there any abstentions? Seeing none, omnibus on social and education is adopted by consensus. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, so we will be going to our final resolution. We have draft resolution 66. If our technical team can get that one up on. Someone on microphone number two. Uh, Judy Wilson, proxy holder for uh, Chief Clarence Louis. Uh, I just wanted to say we had resolution 73 and 75 with Jordan's principal. It was in the omnibus, it was taken out, but it was also part of the social uh, resolutions. Thank you, Chief. We go with what the Resolutions Committee has proposed to us as the packages, so that is the one that we address. Thank you. I will take a moment to confer with, or microphone number one, Chief King. I'm the mover on Resolution 66. Perfect. Thank you. I will take a moment to confer with my co-chair, seeing as we only have three minutes left, and I will be back. So we are being advised by our team who works on protocol that uh, to have our exit in the right way, we need our drummers, we need our Eagle staff carried out. And there are issues with uh, timing and agendas for later. So seeing that it is 5.03, we would be looking towards moving towards our ending protocols. Again, if there's a motion on the floor, to extend the time that can be done, but it would affect closing protocols, which is part of our practices as is tradition. It is already 5.04 now, so I am looking towards you to understand if we do not go towards closing, then our closing protocol will be affected directly.
Microphone number one. Uh, first things first, sorry, Veronica. I'll make the motion to extend. We have proxy Bernard. 15 minutes. Do we have a seconder to extend by 15 minutes? Proxy Gary Glode, I will second it. Can you re repeat your last name, please? Glode. Glode, perfect. So the motion on the floor is to extend the ending time by 15 minutes, which would bring us to 520, knowing that this may affect closing protocol. I open it to discussion if anyone has uh, or wants to address the discussion. I've heard question in the background. Thank you. I look towards discussion. So I will go. The motion is to extend by 15 minutes making our new finishing time 5.20 p.m. I would look to see if we have any opposition. We have one opposition, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, So I'd look towards our distribution team to maybe come and help us with this due to the numbers. All right, thank you everyone. You can lower your hands. Do we have any abstentions? Again, to the motion to extend the closing time to 15 minutes from now. Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise. Please be safe as you raise your lanyards. <laughs> to our knowledge keepers, do you need something to drink? Do you need something, a little bite, quick something? You guys good? We're giving time to people to count. You can now lower your hands. So the motion was to extend by 15 minutes. We had 20 opposed, 37-4, so the motion is carried. As I throw my pen. <laughs> so we will continue on with draft resolution 66 in that case. Draft resolution 66, continued rejection and denouncements of Métis illegitimate rights assertion. Moved by Chief Wilfred King, who we have here, and seconded by Chairperson Kill Salem, who we have here. Resolution 66. We're at resolution 66. Draft resolution 66. So, I'm being informed that we will still have to read the therefore be it resolved. Therefore be it resolved that the First Nations and Assembly, one, reaffirm the rejection and denouncing of illegitimate rights assertion of the Métis within BC, Ontario, and Labrador. Two, reaffirm that the Métis hold no land, water, or air based inherent and constitutionally protected rights or related jurisdiction within BC, Ontario, and Labrador. 
Three, direct the Assembly of First Nations AFN to call on the government of BC to continue working with First Nations in BC to build upon its distinctions-based approach primer to ensure a comprehensive, appropriate, and consistent whole of government distinction-based approach is implemented with respect to the government of BC's relations with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in BC in consultation and cooperation with First Nations in BC. Four, direct the AFN to urge the Government of Canada to immediately develop and implement a comprehensive, appropriate, and consistent whole-of-government distinctions-based approach with respect to Canada's relations with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in consultation and cooperation with First Nations right holders and to make that approach public. Five, direct the AFN National Chief to advocate to the Prime Minister and the premiers to ensure that all federal, provincial, and territorial governments uphold Canada's duty to consult, ensuring that First Nations are adequately engaged in order to mitigate adverse impacts on their inherent and in treaty rights, title, and jurisdiction. And point six that was revised, direct the AFN National Chief to advocate to the Prime Minister and the premiers to ensure that all federal, provincial, and territorial governments create policies and mechanisms in alignment with OCAP principles to ensure access to historical archives and documentation for Indigenous peoples who are disconnected from their nations to support access to evidence of their Indigenous ancestry. We will now go to our mover for opening comments. Chief King, microphone one, please. Um, the resolution speaks for itself. Thank you, Chief King. I will look towards our seconder, Chairperson Kelsella, microphone two, please. Microphone two, please. Okay. Very quickly. Um, there was a request for a couple of minor uh, friendly amendments. So one is adding a three. It doesn't go up. Yeah, adding a, in between two and three, adding a new clause that says reaffirm that First Nations have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions in alignment with Article 33 of the UN Declaration. And I think we submitted that wording? Wording submitted, yeah. I think so. I believe, I believe so we're looking to add between two and three uh, a point on nations. Can you repeat your language, please? And then um, an additional one is adding to number seven. After the word territorial governments, so the term territorial governments, there would be a new or uh, additional line that says, I'll read, I'll read the whole thing. Direct the AFN National Chief to advocate to the Prime Minister and the Premiers to ensure that all federal, provincial, and territorial governments, and here's the new part, create policies and mechanisms in alignment with OCAP principles to ensure access to historical archives and documentation for Indigenous peoples who are disconnected from their nations to support access to evidence of their Indigenous ancestry. I'm just checking if staff got the Looking number. towards our resolutions committee. Chairperson Kilsalem, could you just repeat the language for yeah. the third? Uh, reaffirm, number three, reaffirm. That First Nations have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions in alignment with Article 33 of the UN Declaration. Just, I just want to make sure the word accordance, was it alignment that you had said or accordance? Oh, in alignment. In alignment, alignment with Article 33. In alignment with Article 33. Customs and traditions in alignment with Article 33. So I'll just look towards that. Is the yeah. language for number three good? Yeah. And now can you reread uh, your proposed changes to therefore be resolved seven? Yeah, so if you go to seven, oh, it's there. It's there already. Thank you. It's already included? Awesome. So I will look towards our mover uh, to microphone one, please. Good to go. Good to go. Perfect. So 
The two amendments are added and accepted. I heard question being called. So we will go to our voting period on draft resolution 66, continued rejection and denouncement of Métis illegitimate rights assertion, moved by Chief King and seconded by Chairperson Kilsalem. Is there any opposition? Is there any abstention? Draft Resolution 66 is thus carried by consensus. So Chiefs, thank you for that hard work, the good work. It's been big days, it's been long days, let's be honest. I will now move towards uh, my co-chairs to start us off on closing protocols. Bye. <laughs> okay, so congratulations, everyone. What a what a week, what a day. Your 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 dedication, chiefs and uh, proxies. Your hard work made this made this forty uh, fifth AGA a success. And congratulations. It's very important, I think, to take the time and congratulate. You can applaud yourself, I applaud yourself. I think it's, it's worth the, the time. <laughs> yep. So this is me saying goodbye and <laughs> this is me saying a big thank you. And I want to, I want to reiterate that it was an honor. I mentioned that at the beginning and it's still, it's still an honor for me to uh, act as your co-chair. Um, and is uh, and I'd like to um, to express on that my deepest gr gratitude to you all, chiefs and proxies. Um, and as I mentioned, this is your your work, your dedication, your passion, your 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 what, what everything you do is um, related to the success of this uh, 45th AGA. But another, what is also the success, uh, the, 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 um, the recipe of the success, I think, is also the, 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 the amazing work of all national chief, the, exec, the executive, all the consuls, all the AFN consuls, including the new one created for accessibility and disability. Yep. So, the, the translators, technicians, every, I, I call them the little beavers that we don't see, but they, there are a lot of beavers out, <laughs> behind that works to make it happen. So thank you to everyone. And finally, thank you to my co-chairs, Cedric and Veronique, even though she's not listening right now. <laughs> thank you very much. Miigwech. I just thank you also. <laughs> I won't take too much time because it's already late, uh, but I, w I just wanted to thank you uh, for welcoming me uh, in this assembly, being a youth co-chair, to have the opportunity to learn with you uh, what it, the role of a co-chair is. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I was re very glad to uh, do the omnibus packages with you. Um, I had more words, but I think I will keep it there because it's very, very, very late. So thank you again, Tawain, Anna, Askenonia, yes. So thank you, everyone. That was some good work. And I will not take more time. I'll just say safe travels. Thank you for being here. And thank you for all of the work you've done. You're advancing important issues for our people. And I raise you up for that. I recognize. Uh, and it is now my pleasure to introduce National Chief for closing remarks. Thank you, and thank you to our wonderful co-chairs. Give them a round of applause, folks. Thank you. 
you're back in September and then in December again. So there you go. Um, Anine Boujou, thank you. Uh, greetings, chiefs, council members, elders, proxies, and guests. Wow, what an amazing assembly. And I'm so proud of all of you, all of us together. Um, please take a moment and thank your neighbors around you before you leave today and uh, miigwech for that. And thank you to Grand Chief Cody Diablo of Kahnawake Nation and Regional Chief Jocelyn Picard for the warmest welcome to your territory on behalf of everyone here. We've been so blessed to have been um, gathered here and thank you to the Assembly of First Nations staff, their team, the Congress Centre staff for making us feel at home. Also like, like to thank the many notable guests who attended the Assembly, ministers, party leaders and of course Lieutenant Governor of Quebec, Manon Janot. Thank you. <clears throat> we had nearly um, we had nearly 2,200 people registered this week, over 400 chiefs and proxies. It is great to see that the AFN is so alive and well. We were optimistic about the future coming into this assembly. The hope that we have heard and seen over the past three days are even more inspiring. And we want to thank all of you who have come up to all of us and myself included over the past few days with your blessing, prayers and ideas. It means so much, Chimigwech. It has been awesome to see so much time devoted during this assembly to doing the work for First Nations people. Chiefs have been spending hours at assembly debating, drafting resolutions to improve the quality of life for the people that they serve. That does not even include the effort that has gone into these resolutions the lead up to this assembly. Some of you are not here, but watching at home, and I want to thank you for your participation. Chiefs debated, improved, and passed a record. I don't know how many resolutions did we do now, Cedric, after today? Do we know? Last question, Chair. <laughs> but congratulations. You've done so much work. We particularly also want to recognize my sister. I know one of my sisters is here from OCN and Chimi Gwetschi for today from Manitoba uh, for seeking their seeking an independent inquiry into the murders of four of our First Nations women in Winnipeg. And I know that I was out of the room today, but we were with the families and the I just want to take a moment to remember the four women. Chief was here, her and I had to leave and do a press conference with these families. And the man, I'm not even going to mention his name, that killed, at least we know four of our women has been found guilty of first degree murder in all four of them. And it's such a, so if we could just take a moment and remember those four souls, their families, Grand Chief Merrick, Chief. Thank you. I want to thank you, Chiefs, though, because I think that you are trying to change the way that policy is done in, uh, through your resolutions. And you've called on me to ask the Manitoba Lieutenant Governor to establish an inquiry into how police and provincial officials probe the 2022 killings. Those daughters were there today. Those, those women's daughters were there today. And they were saying how horrifying it has been just to fight for some justice for their moms, to even look for, to try and look for them and dig for them. And I want to, so I want to thank also uh, AMC Grand Chief, Chiefs that's here, the families for your courage and your love. This is the assembly of our, of our nations, chiefs and elders who came before us wanting for us to try and work together in this room, even when it's hard. They wanted us to be in this together. And, and here we are. It was so inspiring to visit with so many First Nations entrepreneurs also at the trade show and so many beautiful creators of um, just everything that we wear, right? We're, we're, it's a whole industry. And so I want to lift them up. I want to thank them and other exhibitors for their support and their participation. We're also so encouraged to see more children here. I've seen a lot of kids here. I'm so glad for that. It's a constant reminder of what this gathering is about. 
to continuously strengthen our relations. Let's try to begin future assemblies even more multi-generational, more families, more grandkids and grandparents. Chiefs, we have been waiting a long time for an assembly like this. We are unified and zeroing in on issues that matter most to First Nations. We are not divided or questioning ourselves. Today we are an assembly energized in diverse opinions, not threatened by them. We are an assembly unified behind a common belief that First Nations families should be empowered to care for our own children. United by a hope that our children will be more prosperous than us, we leave the assembly with an unwavering commitment to assert our rights. As long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. Chiefs, thank you for your leadership. More Canadians understand our success is Canada's success. That's because you keep saying that. And they're listening to you. They, they listen to us. They message, many of you. With just over 40, uh, 40 million people, Canada can't afford to leave anyone behind particularly First Nations people. Over the next decade, more than 550 billion of major projects will be launched in this country on the traditional lands of, of your communities, of First Nations. Trillions will flow to the Canadian economy. We heard the leader say that today, and create tens of thousands of jobs. But these projects will not advance without First Nations support, and that's the truth. Chiefs, you are accelerating a significant shift taking place in this country. You demonstrate we can work, we can look after our own over and over again. You demonstrate First Nations can effectively manage big projects. Together, you are driving economic growth and social change in this country. Together, we have secured, <clears throat> excuse me. Together, we have secured a, a historic multi-million dollar settlement offer from the federal government to start reforming Canada's broken First Nations child welfare system. While this is a great a great progress, things can change. With an aging minority government in Ottawa, we can't take anything for granted. That is why we want to thank the federal party leaders, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, and Conservative leader Pierre Polyev for attending this week. They are listening because they know Canada's future economic and social prosperity depends on it. Our viewpoints cannot be ignored anymore. We are proud of our chiefs for asking the tough questions and standing up for our people during these sessions. Well, we, we will be raising these issues with the premiers and demanding action. This week has reminded me again of the Assembly's strength in our diversity, unity, and ability to deliver results for First Nations. Chiefs, the next time we gather, you will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to start to build a new future for our First Nations children and accomplish something that was just unimaginable even just a few years ago. I can't wait to be with you in Manitoba and make history together in September. Have a safe journey home. Have a wonderful summer. And yeah, miigwech. Merci. Yabin minawa. Mina. Olalin, National Chief. It is now 527, and this meeting, the 45th Annual General Assembly strengthening our relations of the Assembly of First Nations is officially adjourned. And to start our closing ceremony, <laughs> to start our closing ceremony, I would look towards our knowledge keeper, Kevin Deer, to come for our closing prayer. Anagi, Madigiz of Adon Seals, Conigori Wessa, Negadiway Doske, Yuri Huana, and Hodo, Jugotarunu, Asa, Niwinis Rage, Nene Doske, Zini Dawayero, Negadiway, a way good in a hood, you and Hedge, and hood the Yogut Cow, and hood the one I do quit, Tidding Star Hoza, and a gonna hood a way good garunu, the newer is in a gonuidi, the newer Tanakta Raguani, and hood the one I don't connect, so quite diesel, so yer a gas of Stansra Goa. Wa do jutku se on the hot kawe nega sostasra, neti nona do watarunyu, wanati yeti aragene the hutigusa daje rodiri wage. Wanagi wagere dokaran you wanna get neha the gatkawe katinena yotinenu gwani kura. So essentially what I said is that to all of us that are here after these three days, we put our minds together to talk about who we are. But we can never forget the fact that we're here because our earth mother gives us unconditional love every day from the beginning of time. 
All she asks in return is that every day that we have this attitude of gratitude, and for us it comes with our sacred songs, our dances, our speeches, our rituals, and our language. So that being said, we usually say it in that as you leave, that we hope that you all get to your loved ones safe and sound, that uh, you'll be in good health, that all the natural powers of the universe will help us in these critical times that we are in, global warming, climate change, war, disease, sickness, all of these things now are at our doorstep. And as we traverse these uncharted waters, the only thing that is gonna help us is our connection to our ancestors, to that source of life for all life, and that we continue to humble ourselves and ask that we be guided. And these relationships that we have with the people that emigrate across this land, that we're in a treaty relationship with them, that we help them to begin to see different, hear different, speak different, and we all better start to do different because if not, we will all be gone in a very short period of time. And if it takes Mother Nature 4.5 million years to return this land back to pristine, hey, she has all the time in the world, but we don't. But hopefully we'll be guided to make these best decisions, not only on behalf of the living people, but the Earth Mother and all the other things that we need to enjoy this beautiful life. So with that, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Nihonkoa. Thank you. Nihonkoa, Knowledge Keeper Kevin Beer, and uh, National Chief, we got to 52 resolutions. Before we ask for our parting songs, I'd like to recognize that one of the members of the National Youth Council has joined the Eagle River Singers to help end this meeting. So I'd like to recognize you, Carson Robinson, for being here. And now I would, la I would ask for our flag song to be played by our drummers. <laughs> 